So here's another question from Mr. Butterworth. At the end of the class last Thursday, you made following summary of Plato's point thus far. Justice is the highest good, but men are by nature unjust. This is implied from the fact that the argument contains an unclear reference to philosophy, i.e. the polo section is characterized by an abstraction from philosophy and therefore an abstraction from nature. Assuming that this is a correct statement of your argument, I don't understand the connection, or rather it's the implication. Well, it is not, where is Mr. Butterworth? It is not a correct statement of my argument. Uh, I'd, we have finished last time the Polos uh, section, and uh, what is so striking here is this. First, the purely rhetorical character of the refutation. And secondly, the enormous uh, uh, boosting of the virtues of punishment. These are the most ma manifest features. Now, the question arises, uh, why, why that? What is the idea behind that? And under or differently stated, since Polos is a rhetorician, and the issue is the status and the importance of rhetoric, I phrase the problem as follows. Under what conditions is rhetoric the highest art? That it cannot be the highest good, as Polos, uh, as Gorgias had asserted, is most clear from the Polos section because regardless of whether you take Polos's point of view there or Socrates's, rhetoric cannot be the highest good because from Polos's point of view, tyranny is the highest good. Uh, uh, be a tyrant being much more able to get what he wants than an orator. And uh, from a Sogaris point of view, as stated there, because the chief value of rhetoric is to induce men to undergo punishment, i.e. to go to the doctor of the soul and uh, to get the necessary whipping uh, for the restoration of the mental health. and But also here, the key point is punishment. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, I.e. also some form of coercion in contradistinction to the speeches which only induce men to undergo that coercion. So rhetoric cannot be the highest good. But rhetoric could still be the highest art. And now uh, the question is, under what condition would it be the highest art? And then I stated it, if justice is the highest good, but men are by nature unjust, and so on. Because if they are by nature unjust, they can become just only by an art. And the art which makes them just, according to this argument, is punishment. I mean, there are... Uh, you know, no, what makes them just directly is punishment. But what induces men to undergo punishment is rhetoric. As this, as this is um, what I said. Yeah, surely the now, uh, then I made the remark, why these uh, presuppositions are untenable? Uh, do they not re reflect something which uh, is so what is uh, serious conviction. And I said, yes, to some extent that is true. Insofar as for Sugaris, justice is philosophy. Um, now, and furthermore, by nature, most men are unable to become philosophers. Now, if we replace again philosophy by justice, we arrive, reach the conclusion. Justice, Socratically understood, is the highest good. But most men are by nature, Socratically understood, unjust. That is, was what I stated. And uh, surely there are very great difficulties, and we can only hope that by studying the rest of the dialogue, these difficulties uh, will be resolved. 
but I do not make any promise to this effect. As of now, I still am myself very much in the dark. Yes. Yeah, well, here that's very simple. Philosophy is never mentioned. Yeah, but philosophy, yeah, well, the philosophy is absent in one sense, even apart from mentioning or not mentioning, because the argument Socrates uses against both Gorgias and Polos is not a philosophic argument. Yeah, and it's a rhetorical argument. Uh, this, uh, but the question is whether philosophy will be present in the second half. In one sense, surely, philosophy will be mentioned right at the beginning. But uh, whether the argument will be philosophic is a long question. We must see that. We cannot uh, judge that in advance. Yes, Mr. Glenn. Uh, Mr. Strauss, what does it Well, it is very simple. You must have heard, uh, at least from the first book of Aristotle's Politics, where he develops the view that men, some men are by nature slaves. Yeah? That there were people who uh, were of the opinion that men are by nature unequal. Yeah? Now, if men are by nature unequal, there may be some men who are by nature fit to philosophize and others who are not by nature fit to philosophers. Well, I mean, uh, that's to say congenitally, and uh, you cannot do anything about it later by any art. Yes. Now, but uh, the step is very simple. Now, the difficulty is this. In our ordinary understanding, not only we living in a democracy, but of course the Greeks as well, proof Aristotle, moral virtue is regarded as something which is of which every human being is capable. Yeah. And, uh, well, extreme cases like morons excluded, but practically all men are capable of moral virtue. Now, by justice, we understand, of course, a moral virtue, if not the highest moral virtue. Now, the difficulty here arises that for Socrates uh, or Plato, there is no moral virtue. Uh, virtue is knowledge. In order to make the meaning of that clear, this very enigmatic proposition clear, I replace knowledge by philosophy. Yeah? So virtue, um, virtue is philosophy, and in particular justice is philosophy. But if justice is philosophy, it follows necessarily that most men are by nature unjust. It has nothing to do with any modern Hobbian or other doctrines. It follows from this premise. Is it not clear? Shall I repeat some syllogism? Uh, it is a genuine syllogism, not a, not a rhetorical antimony. Just, yeah, just the, the last three sentences of the syllogism. So, <laughs> <laughs> only, not all men are by nature able to philosophize. But uh, to philosophize means to be just. Hence, only uh, uh, some men are by nature able to be just or to act justly. Well, that's and, uh, but since they are unable to act justly, they are unjust the, by nature. The problem is the ability to be just, the ability to philosophize. Now, I understand that that can be by nature, that the ability to philosophize and the ability to be just can be by nature. Yes. But isn't that a, it's a different thing to say that men are by nature just or unjust. But, Mr. All right, Mr. Glenn, that is extremely simple. The men who are by nature unable to philosophize can never philosophize. 
And it is true that some men who are by nature able to philosophize may by self-neglect never philosophize and therefore always remain unjust. They are not by nature unjust, but by their self-neglect. But the more interesting case is, those, uh, is that of those who are uh, by nature unable to philosophize, i.e. by nature unjust. You mean that then to, to say that the man is by nature unjust means that he is by nature unable to be just? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. I see you mean now by nature unjust? But by art, he could become just. That is what Machiavelli and Hobbes mean, in a way. I mean, uh, yeah, no, Machiavelli has this beautiful expression for that. Uh, say a prince must uh, make his ministers good and keep them good. So by nature, they are bad, and thinking only of their own interest. But the prince can make them just, uh, fundamentally by a proper combination of carrot and stick, obviously. Uh, make them just, that is, that is not what's always nice. Yeah? Good. But uh, we have now reached a turning point in the dialogue, and it, this is a good place, place for making a pause. Now, we have heard uh, uh, suggestions like these. True justice is philosophy. Happiness or bliss is philosophy. And implicitly, there is no moral virtue. For Plato, there is only genuine virtue, i.e. philosophy, and its implications, and what he calls vulgar or political virtue. The only salvation for mankind is the rule of the philosophers. Rhetoric, that's to say the right kind of rhetoric, is indispensable both in a perfect city, like that of the Republic, and in the imperfect cities. Now, and some other uh, things which I had to say, um, what is the rel relevance of all this and the like for us today? Or more simply, what is the use of studying the gorgeous for modern, up-to-date political scientists? Now, I will answer this question. <laughs> Yeah, I have already said something at the beginning, but I think it doesn't do any harm if I repeat it, because in the meantime we have gotten some more evidence. I will try to answer the question on two levels. Now, let us forget about it and look at our political situation with which our political science is concerned. Uh, what strikes everyone is the global character of politics today. We are now, we, everyone has to be concerned either professionally or indirectly with what is called foreign cultures, which means something more than just foreign nations. And in particular, of course, the new nations in Asia and Africa, of which we hear more, hear more and more and will hear more and more. Surely we must understand them. They are no longer objects of Western politics which can be molded by Western men. They are subjects of politics now. What does it mean to understand cultures not our own? Can we understand them by simply using what is called our categories? <clears throat> and are these categories by means of which we understand them? not the outgrowth of our culture, so that by applying it to foreign cultures, we distort them, um, namely by applying by means of, uh, by trying to understand them by means of our categories. Do we not imply that we understand these foreign cultures better than they understand themselves if we apply psychoanalysis sociology, etc., to them, because they are wholly unable to understand themselves in psychoanalytical or sociological terms. Do we not illegitimately absolutize one culture, namely our own? Surely we listen to the answers which these people give to our questionnaires. 
we listen to their answers. To that extent, uh, we do not absolutize our own. But our questionnaires themselves embody, embody dogmatically our answers to the most fundamental questions. And I mean, to the, uh, for example, such a distinction between religion and law, um, between economics and uh, and art and so on, which are not necessarily intelligible in terms of foreign cultures. Now, our cultures, as ev culture as everyone knows, stems from the coming together of two cultures different from our own, the Greek and the Hebrew. Thus, thus these cultures are therefore more directly accessible to us than the other cultures, because in a way they are within us. The study of these two cultures provides a kind of training ground for understanding foreign cultures in general. By studying any of these cultures, and of course in the political theory, uh, political science department, the Greek culture has um, priority, uh, we experience difficulties. We are co uh, reminded all the time of the way in which our categories prevent us from understanding, say, what Plato says. We observe all the time the danger of schematisms. And uh, if we uh, return from the Gorgias uh, to a chapter in uh, a general history of civilization about Plato, or uh, maybe even some more learned things, uh, we see how superficial these categories, Greek culture, Renaissance, or what have you, are. Um, and this is especially true, of course, and most visible, in the case of the highest phenomena of these cultures. The highest phenomena, say, Plato compared with some inscription containing a tribute list of Greek cities uh, of, uh, of the time of the Peloponnesian War. This is uh, it may be impossible to decipher because of the poor condition of the inscription, but there is no deep problem in understanding it if it could be deciphered. But in the case of Plato, the, if you have the text of Plato in a tolerably good shape as you have it in any edition, uh, this is no question of deciphering, the question is of understanding. Now, here is this little thing which I said as a matter of course, highest phenomena, which is of course a value judgment, and I will not make no bones about that. But this experience again is very valuable, the experience namely of the impossibility of studying human things without making value judgments. Uh, how to justify them and show that these are true value judgments and so, that is uh, always a concrete question which cannot be answered in terms of a general methodology. This is my first point, to repeat that uh, any serious study of a phenomenon belonging to a foreign culture, wherever we start, would start, uh, uh, is necessary, I believe, if we want to be properly prepared for the difficulties which confront us when we study any foreign culture. But this is not my main argument. I come back again to the point that political science is the study, above all, of present-day politics in this country or elsewhere. But what is politics? Who gets what when has been proposed? Now this is not specifically political because who gets what when is a question also in families, even in classrooms. That's the same what is true of who gets what when is of course true also of power. Power exists everywhere wherever human beings are. It is somewhat better to say, speak of public power. At least you make a distinction, although one may not understand what public in contradistinction to non-public means. In uh, long forgotten times, people spoke, when they said what's, what's political science about, they spoke of the state. Some of the older ones among you may remember the time. It was a key term in 19th century and early 20th century political science.
But this term and what goes with it has become somewhat pale and not, not no accident because that was always understood, at least in the Western world, in the, I mean, the Western world properly, I'm so the west of the Rhine, in contradistinction to society. And it's not society much more important, much less pale than the state. So uh, um, acting on this uh, impression, uh, people reach the conclusion that true political science is political sociology. Um, a conclusion with which you all are familiar. But political sociology means in all cases, in almost all cases known to me, the understanding of polit political things in terms of the sub-political, of things which are not in themselves political. <laughs> Nevertheless, it is preferable to the uh, uh, there, no, therefore it is preferable not to go the way to political sociology with its peculiar uh, difficulties, but to correct what was wrong in the notion of the state or theory of the state. Namely, to correct this conception in terms of the question, what kind of state? because that was characteristic of the theory of the state, that it did not as such raise the question what kind of the state and spoke of the state. Now, uh, a state seems to be neutral to all qualitative differences among states. Now, this is feasible surely in one sphere of political science uh, within limits, namely in the international law, international, at least in international law because uh, before the neutral tribunal of international law, a state is a state, and you must not uh, have any intervention and all the other nice things, and you are not concerned with its, what kind of a state it is. In brief, political science must take its bearings by what is politically important. Now, what does pol the word political has, of course, many meanings, and there is one vulgar meaning which is, I think, very helpful. Uh, when, when they speak about the uh, superintendent of schools or of the sanitary district, whatever it may be, and they is playing politics, what does it mean? It means he is not objective. It's not technical. It is controversial. So political is a controversial. And this is, leads us deeper because today, on the largest and most massive scale, the political is, as everybody knows, a cold war. And the term, term war makes quite clear that there is some controversy here. And what is the controversy about? Well, it has to do with the fact that the powers in question have different regimes, among other differences. The difference of regimes is a primary important thing. Not the state, in other words, but the regimes are the specifically political thing. In the language of Aristotle, the politeia, not the polis. And everyone knows what these things are, liberal democracy, communism, fascism, um, uh, even relics of feudalism, etc. There is a famous topic in political science called the ism. This is indeed what I have in mind. These isms, say communism, uh, democratism, uh, fascism, these isms indicate principles of legitimacy. Because there is a communistic uh, legitimacy, to be democratic and uh, fascist. But principles, this principles of legitimacy is again a good example of the difference between the political and the sociological approach. Because from the political point of view, one is of course concerned with the substantive principles of legitimacy, like democracy, fascism, and so on, and not with the formal ones uh, pointed out by Max Weber, rational, traditional, and charismatic, which are um, not helpful for political understanding. If you take the famous example of uh, Roosevelt, who was in a sense surely a charismatic leader, I believe more than any other president uh, since the time I am in this country, uh, he surely had 
This is what they mean by charismatic leader. But was this the ground of his legitimacy? Of course not. In the first place, a certain version of democracy and his particular ability. Even in the case of Hitler, his, uh, his legitimacy was not merely based on his so-called charismatic qualities, uh, which I would simply state on his on certain kind of abilities which he had. It was at least as much uh, based on his uh, uh, alleged concern and dedication to concern with and dedication to Germany's transcendent greatness. So, we, if we do not take into consideration these substantive titles to legitimacy, we do not understand the phenomenon. Now, the doctrine of regimes is, was, is presented to us in the most perfect form which it has ever received in Aristotle's politics. But we must add immediately that the presentation in Aristotle's politics is not complete. And it faces it is precisely in the cases of those regimes which are of immediate concern to us. So Aristotle's analysis is not sufficient for understanding present-day regimes. We must then raise the question, what are the essential limitations of Aristotle's politics? And this is for practical purposes identical with the question, what is the essential difference between present-day regimes and the regimes discussed by Aristotle? This question can be simply answered. What is characteristic of, the present, of all present-day regimes is exactly those isms of which I have spoken before. All present-day uh, regimes are based on ideologies. There is no ideological basis of the regimes as discussed by Aristotle. Let us take a simple example. Oligarchy is the rule of the rich. Democracy is the rule of the poor. Aristotle states the arguments of the rich on the one hand and of the poor on the other. There is not a single ideological element there. The rich say, we pay the taxes. We, uh, we pay the taxes. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, and the, uh, the poor just uh, enjoy what is done with these taxes. And uh, we have the greater stake in the whole thing. We want the power. And the poor say, we fight in the wars as much as the rich do. And this is the greatest service which a man can do to the city. And he fights for it. Now, there's no, no myth. No ideology, no general theory involved. So this is the first difference. And the second difference, which is also obvious, is that the modern regimes are in fact based on technology, on modern technology, i.e. on modern science. But science, in the modern sense, is the basis also of the ideologies. A take a dialectical materialism or the racial science, or in a certain democratic view, instead of John Dewey, the method of science is a method of democracy. So close is the connection between science and a certain modern regime. Uh, contrast this with, as say, the Japanese notion that the legitimacy of the emperor goes back to his descendants from the moon goddess, if I remember well. And this has obviously an entirely different character than the reference to these kind of doctrines which claim to be scientific, rightly or wrongly, but that they raise this claim and that they, they recognize in their way the authority of science is a remarkable thing. Now, this the two things, the presence of ideologies and of technology in modern times, uh, makes Aristotle's analysis, I do not say obsolete, but insufficient. In order to understand, however, this thing, ideologies and technology, we must go back to Aristotle or Plato and see what his, what's the reason, the theoretical reason for these differences. differences. And this is the different view of the classics 
regarding the relation of science and the polis. Polis is the city, the ancestor of our state. Now, the simple, the answer is very simple. Science or philosophy, the distinction didn't exist, transcends the city. Uh, you remember perhaps from an earlier meeting when we discussed the question of prudence, of phronesis, and the sphere of phronesis, which is closed. Um, but phronesis, prudence, is of course not science or philosophy. Um, and we have also discussed at that time the complication that this closed sphere uh, is in need of a defense which cannot be given by prudence itself, but only by science. But this only as a reminder. Now, why does the poly science of philosophy transcend the city? Because the end of the city and the end of the philosopher are radically different radically different. Therefore, there is we are in need of a bridge between the two, because philosophers have to live in cities, and cities are well advised to tolerate philosophers, so there must be some modus vivendi, some bridge must be found. And that bridge is rhetoric, because that is the only way in which the philosopher can talk to non-philosophers. Now, in modern times, the radi uh, following a radical change has taken place, which can be stated as follows. The end of political society and the end of philosopher, of philosophy are identical. How can this be? Well, very simply. If the, the task of science is to increase man's power uh, of, in order to relieve man's estate, as Bacon called it, then what everyone wants, say, uh, comfortable self-preservation, to use another of these famous phrases, this one by Locke, if, the, if science is the way toward comfortable self-preservation, there is no longer a, a gulf between what the philosopher intends and what the man in the street uh, intends. And, and, and good. And of course, then you do no longer need rhetoric, yeah? because the bridge is technology, of course, the applications of science. You do no longer need rhetoric, you do no longer need fine words, because you have now solid achievements, which, uh, um, uh, namely, um, uh, the birth, uh, uh, the, the fighting of, of the infantile diseases, and so on and so on. And, but this is not the whole story. This, um, uh, the application of science is one stem, and the other stem is the diffusion, the methodic diffusion of the results of science to non-scientists, simply called enlightenment. So there is, uh, this is the second of these great pages. Um, now, the end result, of course, is a, comp a kind of fusion of science and society. And uh, today, it is a theme of political science, as you surely know, to study the function of scientists in politics is now a political theme. Because that, is, that this, uh, as the sciences do have an immediate political relevance, is a fact. And one has only to consider uh, along the lines of uh, the farewell speech of President Eisenhower, at least of the problem stated there, whether this is such a simple thing or whether it doesn't take, uh, carry any dangers with this. Yeah. Now, in order, I will make uh, two more remarks uh, uh, to, as to remind you of the, what one must somehow consider in order to have an access to uh, such things as a gorgeous. Now, the position of the classics can simply be stated as follows. They were, of course, I mean, sometimes they are called totalitarians uh, with a word which has uh, too many meanings. But one thing must never be forgotten. In one respect, they were surely not totalitarian. 
They admitted that there is one pursuit which transcends the polis, and that's philosophy. But philosophy is the only pursuit which transcends the polis, i.e. not art, for example. In the biblical tradition, one can say, at least as it developed uh, in Christianity, that faith, that's to say the true faith, and everything belonging to it, transcends the polis. Now you see here the great difference, because philosophy is meant to be the preserve of a natural elite, those who are by nature fit to philosophize. A faith is in a way also belongs to an elite, but an elite not by nature, but by grace. It's in, in, by, but the very notion that there is something in man which transcends the police is underlying the modern development. But modern liberalism changes the thesis of both the Greek philosophers and the biblical tradition. The modern liberalism states in its original form, which is still uh, uh, effective up to the present day, in a somewhat diluted manner, the individual with his rights, with the fundamental rights, transcends police, which found its theoretical expression in the doctrine of a state of nature antedating civil society sort of conduct. The individual is history, but here the individual is, of course, not qualified uh, by either philosophy or faith. The individual, as he comes from the hands of nature, every man, every man. No virtues, intellectual or theological, are required. Now, in order to make this, when I say this is still uh, effective up to the present day. These fundamental rights are, of course, not the only natural rights. They are the only absolute fact in morality. Everything else is subject to discussion, modification, manipulation, but not the fundamental rights. And this is, of course, uh, uh, impossible to assert in the age of, quote, relativism, that there should be anything absolute. Maybe. But as a matter of fact, when you see the discussions about freedom of speech and freedom uh, and other freedoms of the First Amendment, you see that they are in fact treated precisely by the more liberal part of the community as absolute rights. Although they have no, the, no, they have the, uh, uh, to the least degree a theoretical basis for making this assertion. Now, what has, so in the case of classics, of the classics, it is philosophy which um, gives the title to full membership. In the biblical tradition, faith. In modern liberalism, the individual with his rights, regardless of any virtues. But there is an alternative which played a, con a certain role in the emergence of modern thought during the period called Enlightenment. At that time it was said by Montesquieu that the principle of democracy in contradistinction to aristocracy and monarchy is virtue. It was implied not by Montesquieu but uh, by uh, some theorists, later theorists, that it, the moral virtues, the morally virtuous individual as such, transcends the city. Moral virtue is the one thing needful and sufficient, not philosophy nor religion. And moral virtue is at the same time the social bond, taking the place of religion, i.e. of particular religion, and uh, one can understand it externally that this was a consequence of the religious wars where people try to find a uh, common ground between all religious parties. And with one thing which all religions admitted was the importance of moral virtue. Let us, this common ground be the sufficient ground. And moral virtue is by definition within the reach of everyone. 
every man can be moral virtue if he only makes effort. Now, this moral virtue, of course, is not uh, is uh, yeah, not the same what Aristotle meant by moral virtue in the full sense. For uh, Aristotle understands by moral virtue what he also calls perfect gentlemanship. And this is not such an easy thing to get, but moral virtue was also quite deluded to be something like a nice guy. And this would seem to be something which can be expected of anyone. Somehow, one, it seems, and we must in, uh, investigate that, that the gorgeous uh, suggests that moral virtue is the one thing needful. It is not called here moral virtue, but justice. But some doubt is cast on this proposition immediately because of the importance attached by Socrates to philosophy. And uh, we will see then how this, uh, how this works out. Um, I believe we had, which point had we re did we reach last time? Uh, at the end of the polo section, yeah. Now, uh, yes. In modern times, the view was of great political importance that moral virtue, which by definition is within the reach of everyone, non-moronic, is the one thing needful, the only thing of absolute worth, as Kant calls it, and at the same time, the bond of society. Now, the Gorgias seems to suggest that justice, which is in its way the same as moral virtue, does have this status and this significance. And we will, should be, I said in advance that this is not in fact the case. But by keeping this question in mind, I believe we will understand um, uh, Socrates somewhat better than we otherwise would. Yes. This has nothing to do with nothing directly to do with that. I mean, in the distinction between philosophy and science is an outcome of the modern developments in the 17th century. Very briefly, too briefly, but sufficiently for our, for our present purposes, philosophy and science were identical. But in the 17th century, a new philosophy or science turned against the old philosophy or science. Yeah? This new philosophy or science led to a development by virtue of which philosophy and science became distinguished from each other. I could elaborate on that, but we have to turn. Uh, yes. You are sure they do because they have no inkling of philosophy. And they call, uh, my, one of my simple examples is it is my philosophy to have two eggs for my breakfast. Yeah? In other words, they call every maxim a philosophy. And of course, the, the people speak of the, of the philosophy of foreign relations of Secretary of State Rusk or Dallas. That is already the same way. I read a, I read a book, uh, not a book, but a book title, uh, The Philosophy of the Consumer. So uh, we all have philosophies, and for the asking, you, 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 anyone, uh, yeah? good. And that is, of course, uh, disgrace, and uh, not worthy of any concern. But uh, uh, then one should avoid the word philosophy, and say philosophy is bunk. It was an error of the past. We know now that only science is possible, and 
and uh, that is uh, much more honest. Um, uh, good. Now, what, what precisely was your question? I see. By ideology, I mean, uh, uh, as it originally meant, an erroneous doctrine, erroneous doctrine, which claims uh, to be uh, true on the basis of science, whether that science is defined in terms of uh, positivistic methodology or in the terms of dialectical materialism or this kind of mixture of various methods called racial science, I'm not now concerned. But the key point is that there is a reference to something which is accessible to the unassisted human mind and not based on any particular uh, tr ancestral tradition, as the myth of Japan uh, would be. Yeah. In other words, I would, not, I would make a distinction between ideologies and myth. Uh, but we have to take up the question of myth when we come to the end of this book, toward the end of this book, where Sugaris will make a certain long speech at the beginning of which he will say, this is a logos and not a myth. Although you, Caligulus, believe, will believe it is a myth, then we have to raise it, perforce to raise the question, <laughs> what, what is a myth? Uh, good. Yes? You said four levels. Two, two, two. Sheer uh, acoustic music. Yes, that's the last question. Yeah. You, say that, you said that Plato says that the Plato philosophy and justice are the same thing. That is a provisional statement and for provisional purpose perfectly good, but it needs some refinement. Does yeah. that come out of the statement that no justice is a due justice? Yeah, it's connected to that. Uh, an assertion which we, to which we have to return more than once. Good. Now let us read the beginning of the Caligula's section, um, the first two speeches. Tell me, Caligula, is Socrates serious about this, or is he only joking? He seems to me, Caligula, to be very serious indeed. Still, there is nothing like asking. Yeah, now let us stop here. Why does he, Caligula's ask, address uh, Chalifon and not ask Sugares point blank? Are you kidding? Or do you mean it? No, I think that is rather clear. Because if Socrates is in the habit of kidding, his reply will also be suspect of being made jokingly. Of Chalifon, he knows, Chalifon never jokes. And therefore, you can get from him the straight answer. This last remark of Chalifon, uh, and nothing like asking him is an identical repetition of what was said at the beginning by Calicus to Chalifon or Sogatis about Gorgias. Nothing like asking him, namely Gorgias. You see here the change which has taken place. At the beginning, the central individual, uh, the, the life of the party, was Gorgias. Now, the center has shifted completely to Socrates. This is a grave change which has taken place, unobserved as it were, and which proves one thing, that, surely, that Socrates is by far superior to the others in this kind of speeches, which he calls conversations, conversation, but which I think is better described as a particular form of rhetoric. Yes. So after Calicles has been assured that Socrates means exactly as he uh, means it exactly as he has said, Calicles goes on. Upon my word, just what I want to do. Tell me, Socrates, are we? You're yeah, not upon my word. By the gods. It's the first time that this most comprehensive oath occurs. Not a single god omitted. Yes. <laughs> By all the gods. Just what I want to do. Tell me, Socrates, are we to take you as serious just now or joking? For if you are serious and what you say is really true, 
must not the life of us human beings have been turned upside down, and must we not be doing quite the opposite of things of what we want to do? Yeah. So Callicles grasps, grasps fully the bearing of what Sugares has said. If this is true, then we all lead the wrong kind of life and we must uh, put it upside down uh, um, uh, uh, from this moment on. Callicles, in contradistinction to Polos, regards it as possible that Sugares means what he says. You remember Polos uh, didn't believe that any man could believe what Zucker says he believed. To that extent, he is more open-minded than Polos. But above all, the question from now on concerns no longer rhetoric, but our whole life. How should we live? Callicles is more serious than Polos. This much appears already now. Now, how does Sugares reply? Calicles, if men had not certain feelings, each common to one sort of people, but each of us had a feeling peculiar to himself and apart from the rest, it would not be easy for him to indicate his own impression to his neighbor. I think this because I notice that you and I are at this moment in much the same condition, since the two of us are enamored each of the two things. I of Alcibiades and of Plinius and Philosophy, and you of two, the Athenian Demos and Demos the son of Pyrrhalanus. Now let us stop here. Now what so it starts, so it starts with a general reflection. There are feelings as he translates. Uh, I do not know whether it's a better and the best translation. Pathos, which became on the way over the Latin passion. But in the original sense of the term, I, uh, the present use of experience corresponds roughly. You are hit by something. You suffer something. You are affected, affected by something to which you respond. Now, there are such passions which no one else shares with one. And there are passions which some or many men share with one. And there are finally passions which all men share. The passions here, the passion mentioned here, is one which is shared only by some, uh, in particular by Socrates and Caligulus, i.e. not by Polos and Gorgias. Socrates and Caligulus are both lovers, passionate men, dedicated men. Uh, this is uh, um, uh, 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 the main point. Now, eros, uh, the word used here, is something beautiful and at the same time beautifying. Eros beautifies the beloved, obviously, the famous example that Plato gives in the Republic, then a snub nose of a, of a beloved girl is called, I don't know how, you know, uh, we beautify the perfect love, and but it beautifies also the lover. A human being in love is more beautiful than a human being not in love. I say in love in contradistinction to sexual excitement, which is a somewhat different story. But so as in Caligulus, why erotic men love different things in two ways, different youth, and different pursuits. Caligulus loves the Athenian demos, and Socrates loves philosophy, which implies that Socrates does not love the Athenian demos. There is a kind of either or he implied. Either you love the Athenian demos or you love philosophy. And this is traced later on to the distinction between justice and injustice. The just men, in the full sense of the term, will love philosophy. The unjust man will love, if he is an Athenian, the Athenian demon. And this is not merely meant anti-democratic, as we will see. And you note also that he doesn't say the demos, he says the Athenian demos. And the question is not standing up for democracy 
against oligarchical rebellion, it's Athenian Demos. Uh, to explain that, um, for, if you take the posture of uh, uh, Douglas against Lincoln, Douglas really loved the American Demos and gave a damn for the Demos elsewhere, whereas Lincoln was generally concerned with democracy. I believe Ernest Bevan, the British Labour leader, was also someone who loved the British demons, regardless. This kind of thing, of course, always exists. Caligula's love for the Athenian demons implies an endorsement of Athenian imperialism, where the Athenian demons subjugated the demons of other cities. Philosophy has nothing to do with the demons. We have already heard Socrates saying, I do not converse, have conversation with the many. And therefore, the need for rhetoric in order to bridge the gulf between the philosophers and the non-philosophers. Caligula's two darlings, the Athenian demons and this young man, have the name in common. Both are called demons. As Socrates to Socrates' two darlings, which do not even have the names in common, have anything in common, we do not know. So let us go on from here. Now, I always observe that, for all your cleverness, you are not able to contradict your favorite, however much he may say, or whatever may be his account of anything, but are ever at changing over from side to side. In the assembly, if the Athenian famous disagrees with some statement you are making, you change over and say what it desires. And just the same thing happens to you in presence of that fair youth, the son of Carolinus. You are unable to resist the counsel of the statements of your daughter. So that if anyone shows surprise at the strangeness of the things you were constantly saying under that influence, you would probably tell him that you chose to that unless somebody makes your favorite stop speaking thus, you will never stop speaking thus either. Consider yourself, therefore, obliged to hear the same sort of remark from me I do not be surprised if I say it, but make my darling philosopher stop talking thus. For she, my dear friend, speaks what you hear me saying now, and she is far less fickle to me than any other favorite. That son of Flint has his up changing his views, but philosophy always holds the same, and it is her speech that now surprises you, and she spoke it in your own presence. And now let us stop here for one moment. The son of Kenyus, of course, has a bias. Now, since Socrates and Caligulus love different things, philosophy or the Athenian demons, they behave differently toward their individual darlings, Archibides or uh, Demos son of Columbus. Both darlings of Caligulus are fickle, and uh, Caligulus follows them. He is subject to them. But Socrates' chief darling, philosophy, is not fickle, never changes his mind, and therefore it is easy for him to resist Caligulus and Archibides' changes of mind. So uh, Socrates claims here also that what he had asserted in the Polo section was not his assertion, but the assertion of philosophy. Uh, his only hope is that Caligulus, because he is an erotic man, has some access to Socrates. That's the only bridge between them. When he speaks of the son of Perilampus, he calls him the beautiful youth. Uh, in this demos, the son of Perilampus, is beautiful. The other demos, the Athenian demos, is not. Now, the demos was uh, um, personified, especially in Aristophanes' comedy, The Night, as an, a good-natured, somewhat foolish old man. I mean, in other words, oh, and so are fat too, so not uh, by no means beautiful. Um, and the question is, can one love such a fellow? I mean, can one have an erotic desire for such a fellow? Um, 
And it is, of course, also implied here that the conversation with Polos was a philosophic discussion. We know now that this is a somewhat unjustified claim, and we must keep this in mind. Now, let us go on where we left off. So, we must find the weak term, as I said, philosophy, yeah. As I said just now, by proving that wrongdoing and impunity for wrong done is not the uttermost evil, or if you leave that unproved, I am a dog, not an Egyptian. There will be no agreement between you, Calicles, and Calicles. But you will be in this court with it all the life. Yeah. So Sugar's claims here that Calicles cannot reject Sugar's thesis, which is not the thesis of Sugar's but of philosophy, without contradicting himself. You cannot contradict the truth without contradicting yourself. Um, this um, uh, should be clear. Now, what is this oath by the dog? which has occurred before in this dialogue, but here we have the only explanation ever given of this strange oath, the god of the Egyptians. Now, uh, uh, what, uh, what is peculiar to the Egyptians? Well, according to Herodotus, oh, thank you very much, to the Herodotus, um, Egyptians are exaggeratedly pious, i.e. they regard um, uh, millions of things which do not deserve to be called gods as gods. So, uh, therefore, also dogs. But the cat was at least as important. What, why is Socrates more interested in the dogs than in cats? I mean, the dog has some great merits. It has nothing to do with modern dog worship. Very, it's much more solid. And it's a philosophic beast yeah, in the Republic. Because he, he loves, he likes acquaintances and hates strangers. And this shows him his criterion for preferring is knowledge. Hence, the, now the true thing, of course, is that the dog is because of this uh, preferring strangers, uh, acquaintances and hating strangers, as the prototype of the citizen. Yeah, the citizen. That is the, the deeper reason. And, um, well, you, you see, when, and also when you observe a dog barking, uh, the similarity to an orator uh, is quite striking. I mean, especially in some cases, for example, I remember the case of Sam Rayburn. When he talked, it uh, reminded one immediately of a dog barking, which uh, I say without any disrespect. Uh, Xenophon, by the way, I mentioned this in passing, never, uh, Xenophon is much more uh, sub, uh, subdued in every point than, Sugar, than Plato is, Xenophon never has Sugaris swear by the dog, but he makes Sugaris tell a story in which a dog swears by Zeus. That is uh, the utmost he can do. Surely this oath is a comical touch, and uh, in some, uh, in considerable contrast with the gravity of the subject. This we must keep in mind. Will you go on, Mr. Rankin? And yet I, my very good sir, should wrongly choose to have my lion or some chorus that I might provide for the public out of tune and discord, or to have any number of people disagreeing with me and contradicting me, than that I should have internal discord and contradiction in my own single self. Yeah. So Sumer is in contradistinction to Caligles, regards as the worst thing the lack of agreement with oneself. I, this lack of agreement with others, with the many, is much less serious from his point of view. Philosophy produces agreement with oneself. Without philosophy, men are in disagreement with themselves. Whereas rhetoric produces agreement with the others. But 
if it follows from this difference between philosophy and rhetoric, that the agreement produced by rhetoric is never free from self-contradiction. Um, whether the rhetoric is vulgar rhetoric or Socratic rhetoric doesn't make any difference. Good. Now the chorus here, to which he refers as one example, Socrates uh, visualizes himself for a moment as a leader of a chorus. Uh, he would not be too greatly concerned with the harmony of that chorus, much more with the harmony of each member of the chorus with himself. Um, now, when we, uh, we see already here something of the overall effect of Socrates' reply to Callicles. Socrates claims that his assertion is an assertion of philosophy, not his own. Yet, or for this very reason, Socrates is less grave than Callicles is. Uh, let us go on. Socrates, you seem to be blustering recklessly in your cause, like the true demagogue that you are. And you are declaiming now in this way because Polis has got into the same plight as he was accusing Gorgias of letting himself be led into by For he said, I think, when you asked Gorgias whether you supposed the man who came to him with no knowledge of justice but a desire to learn rapidly, he would instruct him. Gorgias showed some shame and said he would, because of the habit of mind of people which would make him indignant and confused, and so because of this admission, he was forced to contradict himself. And that was just what suited you. And Polis was right to my thinking in mocking at you as he did then. But this time he has got into the very same plight himself. For my let, own let us yeah, no, let us stop here first for a moment. So is here, Caligles, Socrates had said philosophy had spoken through him. Caligles emphatically denies that. You have not talked like a philosopher. You have talked like an ordinary, vulgar orator, like a demagogue. Um, in the case of Gorgias, Socrates exploited Gorgias's um, a fear of popular disapproval. That was grossly unfair. But in Calicles' statement of Gorgias' mistake is much clearer than Polos's. But yet Gorgias too, uh, Calicles too, doesn't bring out the fundamental effect of Go uh, fundamental error or mistake committed by Gorgias. Do you remember what that fundamental mistake of Gorgias was? Yeah, but this was not, uh, uh, this was not thematic. Explicit mistake. Explicit mistake. Yeah. Because the body found and what the was, what a mistake she was in was there. No, Polos, but gorgeous. Gorgeous mistake. Mr. Barrow. so that others can hear you. No justice, to know the just things means to do them. That is uh, what led to Gorgias' uh, 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 downfall. <coughs> yes? For my own part, where I am not satisfied with Pontus, is just that concession he made to you, that doing wrong is power than suffering. For owing to this admission, he too, in his turn, got entangled in your argument and had his mouth stopped, being ashamed, he said, of what he thought. So in other words, Polos made fundamentally the same mistake. Out of shame, he didn't say what he thought, and therefore he got into trouble. They also have a pathos, an affect, affection, gorgeous in Polos, but not arrows, but sense of shame. 
also a disturbing effect. Yes, go on. For you, Socrates, really turn to talk into such low, popular claptrap, one can give out if you were pursuing the truth, into self that is fake, not by nature, but by convention. Yet, for the most part, these two, nature and convention, are opposed to each other, so that if a man is ashamed and dares not say what he thinks, he is forced to contradict himself. And this book is the clever trick you have devised for undoing in part your discussions. When a man states anything according to convention, you slip according to nature in your question. And again, if he means nature, you reply convention. Yeah. And so that is a vulgar orator who pretends to seek the truth, but is only a vulgar orator. And why? Because he takes seriously the nomos, the convention, the law, in contradistinction to nature. Sugata's whole refutation of Polos is based on the confusion of what is by nature noble and what is noble by convention. Now, here, Polos, in fact, appeals to philosophy from Socrates, who non-philosophically non accepts the nomos, or popular thought. He says, as it were, I am the lover of philosophy, while you, Socrates, are the lover of the demos, concerned with popular applause, because you reproduce what is accepted popularly. Uh, now, we have to consider for one moment this distinction between nature and convention. In, according, to the, to, to, according to the textbook version, that is an so invention of the sophists. But this cannot be correct, because the traditional distinction known up to the present day between natural and positive right or natural and positive law is based on the distinction because what is called here positive is the same as conventional, posited by men. Um, yet one could say, all right, but in the distinction between natural and positive law, the relation of the natural and the positive is not understood as an opposition, or as a necessary opposition, as it is understood here. This is true. But the distinction, uh, the, the understanding of the relation of nature and um, uh, convention as opposites is the key assertion of that most unsophistical book, Plato's Republic, where it is made clear that absolute communism, i.e. communism regarding property, women and children, and the equality of the sexes are according to nature whereas the prevalent habits, no communism, and inequality of the sexes are merely by nomos for opinion convention. So this, uh, I mean, in other words, one is a very, I, I have shown by, um, briefly enough, but uh, um, I think clearly enough, that this distinction is, and even the, which includes always the possibility of an opposition, is much older than the sophists and goes in a way back to the origins of Greek philosophy. I will mention here only one point. Why do these historical errors regarding the distinction of nature and convention arise? Why has this distinction become unintelligible or obsolete? Now, when you look back to the 17th century, this where our modern thought was founded. So view, uh, natural convention means, of course, there are certain things which are not natural, clear, only conventional. Now, the thesis then advanced was everything that is or happens is natural. Uh, the, what was later called naturalism, but in that peculiarly modern sense. Everything that is or happens is natural. It's the so-called determinism of the 17th century. 
um, as a result of which the science of society became social, social physics. Now, this implies that all conventions are necessary for the people concerned. So if you have monogamy in this tribe and polygamy in that tribe and another arrangement in tribe number three, this is necessary, caused by natural causes, climate uh, and what have you. Um, and then from this point of view, of course, there is no, the conventions are as natural as everything else. But if you think this through, it see, it, as you see, it implies that all laws are sound. They are the right law. Anywhere the laws, wherever you find them, they are exactly right for the people concerned. Now, one could feel that this is a somewhat sanguine view of laws and uh, other difficulties. And when at the end of the development, more or less, at least hitherto, I find the book by Ruth Benedict, Patterns of Culture, which I frequently quote, because it is the only book of cultural anthropology which I have ever read. And she, when she discusses the question, why tribes differ, I said three Red Indian tribes in Florida, wherever they were, and she comes to the conclusion that climate and any other such cause doesn't explain it, because the climate is the same and the race is the same and everything else. And she ultimately arrives, I do not know the words which she uses, that the difference is due to the fact that these different tribes freely or arbitrarily adopted either value system A or value system B. In other words, the ultimate fact behind which you cannot go is an inexplicable decision of a society. This is what was meant originally by nomos, a decision which is no longer explicable and behind which you cannot go. So in other words, in a strange way, the distinction reappears uh, in, in uh, present-day thought. And this much may suffice for the time being. But the, to repeat the distinction, physics nomos is not a preserve of the service, only a certain use which, which is made um, uh, by Caligulus here in the way in which he makes it. We will see that uh, the main asser uh, his assertion will consist of two parts, half of which is identical with what Socrates and Plato assert. One half is not compatible because he truly didn't understand what uh, Plato, what this distinction meant. Now let us go on here. In the present case, for instance, of doing and suffering wrong, when Polis was speaking of what is conventionally proper, you followed it up in the sense of what is naturally so. For by nature, everything is proper that is more evil, such as suffering wrong. Doing it is power only by convention. Indeed, this endurance of wrong done is not a man's part at all, but a poor slave's, for whom it is better to be dead than alive. So here is one reason given, um, uh, the first reason given uh, by uh, Caligulus for his assertions that suffering wrong is worse and more base than doing wrong. It is unworthy of a man of an hombre, uh, not to be able to take care of himself or uh, to, uh, yeah, to take suffering wrong lying down. It is clear that this is a conventional uh, view. Uh, in other words, this man who claims to present a purely natural view is more a slave of convention than anyone else in this dialogue. Yes. Now? As it is for anybody who, when wronged or insulted, is unable to protect himself or anyone else for whom he cares. But I suppose the makers of the laws are the weaker sort of men and the more noblest. So it is with the few to themselves and their own interests that they make their laws and distribute their phrases and censures. You see, he, he goes over from law in the singular, nomos, to 
to no more in the law in the plural. But this is, um, uh, has a very clear meaning, because what is law in the sense used by him, which we translate ordinarily by convention, this he makes clear here by making the distinction. The laws, the praises, and the blames. This, in, in other words, is not limited to law in the narrow sense of the term. All the, all the social premia, premiums uh, and also all praises and blames are as much a part of the overall law, of the overall convention, as the law is proper. Yes? And to terrorize the stronger sort of folks who are able to get an advantage and to prevent them from getting one over them, they tell them that such a grandissement is foul and unjust, and that wrongdoing is just as endeavor to get the advantage of one's neighbors. For I expect they are well content to see themselves on an equality, but they are so inferior. So this is why, like, Now, let us stop here for one moment. Now, what does he explain? Uh, so, uh, for a man, i.e., uh, for one part of the human race called, let us call them he men, uh, it is better to do injustice than to suffer injustice. What about the others, the many? They make it a nomos, a convention that the desire to have more than others, as distinguished from equal, is base. This, for this convention, is useful to them. Naturally, because they would always get less. Whereas for the superior man, doing injustice is both useful and noble. And what he claims is that only these standards of the of the man, of the of the men, he men, is natural because and what's the reason for that? Why is not the standard of the many equally natural? Because the, the, because this equality which they claim is a fictitious thing. They no one wants the equal. This is only a kind of deliberate an arbitrary compromise which they make. The falsehood is the assertion of equality for all, whereas there is no falsehood implied in what the he-man assert. This is, I think, the point. And now, still, we are still in need of a proof of this assertion. Now, the proof follows in the immediate secret. So this is why by convention, it is termed unjust and foul to aim at an advantage over the majority, and why they call it wrongdoing. But nature, in my opinion, herself proclaims the fact that it is right for the better to have advantage of the worse and the abler of the people. It is obvious in many cases that this is so, not only in the animal world, but in the states and races that right has been decided to consist in the sway and advantage of the stronger over the weaker. For by what manner of right did Xerxes march against Greece, or his father against Sicily? One might think, or take the countless other cases of the sort that one might mention. Why, surely, these men follow nature, the nature of right, in acting thus, yet on my soul, by Zeus, by Zeus. By Zeus. And follow the law of nature, though not that, I dare say, which is made by us. We mold the best and strongest among us, taking them from their infancy like young lions, and utterly enthralled them by our spells and witchcraft, telling them the while that they must have but their equal share, and that this is what is fair and just. But I fancy, when some man arises with the nature of sufficient force, he shakes off all that we have taught him, bursts his bonds, and breaks free. He tramples underfoot our codes and juggleries, our charms and laws, which are all against nature. 
our slave grinds his remote and shows himself our master. And they go on the full light of natural justice. Of natural rights, yeah. Now, calling this proof is that then nature has, herself shows the just itself. Namely, that the better or more powerful should have more than the inferior or weaker. Uh, the lion uh, is, uh, the, is, uh, takes, uh, is, has more than the lamb, etc. Now, he gives the example of the Persian king against the Greeks, a, f a war against the Athenian demos. You see, Callicles can rise above the particular. He doesn't speak here as an Athenian patriot. He speaks of the natural. But also, what he does not say is that this enterprise led to Salamis and Plate, i.e. to a situation in which the Athenian demos was stronger than the Persian king. He is silent here on the Athenian imperialism, he doesn't mention that, of course, quite naturally, because Gorgias is present from Leontini in Sicily, and the major act of Athens, Athenian imperialism, was the Sicilian expedition. And this is very tactful of him. Now, he is a, you look at the terms which he uses. He speaks first of the nature of right an expression used also by Glaucon in his speech in the Second Book of the Republic. This is a relatively neutral term. Even a man who denies natural right has to raise the question of what is the nature of right. One could be right is conventional. But then he speaks of the right of nature, of what is just according to nature. And then finally, he speaks of the law of nature. That's the first time that this term occurs. He uses in, the, in this context, he says, by Zeus, a law, uh, the law of, na oh, a law of nature. It's the connection between law and Zeus, uh, in contradistinction to a human law, is still a presence there. Caligres cannot, in spite of his opposition of law, of nature and law, he cannot overcome uh, the desire for law. And uh, you see at the end of this passage which we read, Caligres regards himself not as one of these true men. He counts himself among the demons. The, the many. Um, when he stands up, our slave, we have enslaved him, i.e., I do not belong to them. He forgets, just as he raises above the peculiar interest of the Athenian demos, he raises also above his own interest. He, is, um, he bows to that which is greater than he the law of nature uh, which uh, favors the strong. Um, he is in this sense a noble man. He can forget his own private interest. And uh, this natural right, well, this, um, parallel, uh, this passage has a parallel in Glaucon's speech in the Second Book of the Republic, which one should carefully uh, compare. The more striking difference is this, that in Glaucon's presentation, natural right doesn't have the splendor which it has in, in uh, uh, Caligula's presentation. And uh, this is, is also expressed in the following fact, that uh, Glaucon does not speak of a natural right. Right is positive right. Uh, what is natural is indeed that the stronger uh, overpowers the weaker, uh, but this is not more just. Just this belongs entirely to the conventional sphere. Uh, uh, Caligres gives nature the whole splendor hitherto given to justice and the noble. Yes. Now, now we get another argument 
of um, uh, uh, calculus. And it seems to me that Pindar adds his evidence to what I say in the oath where he says, Law, the sovereign of all, mortals and immortals, which, so he continues, carries all with highest hand, justifying the utmost force. It proved by faith the deeds of purchase or unpurchase. The words are something like that. I do not know the poem well. But it tells how he drove off the cows as neither a purchase nor a gift from Uriah. Taking it as a natural right that cows or any other possessions of the inferior and weaker should all belong to the superior and stronger. Now he, in addition uh, to the argument taken from nature herself, he gives an argument taken from authority. The authority is this time being the poet Pindar. But this authority is much less emphasized than what nature herself shows, of which I had spoken before. And Pindar is a witness to the truth that the true nomos, the true law, legitimates violence. He is not particularly concerned with knowing poets, you see that here. Uh, he doesn't remember their poem, doesn't care particularly. He doesn't care for, in our language, for culture. And that means, uh, uh, to use uh, uh, some loose terms used by the Greeks, he doesn't care for philosophy. And this will come out in the immediate sequence. Yes. And you will grant it if you will now put philosophy aside and pass to greater things. For philosophy in those are pretty charming things a man has to do with his father in his young age. But if he continues to spend his time with it too long, it is ruined to any man. The corruption. Corruption. The famous term because Sugares was accused of corrupting the young. Yeah. Yes? However well endowed one may be, if one philosophizes as far on into life, one must needs find oneself ignorant of everything that ought to be familiar to the man who would You know, these it. terms with familiar, ignorant, are all, um, mean all experienced or inexperienced. I say this once for all, yes? So, uh, 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 of which a man must become who wants to be a perfect gentleman and well known. Yeah. For such people are shown to be ignorant of the laws of their city. Inexperience again. Yeah. Yes. Inexperience in the laws of their city and of the terms which have to be used in negotiating agreements with their fellows in private or in public affairs and of human pleasures and desires, and in short, to be utterly inexperienced in men's characters. So, when they enter upon any private or public business, they make themselves ridiculous, just as, on the other hand, I suppose, when public men engage in your studies and discussions, they are quite ridiculous. The fact is, as whoever has it, each shines in that to that man who presses on allotting there the chiefest part of the day, wherein he actually can surpass himself. Yeah. Now, so uh, Callicles had spoken hitherto as a philosopher against the orator Socrates. But we have seen his appeal to nomos, and incidentally also the frequent use of the term I believe, oimai, which occurs seven times in his speech, shows that he himself is an orator of sorts. Sugares does not know the truth, he asserts. Um, that's to say, in his conduct, in his conversation with Polos, he did not merely play with Polos or was uh, uh, this, but he was, so as plainly, ignorant. And the reason for his ignorance is that he has not transcended philosophy going beyond philosophy to some mysteries. Yeah? Some mysteries. Um, he, and therefore he has become corrupted by philosophy, or too much philosophy. 
He has not acquired experience of these greater things. And these are the political or the human things. Among them are, of course, the laws. So, in other words, very strangely, Socrates now appears as a man who knows nature, to the extent to which the philosopher is a man who knows nature, but not the law. But surely, in order to be able to evade the laws, as a true politician uh, must, one must know the laws, and Socrates, therefore, is wholly unfit for the political life. Uh, Caligula's thesis in itself uh, is, um, of course, of the highest respectability. It occurs with a slight modification in the most solemn statement of Athens at that time, Pericles' funeral speech, when Pericles says, we, Athenians, love wisdom, philosophize, with thrift. Yeah, that's it. You do not go too far. Do not waste your life on that. And uh, a modern example, uh, which I remember dimly, is Kipling's poem, If, which I myself like very much, but I was told it is very old-fashioned, especially in Kipling's own country, and not to smile at that, uh, and not to be amused by that. You know, you know, some of you will know it. Yeah? If, and then when he speaks of the thinker, if you are only a thinker, that's not good. good. Uh, yes, now go on. Where we, where we left. You see, he quotes here Euripides, and he will uh, quote him again. Yes. So. Uh, he has some knowledge of the poets, naturally. When he was young, he did this kind of thing, but when he became mature, he did things becoming a mature man. Marketplace and not school. Yes. Whereas that in which he is weak, he should not be in which he is weak, he shuns and vilifies. But the other he praises, he kindness to himself, thinking in this way to praise him. But the most proper course I consider is to take a share of both. It is a fine thing to partake of philosophy just for the sake of education, and it is no disgrace for a lad to follow. But when a man, already advancing in years, continues in his pursuit, the affair, Socrates, becomes ridiculous. And for my part, I have much the same feeling towards students of philosophy as towards those who live or play tricks. For when I see a little child to whom it is still natural to talk in that way, let's be playing some trick, I enjoy it. And it strikes me as pretty and ingenuous and suitable to the instant day. For if I feel the fear of small child talk to safety, I find it a disagreeable thing, and it offends my ears and seems to be more fitting to the slave. But when one you know, because slave children were not could not afford to remain children as long as uh, children of the free. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, yes? When one hears a grown man bless, or sees him play first, it strikes one as something ridiculous and unbanned that deserves a living. Thus to say, then, is my feeling for the followers of philosophy. For when I see philosophy in a young lad, I approve of it. I consider it suitable. And no, sir, becoming decent. To see how much he is an Athenian gentleman going by the conventions of his society. Yes. And I regard him as a person of liberal mind. Whereas one who does not follow it, I account him little and never likely to expect of himself any fine or generous action. But when I see an elderly man still going on with philosophy and not getting rid of it, that is the gentleman Socrates, whom I think is the of a woman. He used to, everyone sees, of course, whom he means. Which element? Yeah. Yes. For, as I said just now, this person, However well endowed he may be, is bound to become unmanned through shunning the centers and marks of the city, in which, as the poet said, men get themselves in glory. Yeah, men
then always has a clear meaning male human beings yeah? and with a and also the addition of social standing and wealth because but like hombre this is uh, the best example which i have from the modern language yes he must cower down and spend the rest of his days whispering in the corner with three or four lads and never utter anything free or high or spiritual Yeah, let us stop here for one second. So the, he he teaches now the correct thing, kind of Emily Post of Athens. What is a proper and becoming thing regarding philosophy? Um, Socrates, we know, deserves to be spanked, um, and naturally, as this is only spanking, be a milder form of killing. I mean, it is not exactly killing very far from it, but it's on the way toward it, affecting the body in an adverse manner. Now, this stem, uh, this list stammering, would be more literal translation, may be an allusion to Alcibiades, who was known to lisp. In other words, uh, so that not only Socrates but also Alcibiades is uh, gets a dig. You know, this kind. It was this kind of babyish way of talking. It's very nice in a baby, but unbearable in a in a man, in a grown up being. Um, yes. Now, um, so Callicles turns in a way the tables on Socrates. Uh, Socrates had said, "You love the demons," and. Uh, Calicles says, no, I, I do it by indication. I love the, the polis. He, Calicles, in contrary distinction to Polos and Gorgias, is a political man. And as such, he must oppose Socrates. This is altogether a very important question for the Platonic dialogues as a whole. In the Apology, Socrates is presented, or says of himself, that he is talking especially by, to the uh, f- political men, political men, to the artisans, and to the poets. But if you look at the Platonic dialogues, you will find very few dialogues, w- very few dialogues with poets, uh, none with artisans, and very few with political men. I.e. with men who are already politically active. I'm not speaking now of young boys who want to go into politics. Very few. Calicles is, and especially if you limited Athenian politi- political men, very few. Many less, uh, uh, much less than one would think. Uh, the clearest, Calicles is a clear example. And the, the dialogue with political men, in my opinion, is the Laches. Where Socrates talks to four political men at the same time, two uh, famous generals, Laches and Nicias, and two the sons of famous generals, Melesias and Lysimachus. Uh, they are very rare. So here we have a confrontation of Socrates with the with the Athenian political man. Uh, good. Now let us. Uh, Finish, if we can, this section. Now I, Socrates, am quite very friendly to you. Yeah, that is good, well translated. In other words, he doesn't claim to be too friendly because we have seen Socrates deserves being whipped. Yes. And so I feel very much at this moment as the assistant whom I have mentioned towards Hampi. He had a problem to address him in the same sort of words as he did his brother. You neglect, Socrates, what you ought to mind. You distort with a kind of boyish travesty a soul of such noble nature, and neither will you bring to the counsels of justice any rightly spoken word, nor will you accept any as probable or convincing, nor advise any jealous plan for your fellow. And yet, my dear Socrates, no, do not be annoyed with me, for I am going to say this with good will to you. Does it not seem to you disgraceful to be in the state I consider you are in, along with the rest of those who are ever pushing further into philosophy? For 
Because he's poor. Yeah. These are uh, constant quotations from Euripides inserted into the prose. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. This is the end of that long speech. Uh, Callicles believes to be Socrates' friend. In a way, even his brother, like Satos and Amphion. His affection, his pathos. Uh, uh, Thomas Sugares is, of course, not Eros. Uh, so, uh, uh, for no Eros between brother and brother, uh, he, um, he has a certain sympathy with sort of good will. He appeals here again to his primary reason, uh, which is not that theory of natural right, but that it is unmanly not to be able to defend oneself against unjust accusation. Unjust accusation. Uh, this unjust accusation has to be distinguished from Caligula's own just accusation according to which the word is, is corrupted and hence corrupting. You see, the, there are two sides to that. Um, now, this case of being able to defend oneself against unjust accusation is the evidently sound case for forensic rhetoric. And we must see what happens to this later on in the dialogue. Uh, the verses which he quotes from Euripides, the whole play is not uh, preserved, but this much is known that he replaces Cetos's recommendation of arms, that his brother, a, mu a music man, should train himself in arms, by the recommendation of forensic rhetoric. Forensic rhetoric is a weapon, it's a weapon to defend oneself. Why does he... Um, he does not have recourse to his, quote, immoral teaching, which he has stated before. Why does he not do that? Why does he limit himself to the most defensible part of his argument, that a man should be able to defend himself against unjust accusation? That also makes sense. I believe that there is this connection. Perhaps there is a necessary link between the perfectly legitimate concern with one's self-preservation and the desire for having more and more. Perhaps this is what Socrates has in mind. Does this, remind, this suggestion remind you of a thing that you have heard or read before? that the desire for self-preservation by itself leads to the desire for having more and more? Oh, sure. That's Pope's argument. That, uh, because if, she, if the end is legitimate, the means are legitimate. And since it is absolutely impossible to say in a state of nature what means 
are conducive to your self-preservation or what not, because you can, you can know uh, anything can come in handy, uh, and the uh, errors of judgment are, of course, uh, uh, do not make your action unjust. Every man has a right to everything. Deduced from the perfectly sound right of everything to self preservation. We must keep this in mind. He speaks here in E7 of this, uh, the fact that the nature of Socrates' soul is fair, naturally. The nature of Socrates' body is not fair. He was uh, notorious for his ugliness. He seem, uh, uh, Calicus refers to the possibility that Socrates might be uh, condemned to death, but still he seems to regard it as more likely that Socrates will lose his fortune, which according to Socrates' own estimate was very small, uh, or that he will get his ears boxed, which uh, uh, would of course be a very a grave thing. Now, he, if we look at uh, Caligula's speech as a whole, we see he despises rhetoric, public orator. He accuses Socrates of being behaved like a vulgar orator, and yet he needs public uh, oratory and even praises it. He appeals to philosophy by speaking of nature versus convention, and yet he also despises philosophy. He behaves like Socrates' brother, and yet he acts already as his accuser. Uh, now, one can, of course, say these are no contradictions, but that he chooses in each case the right mean. For example, uh, oratory, yes, but not in a private uh, conversation. Um, philosophy, yes, but only up to a certain age, and so on. But how is that right mean established for Caliclus? By the rules of Athenian gentleman propriety, by nomos. This is surely his fundamental proposition. So Caliclus attacks then in this speech Socrates uh, on two grounds. The first regarding the issue of justice, and second the issue of philosophy. Now, what for Caliclus are two entirely different issues uh, is for Socrates one and the same issue if justice is philosophy, as I still would maintain. Mr. Troy? Yeah, but that, that is that is very uh, interesting, and it gives me a good opportunity to apply a simple lesson to you. He before he speaks of Xerxes and the cities, and the, so on, he speaks also of something else uh, as a proof of the right of the stronger. This is the natural right. The animals. This can be easily overlooked, but this alone guarantees that it is not, it cannot be considered merely conventional because the animals do have it. I think uh, this much, uh, somehow he, uh, he has learned, uh, one must know philosophy. Philosophy is the only way to get rid, to liberate the mind from convention. But once you have achieved this liberation, which alone will enable you to engage in politics without foolish reservation, then, of course, you have to learn the trade and see and to go into politics yeah, in on-the-job training. Uh, and uh, so uh, that uh, Socrates never did. And therefore, Socrates is inferior to him 
because Suarez well, knows only this sphere of philosophy, which Calligris himself also knows, and Calligris, in addition, knows politics. So, who is a better judge? Is it accurate to say that the project is the only important teaching of philosophy is this simple understanding of the law of nature? So you, 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 with, oh, you know, it has considerable applica implications, for, especially in the God of the Gods. Uh, it is when you want to understand this better, if you want to understand this passage better, you should also read the dialogue between the Athenians and the Millions in the end of the fifth book of Thucydides' history. Uh, because there the same question is discussed, where the Athenian ambassadors to Milos in a strictly political conversation, they try to persuade the Millions to uh, hand over their city to the Athenians. The Athenians need it uh, for their war against Sparta. Uh, there is the question, the millions who are old-fashioned, uh, kind of Spartan gentlemen, and they believe in right in the ordinary traditional sense of the term. And then uh, the Athenians rejects his consideration. Fundamentally on this ground, the natural right is a right of the stronger. And they show that the very Spartans who claim more, to be more pious and just than any other nation, act more on that natural right than any other nation. And, but the difference, of course, is that in the Million Dialogue, the beings who are declared to be entitled to do these things are only political societies, not individuals. And uh, not individuals. And is this, of course, uh, one of the deeper things into this argument is, does it not necessarily follow when you apply this principle of uh, the right of the stronger to the cities, are you not compelled sooner or later to admit the same regarding the individual, so that this principle would be destructive of the city itself? And uh, I think that is uh, at least to that extent, that it is a very good argument in favor of tyranny. Because the tyrant exercises as an individual the right of the stronger. And uh, uh, what can you say against the tyranny if you as a city exercise tyrannical rule as she was said to do during the years of her greatness? I think that is uh, so. Um, while the argument of the million, in the million dialogue is much more political and a much higher level from this point of view than what uh, uh, Calicles says here and what Glaucon says in the second book of the Republic, and yet it seems to lead eventually to the cruder argument of Calicles and, uh, and uh, Glaucon. Uh, because, uh, uh, I mean, if the city claims that uh, these things are nobly done, if done by the city and basely done by the individual. Uh, 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 somehow the city destroys the basis of its prohibitions. If it says the city can do what the individual can not do, sooner or later. But here uh, the question is uh, um, uh, immediately becomes immediately the individual, although he had first spoken of the cities. That's quite interesting. He had not spoken there of individuals. He had spoken of animals and uh, political societies, including, of course, kings, who are ever uh, acting as kings act on behalf of political society. He had not spoken of the mere individual. This will come out in the sequel. So, well, is there any other 
any point you, someone of you might would like to bring up? Yes. Why does Socrates and first speech of Callicles make Callicles to philosophy? Why does he bring philosophy into the dialogue altogether? He didn't know who told us. Yeah, this is a, in the discussion with Callicles becomes much more radical than with uh, than it was with Polos. So does it come out of what you see? Socrates forced to show that Gorgias what his ideas are. No, in the first, who is the first who brings up philosophy, theme philosophy? Socrates. And uh, so um, Socrates thinks. Conf no, he knows Calicles to some extent before, of course. He thinks it is now, now we must uh, bust the case wide open and therefore also bring up the subject of philosophy. But um, in Calicles' argument, I think the, the inner link is this. The, op the clear and explicit opposition between nature and convention is made on the basis of philosophy. And therefore, the subject of philosophy uh, is, should come up. And Calicles' correction consists in this um, philosophy is indeed necessary in order to, to establish this distinction with all its interesting consequences. But then that's all. And that's all we need. Once we have learned this grave lesson, then we have to learn the practice of politics, which the philosophers, Socrates, had never attempted to do, and therefore um, they are in a deplorable position in the city. Good. Then we will meet next time. beginning of the Caligula section, uh, Socrates appeals to Caligula at the start of the conversation on the basis that they have something in common as lovers. Um, you have indicated that the difference of names of Socrates' loved ones, as contrasted to the identity of the names of Caligula's loved ones, indicates a significant difference between the loves of each man. Man, in a sense, Caligula's loves one and the same, in that he follows each obediently on an irregular path. So it is equally obeys philosophy, but it seems to lead on a more regular path. What then um, can be the nature of Socrates' love for Alcibiades? Well, Socrates has one stable, darling, philosophy. And therefore, he is able to be stable also towards his fickle darling, Alcibiades. Whereas um, Caligula's two darlings are equally fickle. And he can, is not safe from fickleness by, by any of them. It would seem that the love of philosophy excludes his love for Alcibiades. Why? I would like to know the reason. Why is Alcibiades mentioned? And to what extent is it true that the Caligles and Socrates have something in common as lovers? Well, surely, qua lovers, they have something in common. And that distinguishes them from the non-lovers, uh, presumably in this dialogue, Polos and Gorgias. And, uh, but is, is their loves they differ because uh, not only do they love different human beings, but they love also different causes, if I may say so, uh, a, a philosophy on the one hand and the Athenian demos on the other. But why should the love for a cause be uh, incompatible with the love for a human being? The place uh, to come closer to what we know uh, uh, young men by two girls. Why cannot a lover also Oh, where is Mr. Matthew? I do not know you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I know you, of course, but I didn't um, remember your name. Yes. I've been speaking the religious community. It's developed from philosophy affecting the love of 
super love, um, or else by me just being something like the love of the healthy or um, um, beings. Yeah, but uh, if you look on the one hand a rock, and on the other something like gelatin, uh, do you not have something to fall back on from the beloved gelatin? That's all. Yeah. And there is no such thing as a case of uh, of uh, of uh, calculus. Good. Now um, I would like to. Uh, say a few words before we begin our discussion. Um, now the issue raised in the Gorgias uh, by Poulos and more emphatically and clearly by Calicles is uh, in a way still alive, at least practically. This is surely true that the question whether one should prefer doing injustice or uh, suffering injustice is um, of concern to every human being. But, uh, the question is whether it is still alive theoretically. Now, the position of Caligles was apparently restored by Nietzsche. Uh, there is an appendix in Dodd's commentary on the relation between uh, and Nietzsche and Caligles, and there are some passages in Nietzsche which, of which seem to be of the same effect. This is of only a very superficial point in Nietzsche, but apparently there are such statements. More clearly, perhaps, the social Darwinians, survival of the fittest, is only another way of saying the right of the stronger. The position which Sugares takes uh, leads to the natural right doctrine in the traditional sense of the term, i.e. to something which in the now fashionable language is called absolute values, which are uh, uh, question by present-day social science, as you know. The favorite term in uh, political science now is uh, power. Now, whether between the nations or within the nations, the struggle for who gets what, uh, when, uh, this is uh, fundamentally the same. But people frequently believe that the position stated here by Caligles uh, is the same as social science relativism, and that I think is very wrong. And uh, I say this is not in defense of out of any love for social science relativism, uh, but uh, for the sake of clarity. One could, of course, say then that there is a powerful school within social science which does not admit anything other than power. Think of uh, uh, Laswell's famous formula. Uh, safety, income, deference. These are the only goals uh, of political life, and uh, which, of course, uh, this would seem to agree with what Caligula says. But uh, this does not go to the root uh, of the matter because the uh, last one's position is not that one which is universally accepted. Now, what is then the peculiarity? of, uh, say, Calicles, or for that matter, Glaucon's position in the Republic, and what we hear today. Now, the key point is this. For Calicles, there are things which are by nature good for man as man. Maybe it is only self-preservation, but that is by nature good. And when he says, in effect, that what is ordinarily understood by justice is only conventional. He says this on the basis of an, of an alleged knowledge of what is by nature. And it is understood that there are certain things which are good by nature. For example, health, life itself. Social science relativism denies the, that there is anything which is by nature good. This is implied in the distinction between facts uh, of, and values or the distinction between the is and the ought. All values or all oughts are not natural, but freely posited. There cannot be any natural values which are by nature, because then they would no longer be arbitrary. And dependent on choice. For example, if a man's 
values were determined by his hereditary heredity and environment, the ought would follow from the is, which is excluded by the basic premise, no transition from facts to values, no transition from is to ought. Now the same would of course be true if a man's desires would uh, determine his values because his desires uh, are uh, imposed on him. He's not responsible for the mere desire's desire. And this is shown simply by the fact a man has a desire. He can fight that desire and perhaps even successfully. He surely can disapprove of his desires. And his values would not be the desires, but that in the light of which he disapproves of his desires. Now, and when you come to the question, what is the basis of his values, as distinguished from his desires, you come ultimately back to a free act which can no longer be accounted for rationally. I'm aware of the fact that in most of the literature, this distinction is not properly made, as I should make it, but uh, this is not my responsibility. If I were a fact value man, I would surely insist on that. All ends or values are positive. Therefore, for example, self-preservation cannot be a natural end, as it was according to Locke, Hobbes, etc., and of course, uh, according to Socrates too. Uh, there cannot be any values imposed on men by nature. The proof is that you may choose life, uh, death as your value instead of life, uh, as a, a relativist, of course, a third. Now, what does this mean? In, I will restate this now in historical terms. Uh, social science relativism presupposes the liberation from the apron strings of nature, which Kant has affected at the end of the 18th century. There are no ends, as Kant still calls them, imposed on us by nature, and all ends derive from the exercise of our freedom. And this, uh, the, uh, the, by the way, the influence on Kant, on present-day uh, social science relativism, uh, can be seen more simply in, by the following fact. The theoretical uh, philosophic school which they follow is called logical positivism. Now what distinguishes logical positivism from the earlier positivism is exactly the influence of Kant. The logical positivism has learned they are no longer followers of Hume as they claim to be. And the key point is that it is impossible um, and the, uh, that um, the insight into the so-called genetic fallacy, i.e. that if you explain the genesis of causal thinking, you have elucidated the validity of causal thinking. This simple point they learned directly through Kant or Kantianism. And so the, this Kantianism is even effective in their way of stating the ethical problem. This much uh, so that we do not assume that there is a direct connection uh, between uh, the so-called sophistic position and present-day social science. That in effect, the influence, uh, the, the, in effect, there is some uh, they work in the same way as some enthusiasts. I would not deny, but the theoretical position is very different. Yes. Uh, so, so why does a man because otherwise they follow from the, from the well, uh, environment or heredity, we don't have to make a distinction. There is, there is. Because if the value which a man has, um, and say, uh, he is a man, say, yeah, and here are the values alpha, if his is, that is his personality, as they call it now, yeah? and this, the personality A necessarily leads to the values alpha, then this is as much 
actual values. That for this man, or replace it by the social groups, then would be true. No, but, but when they say facts, they can't be derived from values. They don't mean it in that sense. They mean it in the sense of that, that, that there's no rational derivation of values from facts. That's yeah, but uh, but how can the question for A ever arise, which values he should cho choose, if the values follow necessarily from his his is? Yeah, but then the whole, uh, I mean, what, uh, what, uh, It doesn't affect the fundamental issue that logically speaking, a value can't be derived from fact. Yeah, but is it, well, what does logic mean? Uh, that's a dark question. But here, the, is it not so that if there were a one to one relation between a given is and given values, the problem would lose all its practical importance? Well, And then you have, um, yeah, the, the fact that the distinction would lose its practical importance. Because by speaking of, of a variety of isms, we would in fact already speak of a variety of values. You, you, but you say uh, this is true of the actors, yeah, that is probably what you imply of the actors observed by the social scientist. But what about the social scientist himself, yeah? who observes them only, and who makes value proposals of his own? Is, is, this, is this what you mean? No, I was just saying that usually when you hear these, uh, well, there are many social scientists who are determinists and who make the fact value distinction nonetheless. And who are uh, saying that the value of values can't be derived from facts. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, well, let me put it this way. The crudest version of, the, uh, the, of this kind of people say values are simply the objects of desires. And therefore, since our desire can change all the time, uh, there is not known, uh, you know, the famous story of the typist uh, who has on the one hand the value uh, the, the value system which induces her to work in order to get recompensation. But on the other hand, there has all, she has also momentary whims, uh, which are theoretically, of course, as good as her more permanent desires. Yeah, sure. So if she suddenly spits into her employer's face and therefore is fired, uh, that is, uh, there's nothing uh, to be said against that. Because, sure, you know that. Yeah, but the more reflected people see that this cannot be as simple as that, because there is a fact that uh, a desire, if someone has a desire for something, yeah, uh, does not mean that he stands up for that something. And somehow we imply that having a value is a bit more than having a whim, and even more than having a, a constantly recurrent desire of which you disprove. So what then is that other thing? Uh, what enable, I mean, what is, what is then, uh, uh, what, uh, we must make a distinction then between desiring and choosing. Good, but this choice presupposes freedom, because this choice that you adopt value A, in preference to value B, cannot be guided by any rational consideration, because all values are equal. It can therefore be only guided by an un inexplicable, arbitrary decision. Yeah? And therefore, um, 
at this point, there are no values which can ever be rationally um, uh, justified, the prevalence of which can be, there are no natural values. All values are based as values on free positing on the part of individuals, maybe of groups. This was the point I wanted to make. And in other words, there is no, the key difference is that there is no longer any nature which um, imposes on men values and a certain hierarchy of values as the older view was. And this, I believe, is connected with Kant rather than Jung or any other people. And uh, by the way, historically, that is very simple, because uh, the men who, who um, brought in the fact value distinction, at least as far as social science was concerned, was, of course, Max Weber, who grew out of a neo-Kantian philosophy and environment. Did you want to say something? Oh, I mean, you the term Is this, uh, I mean, well, of course, I was using it now in this connection, I believe, in the modern sense, which is the Kantian sense, say, the whole system of spatial temporal events. It's just physical. Yeah, physical is the same as natural, yeah, physics is nature. But the main point is that there is a, a, a system of, of um, uh, physical spatial temporal events in which there is no you cannot, strictly speaking, uh, speak of a hierarchy. One event is as high and as low as, as, low as any other. It, can, uh, it, it may be more permanent, that doesn't make it higher in any sense. It always uh, took nature in the, now, in the sense now, uh, 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 which came out in modern times, the sense of natural science. Yeah, what we do speak of our arguments that certain psychologists, assuming that the nature of the human yeah, to that extent, they are borrowing from the older way of looking at things, I would say. Yes. Well, uh, such schools like style psychology, the very name indicates that, uh, they have tried to restore something already. They are therefore rebuked by the uh, orthodox man as holy, have you ever heard that word? Yeah, uh, because whole is, of course, something which stems from the older view, that the whole is more than the past. From the modern point of view, that should not be said. That cannot be strictly speaking whole. Yes? Are you suggesting that the determinist makes a distinction between facts and values? No, there is no, there is no, in itself, no connection. The older determinists, say, of the 17th and 18th, 19th century, uh, never made a fact-value distinction. But a, a part of the story is, but this is not too complicated one to, that the simple determinism, you know, of the modern scientific tradition, is uh, no longer so popular in the social sciences. This is now called necessitarianism, you must have heard of that, which is no longer regarded as necessary. Yeah, I think, for example, the importance of statistical regularities in contradistinction to strict laws. Yeah. Which, uh, because statistical regularities do not imply a necessitarianism. Yeah. Yes. Does Kant please give us a justification for his uh, assumption that nature should be the guide and not convention? Why does he accept nature? Oh, that is a good question and a perfectly necessary question. They all take it for granted, you can say. It's part of Greek, Greek, uh, Greek. Yeah, Greek. That is uh, what, the sim uh, uh, what the first answer would be. But the question is whether, the, whether there was not more than that. In other words, let's say it negatively. If the, something is said which is uh, incompatible with the nature of man, and then uh, I think common sense at least would say then a man should not even try to do it. And this difficulty was also disposed of in modern thought by quite a few people, but Kant is probably the most important in this respect. 
namely in the first place if human nature is unusually malleable, malleable then uh, there is practically nothing which you can exclude on the grounds of human nature except perhaps digestion but even that uh, can be arranged uh, um, in one way or the other but um, Kant makes it more radically by this formula thou canst for thou oughtst, i.e., if you know what the moral law commands without any squinting at human nature, you know it's possible. You do not have any, you do not have to study human nature at all in order to know what your duty is and in order to know what the best possible common law is because that is dictated by the ought. And uh, ought cannot, this is the other side of the is or distinction. Uh, it liberates the ought from any consideration of facts. Yeah. In other words, it makes possible to have, uh, uh, an idealism, to use one of these slogans, which was never possible in the past. Do we, do we, do we go into this question? Uh, no. But if we, in a way, we do it. You raise the question. That is exactly the point. By studying, I mean, regardless of what Plato teaches true or false, he surely goes very deep into these questions, and therefore he forces us to conf he confronts us, as it were, with our premises. Yeah. I mean, Plato states certain things which, to begin with, are wholly unacceptable to us. And then we, uh, it becomes clearer to us than it otherwise would have been that we make very specific assumptions. For example, the one which you brought up, as just as Plato made assumptions which are not evident to us, and we are confronted, we are compelled to think about our basic assumptions. But he doesn't give us any guidance on how we should think, what, what's the important issues on our assumptions. Full base of our assumptions and a wise base of our assumptions. That's very sure. Sure. Yeah, but we always need uh, uh, guides, teachers. Yeah? I mean, uh, it's not this dialogue. I mean, the, the, in other words, the belief which some uh, high school teachers in this country seem to have that a 14 old year child is right to, uh, uh, able to write an essay on uh, what should we do in South Vietnam, etc., is not a sound assumption. But you're sure that is, uh, yes. Uh, you made the point just before that uh, the psychologists who speak of a hierarchy are borrowing certain, from, yeah, certain, yeah. Are borrowing from the older view. And I was thinking about that. It seems to me this, there's a problem here in that um, the psychologists who speak of a hierarchy often culminate with the uh, notion of self realization, which is. Uh, with the peak of this hierarchy. <coughs> Self-realization is not the same as the older view because it really does presuppose a relativism, namely, namely that this self-realization is subjective with the individual. Yeah, this is a sign. In other words, they, in olden times they spoke less of the self than of the soul. And it was assumed that there is a certain structure of the soul. They are higher and lower faculties, and that the perfection of the soul uh, means in proportion to uh, the order of the parts. So that if, uh, therefore, if someone develops to the highest possible degree his uh, ability to do tightrope dancing, uh, that this is not valid. It may have its value for him, and it may also have its value for people who like to see such men who live so dangerously. Um, and nevertheless, it is only a kind of excrescence of a very special thing. And one doesn't uh, have a proper um, balance of what is important as unimportant. Yeah, but it does, is not, surely the word self-realization is very, very characteristic of modern thought, stemming fundamentally from German idealism rather than from uh, uh, British empiricism. That's a long question. Uh, yes, Miss Nigorski. Uh, 
And then Mr. Lankin. The word logic? I.e., it is, it is no longer psychological. That was a big fight in logic around 1900. Uh, what is the proper way of lying, laying the foundation for the sciences? Psychology or logic? Uh, this, was, yeah, this was a big fight around 1900, before and even after. And in, in this fight, the logicians won. And uh, the proof of the victory is that the successors of the so-called empiricists, million such people, uh, are now logical process, i.e. no longer psychological. And that is a very rough answer. The brief point is this. The objection of the logicians, of strict logicians, uh, to the psychologists was, was you commit the so-called genetic fallacy. You believe that by giving account of how the sense of causality arises, you have justified the sense of causality. It is well, what you in a way did. And this was, uh, um, and this was, I think uh, today, uh, uh, there is a very general awareness that you must not do that. Uh, I mean, in all uh, parts of the population, if I may say so. That is one of no, no, no. Legal positivism is only a special form of, the, uh, of positivism in general, and legal positivism underdates uh, logical positivism very much. Legal positivism simply means is a view that the only laws that are are the positive laws, and that is as old as the hills. Uh, this is your, uh, of course, uh, the Thrasima questions of the public and so on. Yeah. Good. And now, Mr. Rankin, that's the last question. Huh? I see. Now, um, <coughs> we began last time to read uh, the Caligula section and especially, um, as they, uh, and above all, this long, rhetorically powerful speech of um, uh, Caligula. Now, I remind you only of, uh, of one point, uh, which I mean, yeah, and that this uh, attack on Soros by Caliphate consists of two main parts. First, the issue of justice, which is treated at much greater length than the other, and then the issue of philosophy. For Caliphate, these are two entirely different uh, issues. For Soros, it is one and the same issue because justice is philosophy. But this is, of course, not yet clear. It will come out in the sequel. I think at this point, we should take up in front of 86D2, Socrates' um, speech. If not so, a path to be made of gold, down the do not think I should have been delighted to find one of those stones with which they have to go and the best one which, if I applied it, had it confirmed to me that my soul had been properly tested, would give me full assurance that I am in a satisfactory state and have no need of public testing. What is the point of that question, Socrates? I will tell you. I now. I will tell you now, yeah? I am just thinking what a lucky stroke I have had in striking up with you. How so? You see, you see from the two questions of Caracles that he does not understand what Socrates means. Socrates' statement is enigmatic. Now, what does he say? Caracles, as he has been shown by Caracles' speech, is the touchstone for finding out whether Socrates' soul is golden or not. Um, this statement is the reaction of Socrates to, uh, to Callicles' long speech, i.e. it is not a reaction to Callicles in general, to Callicles as Socrates knew him before. This speech gives Callicles this particular importance that he 
is the touchstone. The speech which was quite uh, tough, if you remember that he uh, made it clear that Sogaris deserves to be whipped, uh, Sogaris is not made indignant at all, but he regards it as a challenge. Uh, so it implies there is no question of Caligres possessing a golden soul. Um, uh, Caligres is only valuable for testing Sogares' gold, if any. Sogares believes that he has a golden soul, i.e. that his soul has been well tended, which, does, which must be understood literally. He does not claim that he has a soul which is golden by nature. Well tended. If Caligres comes to agree with this belief, and then Socrates will know that his soul is well tended. So it is, uh, in other words, for Socrates of the utmost importance, the first time in his life that he can find out whether his soul is golden or not. An examination surpassing in importance all examinations which any one of us has undergone at any university. Good. Now let us uh, go on. I am certain that whenever you agree with me in any view that my soul takes, this must be the very truth. For now he speaks no longer of the soul merely a soul, but of the opinions which the soul has, yeah? Good. For I can see that whoever would sufficiently test the soul as the rectitude of life or the rebirth should go to work with three things which are all in your possession, knowledge, goodwill, and frankness. Yeah, let us stop here. Uh, a very tender soul is a soul which grasps the truth, at least to the extent which, that it opines the truth, and has right opinions. Hitherto, Socrates only believed that he had right opinions. If Caligus should come to agree with him, or rather to agree with what Socrates believes to be true, the things on which they agree will in fact be true. Prior to that agreement, he does not. To have true thoughts and is equal to the soul lives well. Natural, natural consequence of the equation of knowledge in virtue. Why then is that agreement so important between Socrates and Caligus? You remember that both Polos and Socrates appealed to the consent of all. Polos for his assertion and Socrates for his. And yet <clears throat> they did that while they disagreed among themselves. Now, it's clear, none can have, strictly speaking, universal consent on his side, as is shown by the mere fact of their disagreement. Um, Socrates had made clear to Polos that Polos has practically all men on his side, but not all men, practically all men. While for Socrates, however, it would be perfectly sufficient if he could get the consent of Polos alone. Let all other men disagree, that is of no importance. In brief, no consensus omnium, no consent of all, but only the consent of one, or maybe a few. Namely, and once you state it in these terms, it is trivial, the consent of qualified people, of people who are competent to judge. The question is, what are the qualifications? And here he mentioned three. Knowledge, goodwill, or benevolence, and Frankness. The Greek word to frankness, parisia, means literally translated the habit of saying everything and having no inhibitions. Yeah. Now read on, uh, Mr. Reinken. I meet with many people who are unable to test me because they are not wise as you are, 
while others, though wise, are unwilling to tell me the truth, because they do not care for me as usual. And our two visitors here... They are strangers. Let us say strangers to make quite clear. Because it is obvious that strangers do not have the same frankness, ability to say whatever they think, as citizens. Yeah. Or does this need a proof, this assertion? They are in a, a surely a more difficult position. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. These strangers call us. Strangers here, gorgeous and boldness, though wise and friendly to me, are more lacking in frankness and inclined to bashfulness than they should be. Yes, yeah, stop here. So, uh, now, we know now the qualification of competent people. The men possessing these qualifications are exceedingly rare. Uh, Caligus is the only man whom Sugar has ever met of this kind. Obviously, otherwise he had met the this before. Uh, now, the question is, uh, we know now these three qualities. Must Sugates possess these three qualities too in order to pass the test? This question is of course not raised here, but I think it wouldn't do any harm to reflect upon it. There is a parallel to this passage in the Republic, 450D to E, where Sugates says, one can say the truth which one knows, Two reasonable friends. He adds the truth one knows because the truth which you do not know you obviously cannot say. Uh, so, um, two reasonable friends, so, or, fr or wise friends. The wise friends will say the truth, will have frankness when speaking to wise friends. Yeah? Now, Assuming that Sugaris and Caligus are wise friends, are the many bystanders whom we must never forget also wise friends? Now, to say the truth one knows in the, in the presence of people who are not wise, uh, who therefore would misunderstand or misconstrue almost everything, would prove lack of wisdom and lack of caring. We must keep this in mind if we want to understand the secret. Let us go on. Yes? You're sure? I believe so. I mean, I'm not able to, to see it everywhere, but apparently here the goodwill is especially important. I never said that when you find a sequel of this kind, you know at once why the central is important. You have to think about it. But I would indeed draw this inference, although I must warn you, there is something which doesn't come out in the translation. Uh, knowledge and goodwill are connected here particularly closely in, in the Greek. Um, I would translate it literally as well. Uh, knowledge as well as wisdom, uh, as well as uh, uh, goodwill and friends. But this is not to wiggle out from anything, but I believe still that the, the benevolence or goodwill question is important. But we must wait. Good. Now, oh yes, Mr. Flamina. Isn't it somewhat ambiguous whether um, really has the quality of frankness, uh, seeing as how he described as a lover of the demos, and one would question whether he would say things that would make his lover, uh, the Athenian demos, not like him, since he won't say things that... We have not yet reached the point where we can check uh, um, on whether Sugar's statement on Caligula's is true, because Sugar's will later on prove which he has not yet proved, that Caligus possesses all the three qualities, then we will examine that. For the time being, it's a mere assertion. But the superficial proof of Caligus' frankness is easy to imagine. He said shocking things. 
And it seems that the simplest proof of frankness is to say shocking things. Don't forget what is now going by the name of sincerity. That's the same thing. And some people who say atrocious things, or which they should be absolutely ashamed to say, are admired because of their alleged sincerity. Have you never heard of this thing? No, honestly. Do you not know that this is a very well-known phenomenon? That's the same. And it's only in modern, in a modern moralistic version that is called sincerity, what they call frank, uh, saying everything. Yeah, but that would render questionable whether the uh, thing of which um, Calcius is most enamored is really the Athenian demos. Yeah, well, there are also some doubts regarding his goodwill and also regarding his wisdom. But usually we postpone it until we come to show his proof. And let's go on where we left off, uh, Mr. Uh, Reinken. Nay, hey, it must be so, when they have carried modesty to such a point that you should... Yeah, it's a sense of shame. Yeah. sense of shame is more like that. Yeah. That each of them can bring himself out of sheer sense of shame to contradict More literally, that out of sense of shame, he dares. Uh, he dares. Go on. Has dared to contradict himself in the presence of a large company. Now, of that, many human beings, which reminds us of the fact that this is not a situation in which all bystanders can be presumed to be reasonable friends. Yeah? And in addition, about the greatest things. So, lack of daring, which uh, Gorgias and Polo said, leads to daring. It sounds paradoxical. They, they were ashamed. I, they lack daring. And their lack of daring led them to dare. Uh, is this, uh, what does it mean? Under all circumstances, one must take, one must take risks. I mean, this doesn't require a special act of courage, but one takes the risks whether one likes it or not. For example, to follow accepted opinions is safe. Safe. Because then you have the support of uh, the many who share these opinions. Yeah, but not always. It is safe in public assemblies, for example, in relatively quiet times, also than on. But not if the individual who takes the safe course is compelled to give an account of his views in a, among a small group where he cannot count on the support by public opinion. He does. You take a risk, whatever you do, whether you take the safe course or the seemingly unsafe course. Yeah, and of course, this reference to the many people indicates also this much that Socrates too, of course, speaks in front of many people. In a way, Socrates' rhetoric, as practiced in Socrates, is also a kind of public rhetoric. Good. Now, go on. But you have all these qualities which the rest of them lack. You have had a sound education. No, it's sufficient education. Yeah, it's sufficient education. Sufficient education, as many Athenians will agree. Yeah, you see, this is a proof of Calicles' wisdom or knowledge. He has acquired a sufficient education, he has said, say, it was as if someone would say today, uh, you, your wisdom is assured by the fact that you have a, a BA or an MA or a PhD. And I think everyone would admit that this is not a proof of a wisdom, not even a proof of professional competence. Uh, so, uh, uh, whether Calicles is wise or Noah is extremely doubtful. Now, from this it follows one thing for us, very obviously. Since Calicles lacks the basic qualification, and since an adequate discussion leading to the truth can only take place if the, the interlocutor of Socrates possesses wisdom, the truth will not come to light in the goddess. 
and he didn't come to light hitherto, as we have seen by an examination of the arguments used by Socrates and the Polos and Pallicles in, in, in the Gorgias section. But in advance, we know already. This cannot be a strictly philosophic discussion. Uh, yes. A, a Caligula's agreement with Socrates will not be sufficient to test the gold of Socrates' soul. And on the other hand, Socrates cannot say the truth to him because he lacks that reasonableness, which according to Socrates is the uh, prerequisite for, for laying bare the whole thing. You know, there were quite a few hands raised. Mr. Dry, if I remember that. Wisdom or knowledge? Both terms were used. Pardon? That is a very good point, but to which we must say there are degrees. And Glaucon, I will take this up, uh, I believe even today, Glaucon is much better prepared than Caligus. Yes. Yes. It isn't wisdom or knowledge of the highest sense, but a certain uh, reason. Yeah, but also a certain education. For example, Glaucon is quite well trained in mathematics, which one cannot say of Caligus. And yeah, surely, I mean, that is clear. If you use it strictly, then uh, so as would always say, <coughs> uh, there is knowledge there of the shoemaker or in any special field, including mathematics. But in the highest sense, there uh, is only a quest for knowledge philosophy. Sure. Now, the next point. Now, so that is proofs that he is better, Mr. Butterworth. Yeah, that is a, all right. Here in this article, you can put leave it at this. But generally, we cannot let us go on. I mentioned only one point, which I said at the beginning in my general introduction to the Platonic dialogue, that there is not a single dialogue in which Socrates speaks to an equal. I mean, even to an intellectual equal. Never. When there is a philosopher present, like uh, Timaeus and the Timaeus or the Eleatic Stranger and the Statesman and the Sophist, Sophist Statesman, there is no dialogue between Socrates and that philosopher. Yep. Never. There is one dialogue between Socrates and the philosopher of the First Order, and that is the Parmenides. And this exception proves the rule, because at that time, Parmenides is mature and Socrates is very young. So there is also the general no dialogues between equals. So that uh, uh, is a difference between a dialogue and a treatise. Yes. And now let us go on here where we left off. The proof of Caligula's um, uh, goodwill. And what will this pose to me? What, what proof I have? I can tell you. I know Galilee and four of you have formed a partnership in wisdom. You, Cassandra of Aphnidae, Andron, son of Aphrodion, and Alcicides of Pilarius. And I once overheard you debating how far the cultivation of wisdom should be carried. And I know you were deciding in favor of some such view as this, that one should not be carried away into the minuter points of philosophy, but to exhort at one another to beware of making yourselves overwise. But you unwittingly work for our ruin. Become corrupted. The word is important because corruption occurs in the accusation of Socrates, in the official charge. Yes. So, when I hear you giving me the same advice as you gave your own most intimate friend, I have proof enough that you really are well disposed to me. Yeah, or benevolent to me, to use not to change. Uh, the proof is this. Caligus had expressed the same view on philosophy, not on justice. It's only on philosophy. Uh, which he had stated now in public on an earlier occasion, when he, in strict privacy, when he was sitting in a corner with his three closest friends. I say sitting in a corner because that is what Caligus said that Sugaris is doing. Yeah. Sitting in corners and talk to three young men. 
but how uh, the question is minor, how could Socrates know of this strictly private conversation? Um, and perhaps he overheard it, but if it was so easily um, to overhear, perhaps it was not so quite private. But however this may be, would this fact prove goodwill to Socrates? Would this fact prove that, is, uh, that he knows Callicles uh, is seriously of the opinion that uh, one should not uh, study philosophy too much? Is, well, but this um, perhaps, you know, that's very, you mean, was he benevolent to them? Yeah, but this is he assumed, so there is no somehow that they were his most intimate friends. Yeah. It is not reasonable to suppose that Catholic did not seriously expect Socrates to take up the advice. So even if he detested Socrates, he can have the ironic pleasure of giving him that advice, which would be good for him, knowing that Socrates won't take it. Yeah, but let me, I would say that as follows, does this fact that his private advice agrees with his advice given now to Socrates, does it prove more that he sincerely dislikes lifelong occupation with philosophy and doesn't prove any particular goodwill towards Socrates? Yes, and, and another point which I should also mention here, the private conversation with his friends was on to what extent what should philosophize. The decision was made in favor of the political life on the ground of self-preservation. This is important for the sequel. I read to you one remark of the commentator Dodds. This report of a conversation comes in oddly. It has indeed the appearance of being dragged in. For as evidence of Callicles' goodwill, a reference to 485E3 would have sufficed. Now what does he say there? I'm reasonably friendly towards you. I think we can, without uh, being unfair and har uh, well being harsh, say that Mr. Dodds shows an amazing naivete. Because if someone says to another, even I am very much attached to you, and I have nothing in mind except your well-being, this does not prove simply that that man who says it is benevolent. It might as well prove that he is malevolent, because people say this very frequently. And if his endurance or self-control fails, does he, should he be spared in that case by Calvinus or box his ears to give another interesting example of Calvinus had given? No. Silent disregard. The useless fellow, a weakling who cannot control himself. In his own case, at any rate, Socrates does not suggest punishment as a help towards a good life. That is, uh, we must keep this in mind, lest we fall too simply for this, uh, um, how shall I say, for this eulogy of punishment given in the polar section. Now, to come back to the main point, the conditions of philosophic discussions are clearly not fulfilled in the Calicle section, and hence not in the Gorgias as a whole, because the Polars and Gorgias are already finished because of their proven lack of frankness. The discussion in the Gorgias is therefore rhetorical and even publicly rhetorical, as I have said before. In a philosophic discussion, the participants must have the same qualities, but gold and touchstone do not have the same qualities. This a uh, simile at the beginning makes already clear that there is no such uh, agreement in qualifications and both that. That which makes gold gold is not that which makes the touchstone touchstone. Yes. Uh, if, um, if Yes. 
Ja, in a way, ja, sure. Well, Plato would not have written the book if he didn't think that such a conversation with an unqualified man like Callicles would not be very instructive. Sure. But still, he would is not the best partner for finding out the truth about the subject. But I think, Mr. Franke, you wanted to say something? Or did I take care of you? Good. Now let's go on then. So we know this is, of course, of crucial importance for the understanding of the dialogue as well. Now how do we proceed at this point? So this begins now the testing. Yeah. Now, go right back and repeat to me what you and his are of natural right to consist in. Is it that the superior should forcibly despoil the inferior, the better rule the worse, and the nobler have more than the meaner? Have you some other account to give of justice, or do I remember a right? Why? That is what I said then, and I say it now also. Yeah, you see, Sugar recapitulates here Kallikas' assertion, making sure of his ground. Now, there are three um, terms used, the superior, the better, and let us say the nobler. If, are these three things identical? The first question comes, what kind of superiority? And second, uh, when he speaks of the inferior, he speaks first of them in the plural, a bit shows and command the translation, and in the last case, in the singular. He refers, in other words, to the quantitative aspect of the science. In other words, is this the overall situation? One and many? Or is it the situation of some versus some, which would be of importance? Perhaps it depends on the kind of superiority, whether there is a one many or some some relation. This much we can see from the very beginning. Now let us go on from here. Is it the same person that you call better and superior? For I must say I was no more able then to understand what your meaning might be. Is it the stronger folk that you call the superior, and are the weaker ones bound to hearken to the stronger ones? As for instance, I think you were also pointing out then that the great states attack the little ones in accordance with natural right, because they are superior and stronger, on the ground that the superior and the stronger and the better are all the same thing. Or is it possible to be better and yet inferior and weaker? and to be superior and yet more wicked? Or is the definition of the better and the superior the same? This is just what I think you declare in definite terms, whether the superior and the better and the stronger are the same or different. Well, I don't claim that they are all the same. Yeah, no, so I just want to make sure. The better means nothing but the stronger. Um, so Caligles had not spoken in his speech of big cities going against small cities. This clarification is brought in by Socrates. The famous case of the big city of Athens going against the small cities like Milos and ruling them tyrannically. Well, here is, I think, a, a, a sign that Caligles is not altogether frank, uh, but has a kind of political caution, because a man from Sicily, uh, gorgeous, is present. You know, there one must not be too open about the aims of Athenian politics. Go on. Now, are the many superior by nature to the one? I just want to be superior. Superior, say superior. Superior by nature to the one. I mean those who make the laws to keep a check on the one, as you were saying yourself just now. Of course. Then the ordinances of the many are those of the superior. Certainly. And so of the better. For the superior are far better by your account. Yes. And so their ordinances are by nature fair, since they are superior to nature. I agree. Then is it the opinion of the many that, as you also said a moment ago, justice means having an equal share, and it is far 
order to wrong and be wrong. Is that so or not? I mind you are not caught this time in a bashful fit. Is it or is it not the opinion of the many that to have one equal share and not more than another is to judge, and that it is found to wrong than to be wrong? Do not run to be an answer to this calamity. So that, if I find you agree with me, I may then have the assurance that comes to the agreement of the man so competent to decide. No, most people just think so. Yeah, the many, yeah, the many think so. Yeah. Always is true. Go on. Then it is not only by convention that doing wrong is stronger than suffering it and having one's equal share of the job, but by nature also. And therefore it looks as though your previous statement is untrue and your account against me incorrect. For you said that convention and nature are opposite, and that I pursued, recognizing that, an unscrupulous debate, turning to convention and the assertion Now the many, the argument is very simple. The many are by nature stronger than the one. The, the, their laws are the laws of the stronger, therefore, and hence of the better. And these laws are, according to nature, fine. But the many hold, i.e. established by law, that it is just to have the equal and not to have more. Hence, this to have the equal is the just according to nature. That's the argument. Now, what do we think about that argument? It is, in a way, an argument for democracy, obviously, based on the fact that the people are the majority the majority, i.e. the stronger. This argument plays a certain role in the emergence of modern democratic doctrine. The mere, as is indicated by the famous word, the ba bullets and ballots, you know, the, the force argument in democracy. Obviously, the many have more bullets uh, and therefore also more ballots. Yeah, what do we think of this argument? Now, I would state it as follows, from the natural right of the stronger, there follows, um, under a certain condition, the natural right of the majority, under certain conditions, not, not universally. For example, what are the, uh, some simple conditions? Well, everyone knows that. That's one of the rudiments of political science. State of armament. If, uh, for example, in the time when the strength of an army is in the cavalry, a small force compared with the mass of the foot soldiers, the knights rule. Aristotle states this already. And the same is, of course, true if highly uh, today, for example, under the conditions of armament, uh, where a small elite troop is stronger than the rest of the army. And however this may be, but uh, even uh, only um, apart from this, it sure it, uh, what does not follow under any circumstances is that the, of the, that the opinions of the many regarding right express what is by nature right. That may seem, simply means that they have the force to enforce it, but not more. Yes? It, it, it does follow. No, the maximum which would follow is that uh, the, the, the would for, would be that uh, democracy, generally speaking, is juster than any other form of government because there are many are stronger than you. But it would not follow that what the, what the many opine is true. Yeah, yeah, but still, uh, this only uh, makes it a little bit uh, more complicated because uh, what is um, uh, the, uh, the just is the same as a noble. He had also said it's not. That's why noble is good. That's simple. Mr. Franke? This is not really a version of Calicus' argument in that Calicus makes a distinction between individuals that are by nature stronger. Yeah, but
but he has not yet. Yeah, but it hitherto only spoken of strength. And the mere is strength, and that means, of course, primarily brachial strength. And why can you not add up brachial strength? And the brachial strength of two is greater than that of one, other things being equal. That refers to the about Yeah, but Calicles had not, I mean, that we, uh, Alice simply had not taken the trouble and identified it in a preposterous way the better with the stronger. And he gets his deserved spanking for that. Yeah, but that is not so. You see, the, the difficulty with him is this. I mean, you have seen when he spoke in this long speech of this wonderful lion like man, yeah, to whom he told me looked up. But in this context, it becomes perfectly clear that he did not regard himself as such a lion like man. So he is a he is a man of the demos. Yep. And from the demos we, who has some hankerings after the man on the horse. Uh, and that is uh, uh, somewhat uh, I suppose such people are not limited to Athens. You know, you find them all the, in other democracies. Good. At any rate, something must be very clear that Socrates' view of justice cannot possibly have this basis. I mean, the basis that most men say that it is just to have the equal. And therefore, it is true. This cannot have been the Socratic argument. The uh, more, uh, the um, question which we must also raise is this. Look, Calicles grants hither to every point, although it was already clear, I suppose, for every one of you, what Socrates was driving at. Why does he assent? Well, I think partly because he's really slow. Not necessarily slower than we are, because we have the benefit of rereading every page, every uh, phrase. Uh, and partly because Socrates fetters him by saying, you promise not to be ashamed, you know? And therefore, he answers as well as wants him to answer. But at any rate, of course, at the end he sees that he cannot possibly agree to that, and he expresses in the sequel his, uh, his disapproval of Socrates' conclusion. Now let us uh, see that. What an inveterate privilege than that. Yes, you see. <laughs> yeah. Tell me, Socrates, are you not ashamed to be word catching at your age? And if one makes a verbal slip to take back as a great stroke of luck, do you imagine that when I said being superior, I meant anything else than better? Have I not been telling you ever so long that I regard the better and the superior as the same thing? Or do you suppose I mean that if a pack of slaves and all sorts of fellows who are good for nothing, except perhaps in point of physical strength, gather together and say something that is illegal or yeah, so in other words, it's clear. Um, Calicles never meant that, but he didn't express it properly. Why did he say it's better, it's the same as stronger, if he didn't mean it? Um, yeah, uh, uh, that is all right. And, and now how do we, then we must make a further step in clarification. First, we must find out what, uh, what precisely um, Calicles means. Because it is very easy to say the better without defining it. Yes. Very well, most St. Peter's Catholics. Do you mean that, do you? Certainly I do. Why, oh, my wonderful friend, I have myself been guessing ever so long that you meant something of this sort by superior. And if I repeat my question, it is because I am so keen to know definitely what your meaning may be. For I presume you do not consider that two are better than one, or that your slaves are better than yourself just because they are stronger. Yes, yeah, sure. You see, Suarez pretends for a moment that Calicles had said something new, uh, but then he uh, tells him to his face that he knew all along that what Calicles had in mind. Um, uh, but he is trying to make clear to Calicles and also to Gorgias, the chief attendant, how thoughtless and how inarticulate Caracas is. 
It's, it's this passage here, there are, uh, this strange, where he says, you demonic man, yeah, at the beginning, in, in D1, you, um, uh, and later on in, in E, in, uh, uh, where is it, in, in D7, you uh, astonishing man. Um, an old Greek commentator says, through this word, Socrates simultaneously insults Calicles and teaches him decent, a decent character. So that is, is insulting, hybrids are in Greek. Um, and and this insult is a means of education, of bringing a man to his senses. You must contrast this with his conduct toward Gorgias. To, uh, to, toward Gorgias, he was unfailingly polite. He is not so uh, toward Pulos and toward Calibus. Yes. Uh, go, no, uh, go on, where we left off. Come now, tell me again at the beginning what it is you mean by the better, since you do not mean the strong. Only, Admiral, sir, do be more gentle with me over my first lessons, or I shall be attending your school. You are sarcastic, sir. Well, you, you dissemble, you are dissembler. So that's in the Greek the word ironic. Yeah, you are ironical. But since uh, uh, ironic has uh, acquired so many different meanings, it might be better to go back to the original meaning. You would dissemble, Socrates. No, but please, that's how it is. You may use them just now for any good deal of some dissemblance that may be. Let us stop here for a moment. You dissemble, you merely pretend that you want to learn from me, says uh, Socrates. Socrates' irony is indeed obvious, but he denies it here under oath, as you see. Uh, but the oath is very strange because the oath not by a god, but by a human being, Cedros, the hero of, uh, in the uh, uh, tragedy of Euripides, to which he has referred. It, for those who are interested in this kind of thing, I would say, if my counting is correct, I have come to only once. This is the central oath of Socrates in the whole dialogue. Socrates swears in the gorgeous very more frequently than on the average here in this dialogue. And this is, happens to be the You know, there is a certain levity of Socrates, especially in this um, section. He charges Calicles with irony. Calicles only pretends to feel towards Socrates like a brother. <coughs> that is uh, Calicles' irony. Why is the, ev the levity so obvious here in this particular section? Now, the first defeat of Calicles establishes the natural right of the demos, Calicles' is darling, and at the same time of the morality of the demos, which Calicles despises. That is particularly grotesque. Yeah. Do you see that? The morality of the demos is equality. Everyone should have the same. And this Calicles despises, but at the same time, uh, he uh, is an amad of the demon. And this um, being an amad of the demos has been given a reason. Namely, if the better are the stronger, and the demos assembled is stronger than any few, uh, the demos is the better. Uh, Calicles behaves most ridiculously uh, in his assertion. Therefore, the very obvious argument. Yes? Can you put the fire in the Yes, please. But come, tell us whom you meant by the better. I mean the more excellent. So you see, you are uttering mere words yourself and explaining nothing. Will you not tell us whether by the better and superior you mean the wiser or some other sort? The, the more sensible, yeah. and fr uh, the more prudent. Yeah. You see, Socrates has to remind Caligula that he means the, the more sensible. Caligula would have forgotten what occurred to him first were the stronger, not the more sensible. Yes, Caligus, of course, uh, says, of course I mean them, but he didn't think of them before. Yeah, good. Uh, 
Tigers had forgotten them. Well, to be sure, I mean, ghosts, and very much so. Then one wise man... Yeah, sensible man. Then yeah. one sensible man is often superior to 10,000 fools by your account, and he ought to rule, and they to be ruled, and the rulers should have more than they would be ruled. That is what you seem to me to intend by your statement. And I am not word catching here if the one is superior to the 10,000. Why that is my meaning. But this is what I regard as natural injustice. That being better and wiser, he should have both rule and advantage over the base of people. Yeah. You see, now it's, uh, there is an agreement reached between Sugaris and Caligles, at least as to what Caligles asserts. But there is some difference, because Sugaris says many times will a sensible man be superior to many uh, or ten thousands of non-sensible ones. And in other words, he, this is, in his view, a part of Caligles' opinion. The one sensible man is not always, but only in many cases, superior to 10,000 non-sensible ones. And why? One thing would seem to be clear. Prudence or sensibility is not a sufficient title to rule according to Caligus. And it will come out very soon that Sugares guessed again right, although Caligus does know it. Well, later on, he will simply say, to use a simple, convenient presentation, he must also be energetic. The sensibility alone won't do. But Caligus is as oblivious of this energy as he has been before of sensibility. You see, he is truly not very competent. I hope this uh, fact has by now been established. Go on. Stop there now. Once more. What is your meaning this time? Suppose that a number of us are assembled together, and now, in the same place, and we have in common a good supply of food and drink, and we are of all sorts, some strong, some weak, and one of us, a doctor, is more sensible than the rest in this matter, and, it may well be, is stronger than some, and weaker than others. Will not he be more sensible than we are? be better than superior in this affair? Certainly. Then is he to have a larger ration than the rest of us because he is better? Or more only that ruler to have the distribution of the whole stock with no advantage in spending and consuming him upon his own person if he is to avoid retribution, but merely having... Literally, uh, to be punished, yeah. if he's avoided his own being punished, yeah. Yes? but merely having more than some, less than others. Or, if he chance to be the weakest of all, ought he not to get the smallest share of all, though he be the best capitalist? Is it not so, good sir? Yeah, you see, let us see the situation. Many human beings of different qualities are together, are assembled, and they have in common food and drink which must be distributed. There is no question of mine and thine here. That's common. And therefore, there is no question of justice in the ordinary sense of the term. Yeah, I mean, in the ordinary view, everyone has his own food and drink, and he may consume as little and as much of it as he likes, as far as justice is concerned, as distinguished from temperance. Um, good. Now, it is, in a word, a kind of communistic society, ruled by the wise. The wise man in this particular case, of course, a physician. Now, does the physician, who is a wise man here, regarding food and drink, to deserve to get more food and drink? Of course not. But does he... Um, but does he deserve to rule regarding the distribution of food and drink? That's an entirely different proposition. So you see, Caligula's biggest mistake is that he doesn't make a distinction between ruling, a right to rule, and right to uh, property. 
These are two very different things. And the mistake is, of course, very natural because ordinarily uh, we think that rights go with property. Um, but here, so let's not leave it at that. Now let us uh, uh, follow that up. You refer to food, drink, and doctors, and I mean something different. Yeah. Yeah. Caligula's evades the issue. He doesn't understand at all what it means that the better ought to rule the worse. I.e. that the better ought to rule for the benefit of all. That is, of course, meant, which is a defensive position, at least not manifestly absurd position. And uh, in order there is one kind of inequality regarding the ruling, the wiser should rule. And an entirely different kind of inequality regarding who gets what when. Namely, uh, what he needs or whatever it may be. Good. And let us follow that up. Then tell me, do you call the wiser better? Yes or no? Yes, I do. But do you not think the better should have a larger share? Yes, the amount of food and drink. In other words, this is not something about which a man, an hombre, would care particularly. Yes? I mean, a pose, perhaps. And the famous weaver should have the largest coat. And go about the way in the greatest variety of the finest clothes. What have all to do with it? Well, choose then. Clearly, he who is wise in regard to these and that should have some advantage. Perhaps the shoemaker should walk about in the biggest shoes. No, yeah, yeah, sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. What have they to do with it? <laughs> Keep on dribbling. <laughs> If you do not mean things of that sort, perhaps you mean something like this. A farmer, for instance, who knows all about the land and is as highly accomplished in the matter, who should perhaps have an advantage in sharing the seed, and have the largest possible amount of it produced in his own land. And let us stop here and see. Now he gives, so he gives now other examples of wise men, wise in some specialty of what they deserve to possess more than the unwise. The competent weaver should walk around wearing the most uh, uh, garments and the most beautiful garments. The competent shoemaker should walk around wearing the biggest shoes and the largest number of shoes. In other words, in every walk, another pair of shoes. The competent farmer should get the maximum of seed corn and use the maximum of seed corn for every plot of man, or every piece of land. Now, there are five things here to be distributed. Food, drink, garments, shoes, and seeds. As the garments are in the middle done by weavers. Weavers, weaving is frequently the work of women. And here we see a simple thing. If competence is the title to rule, why should not women rule if they are more competent? Have you ever heard that argument? I mean, from Plato or Socrates? Republic. Here you have a, a brief sketch of the argument of the Republic. And very important here, but here it is as it were suppressed uh, for reasons which we must gradually uh, find out. Yes, and of course, there is this, the example of weaving, which is then the example is also interesting for the following reason. The best should not only rule, as we can easily see, but also uh, to be the most richly dressed and exhibit the dress to the public. Does this uh, ring a bell? I mean that the rulers should look differently by their dress than the non-rulers and, of course, exhibitors. Well, are there not some externals necessary for rulers so that they are recognized as rulers? Have you ever heard of honors? That is an allusion to that. The honors which the rulers must have. The honors, the badges of various sorts which are required. You will see that this is very important for the immediate secret. Now let us go on. Uh, uh, yeah, 
And in his response, by the way, the case of the farmer is, of course, somewhat different. He doesn't get, the others get them, these more for their consumption. The farmer gets more things for, we might say, his production. That's the same thing. So a certain notion of justice is suggested, giving to everyone the means of production, which he can best use for the common good, and the means of consumption, which are best for his well-being. This is the thought underlying the Republic. Yes. Now go on. How do you keep repeating the same thing, Dr. Yes. Not only that galaxy, but in the same subjects, too. In other words, sugar is as firm and calicles is thicker. Okay. As we know before. Yes. I believe on my soul he passed. No, not the, by the gods, again, this comprehensive oath which he has uh, uh, made before. Yeah. By the gods, you absolutely cannot ever stop talking of cobblers and pullers, cooks and doctors, as though our discussion is to be with them. He changes the example somewhat. He omits the weavers who might remind us of women and also the farmers. Um, because farmers are a special case. They are, after all, they can also be gentlemen farmers and they are not to be despised by kind. Yeah. Uh, good. Now go on. Then, will you tell me in what things the superior and wiser man has the right to the advantage of a larger share? Or will you neither put up with the suggestions of me, nor make one yourself? But I've been making mine for some time past. First of all, by the superior, I mean not to eat yourself. For those who are wise as regards public respect and the proper way of conducting them, are not only wise but men, with ability to carry out their purpose of the and it will not fall to the softness of self. So now it is, I think, now he has made clear what he wants. He means that those who are politically prudent should rule. Surely, there's no question that this is a dictate of reason. And he wisely adds, they must also be manly, which corresponds what we, to what we mean today by energetic or willpower. Uh, 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 this, is, uh, this is a sensible proposition, but how long did it take him? And we must see whether he is able to maintain it. That will come out very soon in the sequel. Uh, promises or, or, or uh, prudence or wisdom or knowledge is not sufficient, according to Caligula's, nor according to Socrates. Uh, there is a very um, important passage on this subject. In the second book of the Republic, 374D, where it's made clear that what any knower needs is not only the knowledge, say, of shoemaking, carpentry, whatever it may be, but also the concern, the dedication, as we could say, which is not the same as knowledge. Let us never forget that, and let us uh, always uh, keep this in mind. Virtue is knowledge, is an enigma. And what it means, we have to figure out <clears throat> that it is untenable as it stands, although there is some evidence in favor even of what it says, what it stands, it's not a matter. Hey, Mr. Barrow. Are you going to criticize the argument of Socrates against the Caliphate? Oh, in the segment, in, in one way, absolutely. But is this not perfectly fair? I mean, if Caligus is so foolish not to think of that, um, uh, what he really meant, uh, is this unfair of Socrates? And that Socrates also wants to know, you see, this is a man who made his big speech about the right of the stronger. He cannot put two and two together. He, and he makes such a speech. This is not a... a it is served spanking. No, but uh, after he said the strong, better as the strong. And uh, a moment's reflection shows that the strong. If the stronger are a bunch of slaves or other scum, 
He would, of course, never say they deserve to rule, although they are parochially strong. And then he, is so very, so very suggesting to mean the more engaging, more sensitive. Oh, yes, sure. But he didn't have the sense to think of it. And then uh, he now, he, but he does think, I admit now, uh, um, this I admit, he does think of the uh, manly, of which Sogaris had not mentioned, and uh, which is important. But on the other hand, instead of saying from the very beginning, I mean of the politically intelligent, and not of the technically intelligent, he went through the whole rigmarole. And then, in addition, he will be in great troubles regarding the other question, which he, to which we have not yet come. What, I mean, he knows, we know now what kind of knowledge he has in mind. And then the question, uh, and what kind of, people of what kind of knowledge should rule. And then they also should have more. This, yeah, wait, wait. It is his fault if he gives an impossible answer. No, there was someone else. Mr. Butler? Well, I think we have more. That's the point that I don't understand. Those who are, are more experienced one way or another, why should they? Yeah, but this is Caligliff's opinion, which will be accepted by many men. Many men. Uh, you mean, well, not by Marx and quite a few others. Yeah. How, do, how is the Marxian formula? from everyone according to his abilities, to everyone according to his needs. So these first-rate rulers, say uh, Khrushchev, according, if you make, take a, a relatively legitimate Marxist example, uh, Khrushchev should have, do not have more than the simplest worker, yeah? and especially if the simple worker has ten children and uh, sickness in the family, and, and uh, Khrushchev has only grown up children without sickness. But, you, but still, Khrushchev has his dacha, if that's the proper pronunciation of the Russian word, and not every Russian word has a dacha. Now, what would Khrushchev say in justification of his dacha? That he must concentrate on these big things he plans to do, and this he cannot do in an apartment house uh, in, a, in a slum area, which is a good, uh, good reason. That is a good reason for saying that the rulers should have uh, more than, yep, yeah, common sense again. What is the to put a situation where the man who rules becomes one who's excellent in a certain art, and then he should have more Yeah, yeah, but that was him. Why not have more money or more uh, women or more horses? Yeah, that is exactly, yeah, but the question is, what does he need? For example, that he should have a secretary. There is not every worker in a factory secretary. It's perfectly reasonable, yeah? Because uh, he must concentrate, as I say, and as he's take, if he has to do all this dictation, then he would, um, he couldn't talk to the ambassador of Upper Volta and other places. And that is very true. But whether he should have more women, for example, is, 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 uh, there is no necessary connection, unless you believe that any inference can be drawn from common Rochel, <laughs> which, uh, I, I mean, legitimate inference. <laughs> now, let us go on now, yeah? because we must come today up to a certain point. Go on. Do you perceive, my excellent galaxy, that your account against me is not the same Literally, that um, uh, you accuse me and I accuse you. They are both accuse one another. There is an atmosphere of the courtroom here. We will uh, see that later more and more. So there is, is now also accusing. Caligres is no longer merely the judge as he was a short while before. So when it accuses Caligles, and therefore indirectly, of course, also Caligles is darling, the demons. Now, this has again a parallel in the Republic. You have seen some indications here of the theme of the Republic. Who accuses so when it is in the Republic? Thrasymachus, the teacher of rhetoric. Yeah, but uh, he accuses him, and he claims to be the judge of Socrates, as it were. He sits in judgment of Socrates. Um, but what is the difference? 
in the word Thrasymachus, place the demos or the polis. Caligles does not simply play the demos. That's a bit more real than what Thrasymachus does. We must keep this in mind. But I believe you wanted to say something and I forgot. Uh, you said it I see it's really finished. Good. Um, now let us uh, go on where we left off. For you say, I am never repeating the same thing and reproach me with it. Whereas I charge you, on the contrary, with never saying the same thing on the same subject. But at one moment you define the better and superior as the stronger, and at another as the more sensible, and now you turn up again to something else, the manly, is what you now tell me is meant by the superior and better. No, my good friend, you had best say and get it over whom you do mean by the better and superior and in what spirit. Well, I have told you already. Men of wisdom and manliness in public affairs. These are the persons who ought to rule our city and justice seems this, that these should have more than other people and the, the rulers than the rulers. Yeah, let us stop here. We won't go beyond this point. Now, Calinus to repeat says now the just thing is that the politically wise, at the same time manly, energetic, should rule. And that they should have, uh, and have more than to rule. One little thing strikes us, I believe, immediately. He does no longer say it is by nature just. And can you imagine a reason why he could have dropped by nature? Well, this might be connected with the fact that he's now speaking of the city. And the question is, is the city natural? If the city is not natural, there would be a certain complication that this situation would be natural. Now, if we take uh, this commonsensically, and we must always, especially in the case of a man like uh, Caligles, assume that he means something commonsensical. So he says political power should be with the wise and wealthy. If you read this statement entirely by itself, and uh, you know, he says, the, the wise should rule, and they should have, the rulers should have more than the rule. Well, more property, of course. Uh, as I said, in the 19th century, uh, the, in the second half, the circles of culture and property. Yeah. I believe, and I, happen to, I know this phrase only from Germany, but I suppose similar phrases must have existed also in this country. You know, the people who have education, and wealth, and they are the should have the control. In our age, I read a statement by Peter Viereck in one of his books about the particular, the interesting cases of President Kennedy and Avril Harriman, uh, where uh, wealth, uh, the virtues of wealth are especially emphasized. Um, somewhat differently, um, and this, I believe, is, comes more closer to the issue which Sugar is in mind. The sensible and courageous should rule the cities and should have more of what? What is necessary to give to the rulers? Because the property might be a question, one could rightly say, as a property uh, only to the extent to which is necessary for the fulfillment of their function. But one thing the rulers must get. Yes. Honor, surely, the public four, very clearly stated, uh, must have honor, naturally. Now, this, if we would say they must have honor, then it would correspond exactly to what Plato says, or so it says in the Republic. Now, this, and now Mr. Butterworth, that I address especially to you. This Socratic Platonic view that the reward for rule should, uh, that which the rulers should have more than the rule, is honor, is not discussed in the Gorgias. The Gorgias, in the discussion, we can say, now, uh, 
is prevented by Socrates' next step. So as Archimedes afterward, should they rule themselves? And then Quadra uh, said, of course not. And then they would be uh, very uh, too inhibited, frustrated all the time. They should not have self-control. And then he comes to the issue of self-control and so on. Uh, but, and the issue of honor is never brought up. Now, what does this mean? Uh, what does this mean? Uh, first, why is it not brought up in the gorgeous? Why is it not uh, brought up in the gorgeous? This we would have to ask. Uh, well, Biko, as a fault of Caliglas. Why did he not bring it up? And naturally, this is only postponing the question. Why did Plato pick Caliglas as a character? Uh, this uh, uh, would, of course, remain. And uh, I will uh, suggest this point, of, uh, point uh, only now. The theme of this whole dialogue is rhetoric, vulgar rhetoric. In the Republic, where the issue of honor is in a way discussed, the theme is justice. Now, justice is, in the face of it, a much higher theme than rhetoric. Uh, just as he chooses uh, Glaucon and Adamatus in the discussion of rhetoric, he chooses a lower man in the discussion of the lower theme, rhetoric. Now, but as for the argument regarding honor, it can be stated very simply. A man, uh, there are certain type of men, and, and uh, generally uh, the more lively ones, and so on, in a sense also more fascinating ones. I mean, I'm not speaking now of those who want to have badges uh, for all kinds of occasions, they, that's very petty. But those who look for greater honors have generally speaking a somewhat wider horizon than, other, than others who are completely free from that desire. Um, and so if we look through that, we arrive at the view, arrive at the view that the man who is bent on outstanding honor, honor that more, being honored more than anyone else, will be the tyrant. He, because he will be honored by the whole city, of course. Xenophon's hero, chapter 7, contains a magnificent statement on this subject. In a way that is the inner starting point of the Republic. The argument can, can be said as follows. The tyrant is very desirable from the point of view of honor. But look at how petty it is from the point of view of honor. Because what would be the greatest honor, naturally, immortal glory, and not just that you are honored and people bow to you while you are alive. I mean, that is, uh, that is uh, very petty. Immortal glory. Immortal glory cannot be obtained by being a tyrant, because a tyrant is a man who exploits a city already in existence for his purposes. The truly uh, true glory belongs to the founder or founders who um, established a city lasting for many generations and, uh, and especially with of course a good and, uh, and, and noble city say the, say the glory of, of uh, George Washington and uh, some of his companions is not comparable to that of uh, um, a general or, um, or um, a decent, a decent uh, president and so on, as such. I mean, the case of Lincoln may be a very special case. Yeah, this is not a man. But in, in olden times, this was, of course, much more visible because of the religious honors which were uh, given to the founder as well. So the founder. And now, what is the case? Well, well, let's look at the founder. The founder is concerned with his glory, surely. But how will he achieve it? Only by absolute dedication to the common good of the city he founds. In the moment he thinks of his private interest other than that in his immortal glory, he will be bad. He will, he will abandon his 
concerned with him. So the concern of the moral glory is something very high. And is this is, is one can say the fundamental conversion which takes place in the action of Plato's Republic. It proves to be, I mentioned this, uh, it's necessary to remember that, there is still a higher conversion, the true conversion, where all sorts of one's own uh, ceases because of the manifest impropriety, and that is the quest for truth, philosophy. This is roughly what is going on in the Republic. Now, this whole way uh, leading to honor in the ordinary sense and then to the highest stages is closed off completely in the gorgeous. Uh, and uh, um, uh, the gorgeous, and this is due uh, surely to, uh, to uh, so there is immediate action, but this action is adapted to what he can reasonably expect from Caligus. Caligus is fundamentally, in the best case, not more than uh, an average Athenian politician, what he can call Pericles and Alcibiades, when you read their speeches in the series, they are, they are concerned with everlasting glory. No, they would not have forgotten it in the way in which Caligus forgets. Um, I would draw one conclusion, which uh, is uh, um, as much a question as an answer. Uh, what seems to be peculiar of the gorgeous is this disregard of honor, this abstraction from honor. Um, and therefore the emphasis shifts entirely to the bodily pleasures. And the emphasis shifts entirely from the pleasure deriving from honor to the pleasures deriving from bodily satisfactions. And, uh, well, this is characteristic for, uh, of the rest of the argument. Yes. Uh, since 2000, yeah, but compare this to assertion. By nature, it is right that the superior rule the inferior, yeah? which is, suffers from insufficient definition, because the uh, wiser are not stronger, you know, and uh, uh, the, the difficulty is that both elements, wisdom and strength, are important titles to rule. There are different titles, but none of them can be entirely disregarded. You remember our simple scheme of deed and speech at the beginning of this course? Well, yeah, I was thinking of the thing that we identify Cyrus. Don't we have to have wisdom? But Cyrus really was stronger than everyone else. He made himself. Oh, well, but he was uh, good. He was infinitely weaker than one platoon of his infantry. Yeah, but they never went against him. Ah, but this is not bodily force. These are other, what they call today, I believe, psychological. Namely, that they were very grateful to him that he had an excellent use not only of the stick, but also of the color. So it paid for them to obey. Yeah? This is a kind of uh, shrewd, he was very shrewd. You remember that? Well, with that expanded understanding of strength, yeah, but this. Yeah. No, hitherto it has not refuted, but it has been indirectly refuted, I believe, by Caligula's uh, most recent statement. Because what he says here, that. Um, that those who are wise regarding the affairs of the city, and at the same time uh, manly, uh, should rule the cities. I think every impartial man confronted with these pieces would admit that in itself. I mean, further consideration, but that is not good as for the wise and manly 
had to be owe their uh, position to popular election and they must give account of their administration. That's another matter. But in themselves, we won't, we surely don't elect people for their lack of intelligence and energy, do we? I mean, that is simple common sense, I would say. The, uh, now, in the, uh, the question is, what about Cyrus? I mean, it's, uh, I mean, as you understand him now, I see the man concerned only with his self aggrandizement Is that the point? Yeah, all right, uh, honor. But how does even Cyrus get the honor? By uh, pleasing his subjects. And this is the, the point which Calicles here is wholly oblivious of. I mean, one can also state it in a more, slightly more noble manner, and that uh, honor is a reward for service. You don't get the honor, you know, uh, the, the mutuality of the thing. I mean, if someone would merely, uh, is merely concerned for uh, power in this silly sense in which Polo stated so that he can kill, Whenever he pleases you, please you know, that's, that's silly. If a man has acquired power, uh, like Napoleon had, for example, then he might conceivably also gratify his personal dislike of some individual, you know, and have him cured, which is, of course, disgrace, wholly unworthy of him, but nothing can be done to him because you can't destroy the whole governmental system uh, because uh, he killed. He, murder, he committed an act of murder. That is very terrible, but true. Yes. You're yes, sure? That is, I think, what Xenophon means. Yeah, but you, but you have read the education of Cyrus, and how would Cyrus behave? Cyrus would, of course, never say these terrible things which Calicles said. It's a sign of lacking prudence. But would have said, of course, equality. Of course, equality and, and justice, absolutely. And that's what I'm giving you. And if I am the ruler, and even the absolute ruler, that is because the absolute ruler is a seeing law, a term used in this book, meaning uh, uh, not a blind law, like a law established in advance, which is not necessarily applicable to the new case. I judge each case on its merit, and uh, therefore I have absolute power. Now, that, and why do I have this enormous wealth? Because in order to uh, honor uh, the, more, the, the most public spirited man, it's very simple. You see, this uh, is it was, uh, the way would go, where would the difficulty arise? The difficulty which you have in mind comes up in this book too. Then in political life as a whole, you see, the very far side absolutely selfish tyrant and the very intelligent just man could not would have fundamentally the same policy that's the point uh, i mean there would be some cases which are of no great political importance but which are of considerable human importance where the difference would show but uh, politically speaking, far-sighted calculation and decency, when political decency are not different, that's the trouble. Now, you, uh, one conclusion which is drawn from this is that the whole political sphere is fairly low. This conclusion is clearly drawn in this book, where not only Alcibiades and Pericles but even the most respected, um, there are those politicians who were respected by the better people, like Skimon and so, are all said, no good. And the only true politician in Athens is Sobates. That's a consequence. Whether, is, I think one must consider this possibility. Yeah. One must, you know, one must go, go through this stage if one wants to have a fair 
judgment on Bernie's, i.e. for wants to have fair and reasonable expectations and not just rising expectations. Yeah. Which is a different, because the fact that they are rising doesn't prove that they are sound. I hope this will be kind. You know, am I? Uh, but uh, the question is, uh, as I said before, uh, um, uh, uh, what do we get through such an interlocutor? What we would not get through another? Because otherwise, Plato, he would be very blameworthy. Yep, very blameworthy. Uh, let me state it as follows. Uh, if the formula which I suggested tentatively, abstraction from honor, is correct? Uh, we have to see why, why that? What's the purpose? That's the same question. Um, then we have to see what is the result of that abstraction from honor. Because that result can be supposed to be the intention of Plato. Yeah? What to us comes to sight as a result, as an end, is as every end is for the author, for the maker, the first. What did Plato intend to reveal us through the choice of Calicles, which he could not equally conveniently have shown us by any other choice? That is a question which we must try to solve. And needless to say that I am under no commitment uh, to solve it, because I don't know the average. Um, but I think that one must state questions even such questions as one cannot answer. I hope that is regarded as legitimate by you. Yes. If there is a complete abstraction from uh, honor, then the caliphate, the highest man, would not be a political lion, uh, but rather a very rich poor man who would hire a very intelligent lawyer. Yeah, but apparently he uh, has a sufficient, uh, is sufficiently impressed by the splendor attending political power. Uh, yeah, but, you know, the, it, uh, Calicles does, is not clear about himself. That's quite obvious. And uh, that is why, I mean, uh, he's not, for example, a man like Azibaris at that age was. Yeah, truly not. But it has, um, as I say, there must be some merit in having a calligraphy in a dialogue to bring out something of fundamental importance which could not so well be brought out in, in another case. By another choice of another end. use this admittedly fallacious method of argument, reductio ad absurdum. Surely he can walk circles around Calicles without resorting to such methods. How does this advance the argument or the dialogue? Well, these are very uh, pertinent questions, but I do not know whether the facts are exactly as Mr. Butterwell stated them. I propose that we will, I will repeat 
we, we will study that again here you are sitting and you take it up at each point when we come to the passages this is preferable good now I would like first to um, break the gulf between the last meeting and today's meeting and uh, start from a general uh, reflection. In the first place, uh, I suppose uh, more than one among you has been somewhat uh, disturbed, not only by these difficulties of the nature of the kind which Mr. Butterworth mentioned, but something more simply, what one may call in modern language the unsystematic proceedings of Plato, and for which one, one would also find something of this kind in Aristotle, although not so pronounced. Now, I would like to read you as a remark by a very profound student of the ancients, who was, it, was also most competent in the question of philosophy, namely Hegel, what he says about the difference between the proceedings of the ancients and of the moderns. I read to you in a rather literal translation. The manner of study in ancient times is distinct from that of modern times, in that the former consisted in the veritable training and perfecting of the natural consciousness. Now, natural consciousness means about the same, what we mean today by common sense. Trying its powers at each part of its life severally, and philosophizing about everything it came across, the natural consciousness transformed itself into a universality of abstract understanding, which was active in every matter and in every respect. In modern times, however, the individual finds the abstract form ready-made." So I think one can recognize something in these somewhat baroque phrases of Hegel. The, the ancient way of, of uh, philosophizing was uh, to start wherever something uh, called um, for reflection, wherever, at any point. And indeed, it, 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 nothing was excluded, nothing was so low as not to be a possible starting point for thinking. Out of this training, of this unsystematic, but um, uh, uh, unceasing training of common sense, there emerged then a series of concepts, of philosophic concepts. These philosophic concepts were, in modern times, the individual finds these concepts ready-made. He does not have to acquire them from pre-philosophic thought. And moreover, these concepts, at the end of the ancient development, took the form of something which one may call a system. But the system is at the end of the classical uh, philosophizing. It is at the beginning of modern philosophizing. And since we, however ill-trained or non-trained in philosophy we may be, we are the heirs of modern philosophy. Uh, even by our training in grammar school. For, uh, therefore, we, it is very difficult for us to find our way in this primary philosophizing, which we may be inclined to regard as primitive, not yet fully developed. And that is a very great danger. Now, in this particular case, in the Gorgias, the subject is rhetoric. This is one of the N themes which might occasion thinking, reflection. 
that is one part of the totality of the themes. But one cannot study any part without some notion about its place within the whole. For example, here, if Socrates is not able to make a single step without opposing rhetoric to dialectics. If he did not know of this alternative dialectics, he could not elucidate rhetoric. These are the, rhetoric and dialectic, we may say, are the two kinds of persuading speeches as distinguished from other kinds of speeches, for example, a command. A command does not persuade by definition. But speeches, even if we take whole oral speeches, are still distinguished from something else. Deeds, which means uh, both uh, deeds of human beings and facts in general. Now, the broadest theme that becomes clear in the Caligula section is how should we live, how should man live? In other words, the whole here seen is a whole of human life as distinguished from any partial activity. That which one can also call happiness, the question of what makes human life complete and what makes man happy. But here the overriding consideration is, is happiness to be understood in terms of the good or of the pleasant? And this is the horizon in which the question is discussed. But the question arises, can one even leave it at the whole of human life? Is not man and all his possibilities a part of a whole comprising man? And what is that whole? This question is also raised, as we shall see later on in the Kalitha section. So uh, while the procedure is uh, starting from this particular phenomenon, the whole is necessarily visualized and made the theme. I thought I should uh, bring in this point uh, for once. Now, let me first um, uh, try to link up what we uh, studied last time with uh, what we shall discuss today. Now, we have read the passage in 491b6 to do 3 that Caligula, or rather Socrates for Caligles, says, no, Caligles himself says, as a matter of fact, uh, what he understands by justice, uh, what he understands uh, by the rule, um, uh, it is just that the politically prudent, as well as manly, should rule, and they should have more than the rule. This can be given a simple and reasonable political interpretation. The rulers who must have these excellences of understanding and uh, manliness must, of course, also be the wealthy, which is a very commonsensical view at that time. Uh, Aristotle in the politics refers from the, I think in the seventh book, to the fact that the ruler should also be those in possession of the landed wealth, at least, of the society. But here a question arises which is not explicitly discussed and which we nevertheless must make explicit, otherwise we will not be able to follow the argument. Caligas had spoken of the just justice. Now, what is justice? Can one take this for granted, for example, the fact of wealth and, of course, the unequal distribution of wealth? The, uh, the simplest is more simply stated. Uh, according to a common view, which happens to be the traditional view of justice, justice means to give 
or to leave to everyone what belongs to him. Choose soon to go equal to everyone what belongs to him. This is a just man. But here some difficulty arises. How is it determined what belongs to anyone? The answer, of course, by law, by positive law. But what if that positive law is unreasonable? What it, if it gives very great wealth to a good-for-nothing playboy who ruins himself and many other men uh, by his wealth instead of giving it to the worthy people? So there is a question here. We must still obey the positive law and be just in the sense of obedience to the positive law, but there is a certain difficulty here in obeying unreasonable laws. How can we uh, find a better solution, at least theoretically, to this question? I must uh, here remind those of you who have already heard that frequently from me, and the others will hear for the first time, the simplest statement of this question was made by Xenophon in the education of Cyrus. There were schools of justice in Persia, and the young Cyrus, a later king and uh, empire builder, uh, went to this school and he acted as a boy uh, was he was confronted with this question. There was a big boy who had a small coat, and a small boy who had a big coat. And the boy, the big boy with a small coat took away from the small boy his big coat and gave him his small coat, which seemed to be the sensible thing to do. Uh, Cyrus was, of course, stunned for this action because he, it was, as the teacher told him, you were not supposed to do what is fitting, to give each one what is fitting for him, but to give each one what belongs to him, either by inheritance or purchase or in any other legitimate way. But uh, uh, still, there is a question, is it not better, is it not uh, juster to give everyone what is good for him, what fits him? And, of course, also for the time for which it fits him. So when this small boy outgrows his small coat, then he must get another one. In a simple word, abolition of private property. But then you must have men, of course, who are in a position to assign to each what is good for him. Who assigns best food and, and drink for the bodies? Answer. The physician. But here we are concerned not merely with the body, but with the souls of men. Who will assign best to each what is good for his soul? Of course, the physicians of the soul. That doesn't mean the psycho, psycho uh, uh, how are they called? Psycho, psychiatrists, uh, but the philosophers. Therefore, the philosophers must do the distributing. The philosophers must rule or be kings, and uh, they, um, they must have absolute power, of course, otherwise they couldn't make the distribution. You see here, this, this extremely simple argument is the nerve, in a way, of the Republic, and follows uh, without any difficulty from this simple criticism of the ordinary definition of justice. Now, on t we have here, of course, one clear thing. And this is part of my answer to Mr. Butterfly. Clear inequality regarding power or ruling. Only those fit for rule by nature and training must rule. The others are, uh, cannot rule and can at best rule only in a subordinate fashion. Something entirely different is the inequality regarding the goods to be distributed whether they should get much food 
on drink or little food and drink, that depends entirely on what is proper for the individual to whom the distribution is made. This is a criticism, it's a very sensible criticism of Socrates, I think, of a Calicles assertion, who Calicles asserted unreasonably that the two inequalities must coincide, that those who have greater political judgment must get more. Now, this is, of course, a lot of crude, low plausibility, who gets what when. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, it is also rather unreasonable. Why should the man who is best to rule, and therefore ought to rule, why should he get more pancakes, more um, uh, bathrooms, and I don't know, and I don't know it doesn't make any sense. To that extent, I think Sobaris' criticism is absolutely reasonable. So, now of course the rulers must have rewards because they, um, uh, they do, in a way, much more than anybody else. But this reward would be honor. They are deferred to, in a way, in which no one else is deferred. So the, the, the reward is a reward for service. Ruling can never be what uh, Calicles implies, sheer exploitation of the ruled for one's own satisfaction. Ruling which is not service is against nature. And here we come across this paradoxy to which I alluded last time, that the selfish concern for honor cannot be satisfied adequately except by complete dedication to the common good. Because whenever the concern uh, is um, uh, qualified by selfish concern, uh, then uh, uh, it is no longer it is no longer loyal to the dedication to honor, and honor means, of course, not merely uh, badges and uh, it, uh, big splashes in newspapers, but it means immortal glory. Because what is, think of the case of Stalin. Uh, who had uh, enormous honors in his lifetime, and then uh, now where has he come after he died? De-Stalinization. True honor cannot be de, whatever it may be, Caesar and Alexander the Great uh, and such men and quite a few others, George Washington, they are still remembered. Now, what is characteristic of the gorgeous, as I said last time, is that this notion of honor uh, is uh, practically disregarded. And of course, uh, disregarded, and that means something, the whole picture of political life, the complete picture, is not given to us in the gorgeous. But we must also not forget there is something uh, this obsession from honor can be justified to some extent on reasonable grounds because there are there is a certain delusion in honor even in immortal especially if we take the extreme and clearest form of immortal glory how much does immortal glory depend on chance where would the immortal glory, say, of Pericles be without Thucydides. And Pericles could not. And how would, uh, and what guarantee was there that Thucydides' history will be preserved? Perhaps works as great as Thucydides have not come down to us. So, uh, in other words, this, there is no human, uh, the human being who is concerned with the highest form of glory cannot in any way, however dedicated he may be, uh, guarantee the eternity or immortality of his glory. And to say nothing of the fact that eternal glory is, of course, not strictly speaking possible, unless there would be an eternity of the human race, plus eternity of all traditions which spring up in different parts of the world, which is absurd to explain. But the, now, this Given this fact that 
eternal glory, immortal glory, is a delusion. One could then say the only enjoyment which men can have is the enjoyment they have during their lives. And from this point of view, one can give a kind of apology for Calicles, that the enjoyments, the sensible enjoyments, which, which are for the moment, are more solid than the hoped-for enjoyment of post-mortal glory. But I would like to mention another point, and still another point. The first is this fundamental question of our political life, indicated by the problem of justice. Uh, the rule of the politically wise and courageous, um, who, uh, must, who at the same time must have wealth, according to Caligus. But another question arises. What precisely is the end which the rulers must have in mind. The questions, the two questions are uh, in the, uh, the two, uh, and this is taken up much, uh, somewhat later in the dialogue, 503 or thereabouts. Now, the two discussions, first of who should rule, and second, what is the end of ruling, are interrupted by the proof that the good is different from the pleasant. Since the end is the good in contradistinction to the pleasant, the end is a good in contradistinction to the pleasant. And this is, of course, perfectly reasonable. We say first the wisest man should rule, and then we say, but with, with a view to what? What is the end? The end is the good as contradistinction to the pleasant, and only on the basis of that can we answer the question of how this end will look in a political context. Still, we must raise this question, which we have not yet considered. Why is the theme of the Republic, the absolute rule of the philosophers plus communism, and of course all the equality of the sexes, only alluded to in the Gorgias, and in no way developed? In order to answer this question, we must know uh, the Republic to some extent. We must at least be able to answer the question, how is the best regime of the Republic rendered possible? The answer is, the general answer is well known, the coincidence of philosophy and political power. This is truly a coincidence, i.e. a matter of chance. There is no essential necessity of their coming together. But when Sugares restates this proposition, he says uh, the, uh, this best order will come into being if when the philosophers have uh, become kings, they will expel everyone older than 10 from the city and start from scratch. The best regime presupposes that why does he make that? Why does he not start truly from scratch, i.e. take men who have never been fellow citizens and build a new city? The reason is, is this. He, in order to establish the perfect city, you must have as your material civilized beings, i.e. people who have been members of a city. You cannot start that with people who come from the state of nature straight away. Uh, so you, uh, th therefore, these children up to 10, brought up in a city, are to some extent, of course, civilized. Yet they are brought up, in each case, in a peculiar kind of civility, in a traditional civility, in a civility based on convention, on a specific convention. And this is an obstruction to the order according to nature which the regime, best regime of the Republic is set to present. Now, so we have to expel everyone older than 10, but how can we get that? 
how can the philosopher, uh, a man who has, at more, has two arms and perhaps uh, uh, one or two friends, so say, say six arms, how can he do that? Coercion cannot bring it about, but persuasion, rhetoric. Therefore, the problem of the Republic stands and falls by the immense power of rhetoric. Now, Plato has indicated this problem um, by t uh, two parallel incidents of the Republic. There are two parallel scenes, one at the right at the beginning and one at the beginning of the fifth book. In both cases, we have small cities, i.e. five, six men, who vote. And this vote uh, uh, is important for what they do there. And the difference between these two cities is that at the beginning of the Republic, the, uh, the, the rhetorician, Thrasymachus, is not yet present. At the second meeting, the second voting, at the beginning of the fifth book, Thrasymachus has become a member of the police. This is, in a way, the action of the Republic. In books six and seven, uh, the, uh, Socrates discusses the difficulty of getting the best city, the best regime. And one of the specific reasons, of course, is that the philosophers who alone can make possible the best city are distrusted by the demos, by the common people. But this, pers this distrust of the philosophers can be overcome by persuasion. Only for this reason is the best regime possible. So, in, uh, in other words, whereas ordinarily the men who are likely to be expelled are the philosophers, by their persuasion, they can, can be bring it about that the whole adult city is expelled and the philosophers rule uh, those who are 10 years and younger. Uh, in this very scene, when Socrates proves that the demos can be persuaded, we find this uh, remark that Socrates says on a proper occasion that I and uh, Thrasymachus have now become friends. The philosopher and the rhetorician have become friends because they have a common task to make possible the establishment of the best order by the rhetorician serving the philosopher in persuading the demos to obey the philosophers. The solution given in the Republic of the political problem presupposes then an immense power of rhetoric. And it is easy to see that such a power does not exist and therefore the solution given in the Republic cannot be a serious solution. Yes? think, I believe we are dealing with the same question. Yes. Because whether you think of this famous lie, but yes. lie sounds so terrible, it is called a beautiful falsehood. <laughs> uh, yeah, but let us assume that the truth which uh, the many can grasp would be incompatible with a good order of society. If they could not grasp that truth, which is in accordance with the requirements of good society, then only some substitute truth, you can also put it this way, some reflection of the truth, some dilution of the truth, that is already a beautiful falsehood. Well, this time, sorry to say, makes itself between the It makes it
Yeah, well, where, let me see, where is the fundamental point of disagreement, Mars? Do you say that saying the untruth is under all circumstances um, bad? No. Ah. I see, because that is the beginning of the argument. That's the beginning. Yeah, but if it is uh, so, then we must distinguish between a noble falsehood and an ignoble falsehood. Where the truth? You know, I bet, I believe it doesn't come out this way, but, but because the lack of comprehension for the beauty of that order will make all beautiful rhetoric in its favor ineffective. You know? I mean, these fellows who are the blacksmiths and the farmers and so on. Uh, they will not be, uh, uh, I mean, uh, they are not impressed by the philosophers. They are impressed, surely, by the guardians, as they are called. The bodyguard of philosophers, you can also put this way. You know, but this bodyguard will keep them in order. But who will guarantee the obedience of the bodyguard? That is a difference. Because since they are not philosophers, since they do not understand the inner necessity of it, they can be persuaded only uh, by uh, something intelligible to them. So the reward which they have is that they are looked up to by the, by the farmers and artisans. Yeah. But they get much less material rewards than these money makers, as somebody calls the farmers and artisans. Uh, now, they uh, may very well see it is more noble to live as armed monks as they do. But on the other hand, they will also be attracted by uh, the flesh pots, which they don't have and which their uh, subjects have. And what will they do, uh, are they likely to do in the long run? I believe no profound experiences are needed to make an informed guess. That they will say we want to have a less noble but more lucrative society. Because that happens all the time. This argument is very powerful. In other words, Plato knew, of course, that it is impossible. But Plato raised the question, as it were, under what conditions would be, a, a, could there be an order in which what is highest in man is also socially the highest. That would be the Republic. But the conclusion is that is impossible. What will be socially the highest will never be what is highest in man. That is, I think, the lesson which Plato gives us. And uh, you must admit this has some... Uh, this is not... Uh, uh, Yeah, but the question is, we must surely raise the question, what is the best society? There's no question. But must we do this in a fantastic manner or in a sensible manner? Now, if you want to do it, as you would agree, in a sensible manner, well, then we would, of course, have to know what are the upper limits beyond which you cannot expect anything. Therefore, you have to find out what, and Plato, by giving, Plato show, by showing to us what would in imagination be the highest, and, and then showing it is only an imaginary thing, shows us indirectly what in truth would be the highest. The truth would be in highest, the highest is that men affected by philosophy, but not philosophers, would be the ruling straight on. Now, this is not, um, uh, in other words, they must have rewards other than the guardians get. They must be the upper class in society in the position of private property. And if you want to know the details, you only have to read the laws. Because in the laws, this 
feasible best regime is presented. Now, this is surely not the shining temple on a noble elevation which Plato erects in the Republic, but perhaps that is a wrong expectation to believe that there can be a society, a society which is such a shining temple on a noble elevation, which doesn't mean that there are not great differences between decent and indecent societies, very great, and uh, we, which we must surely be aware of, but um, we must not demand too much from the police. I think that is a lesson of later. Now, if I may come back to the question at hand, what's the difference of the Republic and the Gorgias is? So, the Republic, the solution suggested by the Republic is impossible. And one can state the reason of the impossibility very simply as follows. The solution suggested in the Republic is impossible because it expects the impossible from rhetoric because it is based on the assumption of a kind of omnipotence of rhetoric. Now, the premise of the gorgeous is exactly the denial of that, namely the assertion of the impotence of rhetoric, or at least the weakness of rhetoric. And from here, I believe we can understand the transition uh, to which we come now, namely the transition to the question of the pleasures. Now, Callicles, this person is here crucial. He is much less hostile to philosophy than the demos proper. You know, he says everyone who can afford it should devote himself to philosophy while he is young. Uh, and he is an educated political man, in the ordinary sense of political man. Yet, he reveals here throughout, as you have seen, as you told me after class, his recalcitrance to philosophy, to logos. Now, what is the lesson which is this? What is true of Caligus is infinitely truer of the demos as such. So difficult and insoluble is the problem of a harmony between the polis and a philosophy. So, is this much I want to say uh, that we, uh, and now we turn to our text, which was, if I remember, is 491D4. Yes. A colleague has had uh, said what is just. Yeah? And that they should, uh, they, they, uh, these men qualified by uh, intelligence or wisdom and uh, courage should have more than the others, and should rule them. And Sogades uh, now raises a question. How so? Then themselves, my friends, what's this about rulers and rule? What do you mean? I mean that every man is his own ruler. Or is there no being that one's ruling oneself, but only of ruling others? What do you mean by one who rules himself? Now let us stop here for a moment. So that it gives now the conversation a new term, away from what it means to have more than the others, towards ruling, i.e. ruling over oneself self-control, not having more than is good for oneself. In other words, he gives a turn from the virtue of justice, hitherto discussed, to the virtue of moderation or temperance, from actions for which there is no natural punishment, no punishment unless detected in justice, to actions for which there is a natural punishment. Uh, as we have seen in the, when he spoke of the physician in 490C, if he eats too much, he will be punished for it, not by a law court. So, in other words, the goodness of moderation is much easier to prove than that of justice. Moderation, we may also say, is not political, and there is no inequality in this respect. 
In other words, they have reached a tacit agreement that the rulers ought to have uh, wisdom and courage. That both Socrates and Calendas admit. They disagree as to whether the rulers must be just. Can they perhaps reach some agreement by turning to the fourth cardinal virtue, temperance? The possibility of doing without justice on the basis of temperance alone is experimented with by Plato on more than one occasion, based on this very simple thing. A truly moderate man who demands very much, very little for himself, has no great incentive to injustice. To that extent, moderation can almost take the place of justice. Now, Caligulus, as we have seen, has difficulties in understanding Socrates' question, because that question could have a political meaning, namely that the rulers in one respect, for instance the generals, are ruled in another respect by the civilian government, or more simply, every, in a democracy, everyone is the ruler and ruled in turn. Uh, so uh, Caligulus does, no, does honestly not, not because of his political preoccupation, that Socrates is uh, moving in a very different direction. Now let us go on here. Nothing recognized, merely what most people mean. One who is temperate and self-mastery, ruler of the pleasures and desires that are in himself. You will have your pleasantry. You mean the simpleton by the temperament. Now let us stop here for a moment. Um, you see, Socrates refers again to something very common, nothing far-fetched, what the many know, namely that one should uh, have self-control, uh, control of one's desires and pleasures uh, is, uh, is good. Um, and the funny thing is that the elitist Calicles, uh, who is, at the same time takes over the popular notions, is in love of the demos, as it's called, uh, simply doesn't see what everyone seems to see. We'll see later on whether it is as simple as that. Yes? How so? Nobody can fail to see that I do not mean that. Yeah, in other words, uh, Colicus rejects self-control as sheer stupidity, as simple as that. Now, how does Sugaris uh, try to get over, to solve that? Yeah. Yes. Oh, no. Most certainly do, Socrates. For how can a man be happy if he is a slave to anybody at all? So, natural fairness and justice, I tell you now, quite frankly, is this. That he who would this rightly should let his desire to be as strong as possible, and not chasten them, and to be able to minister to them when they are at their height by reason of his manliness and intelligence and satisfy each appetite in turn with what it desires. But this, I suppose, is not possible for the many. When it comes that they deprive such persons out of shame to disguise their own impotence, and are so good as to tell us that my sentiment is disgrace, thus enslaved, as I remarked before, the better type of mankind, and being unable themselves to procure achievement to their pleasures, they praise temperance in other words, they themselves would like to have the same thing, only the gra grapes are too sour, and that's all there is to it. So there is universal agreement, or almost universal agreement, that the maximum satisfaction of the maximum desires is, is preferable uh, to anything else. Yes? For to those who started with the advantage of being either king's son, or able by their own part to procure some authority for monarchy or absolute power, what in truth could be popular or worse than temperance and justice in such cases? You see, one moment, well, uh, he, he should, uh, he didn't lose it by their parts, by nature. He's, you see, the, our great admirer of nature becomes completely indifferent to the difference between nature and convention when it suits him. 
the sons of kings, he doesn't say that they are by nature superior. They are, of course, superior only by law. But if people who can afford it, whether by nature or by law, should, would do that. So little is he loyal to his principle, fundamental distinction between uh, nature and law. And he mentions the king's sons. Why does he not mention the kings? Well, perhaps because they are too old. And then the other thing is because they are busy, of course. You know, you know this, this kind of playboy notion of political life uh, is, uh, um, is surely incompatible with a very successful uh, political activity which requires much more of attention to business and even to boring business than uh, Caligula uh, seems to be aware of. Now, let's go on. Finding themselves free to enjoy good things with no obstacle in the way, they would be merely imposing on themselves a master in the shape of the law, the talk and the rebuke of the multitude. Or how could they fail to be something wretched by that spirit of the self-discipline if they had no larger portion to give to their own friends or to their enemies? That's again one of these conventional points. These are not men who are friends by nature or enemies by nature, but friends, uh, but by, uh, by chance. Uh, he, he, either because they are, um, or by convention, because they are relatives, or by chance because he did them a good turn on a former occasion, or a bad turn, and accordingly. Yes. And that too, but they were rulers of their own city. No, we put to Socrates. Would you claim to be speaking? The fact is this luxury and licentiousness and liberty, if they have the support of force, are virtue and happiness. And the rest of these embellishments, the unnatural covenants of mankind, are all mere stuff and nonsense. Yeah, um, now, precisely because Caligles is guided not by the things by nature fair, but by convention fair, it, it, it is so striking that he does not even allude to rhetoric as a requirement. I mentioned this only in passing. But here is a definite progress beyond his uh, long speech. He reveals now clearly the end with a view to which doing injustice is preferable to suffering injustice. To have the maximum gratification of the senses. You see here he identifies virtue and happiness. Virtue or happiness, however you call it, consists in luxury, uh, uh, lack of, lack of self-restraint and freedom, plus help. Help, what Aristotle calls the equipment. Uh, but contrary to Aristotle, that virtues, i.e. Um, intelligence and manliness, belong to the equipment and are not the end. Uh, that is important for what follows. The enjoyment is the end, and the virtues are um, only a means to them. Good. Oh, uh, Mr. Lyons, one moment. Yeah. Perhaps they are not so strong. Perhaps, they, I mean, Caligula's is, of course, not so strong, you know, and uh, he's not an Alcibiades. Alcibiades would not, uh, surely Alcibiades enjoyed, uh, to led a very dissolute life, as we, do, we know, but uh, he had thought of something else. And when you read his speech in Thucydides, uh, his speeches, uh, you see that the concern of glory after death is for him very important. No allusion to it in the, in the case of Caligula. Alibadis was a much greater man. And that Socrates is here in this dialogue presented as being in love with Alcibiades is very meaningful, as you can see. Alcibiades was a, a, a man of another stamp, other timber, than, um, than Caligula. 
Now, Mr. Glenn. What is this justice that Calvin is talking about, 492B? 492B? Yeah, but he speaks of justice all the time. Yeah. Well, he, in the first part of that speech, he has talked about natural fairness and justice as being indulgence of these appetites. Yeah. And this is kind of good. But then when he gets down here, 492, I think it's a B, isn't it? Yeah, he speaks of justice all the time here, yeah, together with Mesh. Then he speaks of the sons of kings as being foolish to be bound by this justice, which he has earlier said is a good thing. Which justice? That, that's my question. Of course, popular justice. Popular vulgar justice. But not the, in, in, in no, is that I mean is that was in his uh, his very uh, powerful speech which he gave there? Their justice is the rule of the stronger, and only that. And of course, as becomes it now clear, a rule of the stronger with a view to their self-enjoyment, and nothing else. This is what he calls natural fairness. Yeah, yeah sure, yeah. It is, uh, justice, as spoken here, means obedience to the law. In this sense, equality. Everyone uh, gets the same as everybody else as a law of the stripes. But then when he says that it's undesirable for these, uh, these sons of kings to be bound by this justice in such cases, there, it, it's a 492B between B and C. Yeah. I don't understand that. Yeah, of course, and, and because it, they can afford transgressing it. This kind, these, these man-made bounds, they can afford it. And it is disgraceful for them. It is by nature noble, by nature just, but contrary to human justice. Even there is appeal to uh, natural justice. Um, I, I think for... Natural justice, he defines. Yes, one can say that, but he speaks more from of uh, the noble or fair than of the just here. Yeah, good. Now, what does Socrates uh, first beginning? Far from exalting at any rate, Calaisi, is the frankness with which you develop your thesis. For you are now stating in clear terms that the rest of the world thinks it be but are lost to that. Yeah, but did Socrates not say before in uh, 491? Uh, D, that he means the same what the many say, that one should exercise self-control. How is this no contradiction? Mr. Dry? Exactly. The many hold the same view which Caritas is uttered, but they say the opposite. They say what the words is the same thing which we had seen before. Yes? So I beg you not to give up on any account that it may be made really evident how one ought to live. Yes, that is a question, a simple question of uh, what later on became moral philosophy, how one should live. In Greek you can say this in two words, in Latin two, I suppose. Yes. Now tell me. Do you say the desires are not to be chastened if a man would be such as he ought to be, but he should let them be as great as possible and provide them with satisfaction from some sort or other, and this is virtue? Yes, I say that. And it is not correct to say, as people do, that those who want nothing are happening. Now wait here a moment. Now, so that is in restating Caligula's view, speaks only of virtue and not of happiness. But in stating the opposite view, in E3 to 4, he speaks of happiness and not of virtue. Why? To need nothing is to be happy. Who needs nothing? Who is literally self-sufficient? Memorabilia 1, chapter 6, section 10, in case of any doubt. So, uh, not to be in need of anything is divine, but whether the gods have virtues proper is an open question. Yes? No, 
for that rate, stones and corpses would be extremely happy. You see, Caligus does not even dream of the gods. Yeah. That's impossible. Yes. Well, but on your own view, life is strange. For I tell you, I should not wonder if your entity's words were true when he says, Who knows if to live is to be dead, and to be dead to live. And we really, it may be, are dead. In fact, I once heard one of the statements say that we are now dead, and the body is our tomb. And the part of the soul in which we have desired is liable to be over-persuaded and to vacillate to and fro. And so it comes to our cell, the Sicilian, I dare say, of the Italian, made the fable, in which, by the play of words, he named this part as being so impressionable and persuasive a job. And the thoughtless he called uninitiated. Indeed, uninitiated, that part of the soul. In these uninitiated, that part of the soul, where the desires are, the licentious and fissured part, he named the leaky jar in his allegory, because it is so insatiable. So you see this person, Calvin, it takes the opposite view to yours, showing how all who are in Hades, meaning of course the invisible, these uninitiated will be both wretched, and will carry water into their leaky jar with a sieve which is no less leaky. And then, but it's this, is my storyteller. He means the soul. Yeah, not the storyteller. The man who spoke to me is exactly not the storyteller. Yeah. Yes. He means the soul. And the soul of the thoughtless, he likened to a sin, as being perforated, since it is unable to hold anything by reason of its unbelief and forgetfulness. All this, indeed, is bordering pretty well on the absurd. But still, it sets forth what I wish to impress upon you if I somehow can, in order to induce you to make a change. And instead of a life of insatiate licentiousness, to choose an ordinary one that is set up and contented with what it happens to have got. Now, am I at all prevailing upon you to change over to the view that the ordinary people are happier than the licentious, or will no amount of similar fables that I might tell you have any effect of changing your mind? <coughs> the latter is more like the truth, Socrates. Yeah, now the, uh, the question is, do I persuade you? Uh, do I persuade you? Now, the, let us, the story says at the beginning here, the way of life praised by Caligles would be terrible if Euripides, Caligles' own authority, or some wise man, or some fable telling hombre, we are right. Socrates once had a conversation with a wise man, not with a fable telling man. This fable telling man was perhaps a Sicilian, like Gorgias, or an Italian. Now, the fable telling man makes similes, as you see, i.e., he is a rhetorician. Socrates follows him in this and tells himself fables or images. He tries to persuade Caligles, as he explicitly says, but without any success. Now, he, he refers to three authorities, the poet, the wise man, and um, the, uh, the, the fable teller. Uh, uh, the wise man is, of course, in the center. This, of course, I refuse to explain. But uh, poetry and mythology, while being inferior to wisdom, are not rejected by any means. So this gives here a specimen of the right kind of rhetoric. I mean, that kind of rhetoric is right which leads a man to the good life. In the polar section, we recall, there was no such myth or story, but only what one can call dialectical rhetoric. You know, uh, no images, but an apparent refutation. And it is also noticeable that the myth was transmitted to Socrates by the wise man 
and uh, not by the misteller himself. Now, what is the lesson conveyed by the three authorities? What we call life is in fact death. This is what the wise man said, whereas Euripides said only that this is perhaps so. And, the, uh, and what the mythologists say is surely not literally true, as is he admitted. Now, if this is so, what follows if life is in fact death, as the wise man said? Crucial, I think, for the question of rhetoric in the humble sense of the term. I mean, in the, which we have discussed before, forensic rhetoric. What follows for forensic rhetoric if life is death? Why? The link. Yeah, surely, in other words, the desire for self preservation loses its meaningfulness. Sure, that is so. Um, yes, even if, it, of course, even if it is the defense of a just man unjustly accused, does not make sense. Another point which we consider here, that part of the soul in which the desires are is in motion, fickle, movable, persuadable. The addressee of rhetoric in us is the desiring thought, not reason. Belief in things transmitted by the right kind of rhetoric is a kind of virtue. In C3, unbelief, namely not accepting such stories, is um, uh, presented as a vice. But I repeat, Sugar spoke only to the wise man, not to the misteller. There is one point which is not uh, um, but deserves a moment's consideration. What's the wise, one thing of which the wise man said, and that is a very famous saying, Soma Sema, the body is a tomb. Yeah, but if the word Sema, which is ordinarily translated by tomb, means primarily a sign, a mark, a token, a token by which a man's identity is certified. The device on a shield by which a warrior is known. Now, if we stick to this primary meaning and uh, disregard the meaning tomb, we reach this conclusion. Soma is a mark by which an indi the individual is certified. In later language, the body is a principle of individuation. The individual can be happy only when he has a body because it can be an individual only within a body, which means either happiness is possible only in this life, or else there is no immortality of the soul proper, but metapsychosis, transmigration of souls from bodies to bodies, which is the official platonic teaching anyway. Happiness can, could there not be having no wants whatever, uh, because if there is a body, there are wants but uh, requires indeed only much smaller ones than a man like Caligus would admit. Uh, also, you see, when he speaks about, uh, he made the, a distinction about the jar, this, this, it's a, the soul is a jar anyway, not only in the case of the unreasonable man. Um, the, 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 um, the soul is a jar uh, also in the case of reasonable men. Why? Or rather, I'm sorry, the soul is a thief in any case. You see, I think, why is the soul a thief in any case? What does a thief discern, distinguish, perceive? in this sense. I mean, there are some other subtleties in which are quite interesting. We, we don't, do not have to go in that. Um, uh, so this has, uh, this is a, a story uh, 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 containing more than the immediate message uh, to Caligus. 
And these more subtle things are all said by this wise man as distinguished from the mythologist. Now let us go on. Come now, let me tell you another parable for the same truth as I have just told. Yeah, no, of the image of some same gymnasium, he says. Let us take this a bit more literally. You know the gymnasium uh, meant in Greek, what it means in a way in, in this country, as distinguished from the German meaning. In German meaning, the, the classical high schools were called gymnasium. But what is in common to the Greek, American, and German uh, gymnasium? You strip. And now, in a, in a gymnasium, uh, you strip, of course. But in a school, you also strip. I mean, it takes the simplest exam and examinations where you have to lay bare your uh, pudenda. Good. Uh, this, however, let us link this up with, uh, with what we have read before. In the polo section, do you remember the proportion? How, what was the proportion? Gymnastics to uh, justice. No, two to medicine. Equal to um, legislative art to, what was it? Uh, penal justice, yeah? Penal justice. And we had what was, this were the arts, and now the shams, which were the cosmetics, is that cosmetics? And of medicine, what is that? Cookery, yeah, that is slightly the currency. And here we had sophistry to rhetoric, yeah? That was this. Now we are here, we get another meaning of gymnasium. I mean, the, 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 of course, the gymnasium for the soul was originally called the legislative art. <laughs> yeah, I will try to be quiet. Um, but, um, now, what does it mean? The legislative art, what was originally suggested to be the legislative art, is in truth the right kind of rhetoric. The right kind of rhetoric builds up the, uh, the soul and the proper manner. Mythology, in the sense here, the coining of images, of, of edifying images, takes here the place of the legislative art, which makes somewhat more sense. Now let us go on here and see what that simile is. Consider, if each of the two lives, the temperament and the life's ascension, might be described by imagining that each of two men had a number of jobs, and those of one man were sound as full, one as wine, another as honey, third as milk, and various others as various things, and that the sources of each of these supplies were scanty and difficult and only available through much hard time, hard toil. Well, one man, when he has taken his fill, neither draws off any more nor troubles himself a job, but remains at ease at that score, while the other finds, like itself, that the sources are possible and be so difficult, but his vessels are leaky and unsound, and he is compelled to fill them constantly, all night and day or else suffer extreme distress. If such is the nature of each of the two lives, who says that the licentious man has a happier one with the orderly? Do I, this story of mine, induce you to hold to persuade you again? Persuade you. I hope to perceive that the orderly life is better than the licentious, or do I fail? Or do I not persuade you? It is uh, emphasized for purpose. This is Socrates' attempt at persuasion in this emphatic sense of the term. Now, um, the, here the immoderate man has leafy jars, and the sober man has entire or filled jars. Um, 
This simile speaks no longer of water, but of more attractive things, wine, honey, and milk. Both are he-men, hombres. Both have to be concerned with replenishment. But the moderate man has not to be concerned with his jars, because the jars are in order. And here's also no reference to Hades and death. In other words, the superiority of moderation to its opposite is here established without reference to Hades and without reference to an extreme asceticism, as it was implied in the first speech. Um, so the two similes convey a somewhat different message. Now we are through with Socrates' attempts to persuade Callicles. Now he will gradually begin to refute him. Mr. Riken? Uh, you do not persuade Dr. Lee. For that man who has taken his fill can have no pleasure anymore. In fact, it is what I just now call living like a stone, when one has filled up and no longer feels any joy or pain. No, yeah, but Calicus says this very replenishment, which you, Sugares, regard as so bothersome, is pleasure, is pleasant. To live in a state of perfection, to have no desire, and to, in particular to have no arrows, because arrows is a form of desire, let us never forget that, is like being like a stone. Yes. Uh, in, in other words, inanimate, lifeless. Yes. Um, yeah, this is never, that's a very good point. This question is never discussed. Uh, for reasons which we must try to disentangle, the only question which is thematically discussed in the sequel are the pleasures of the body, especially food and drink. Sure. And the whole thing would have to be reopened uh, when you consider the desire for truth. Um, the, this commentator, who I believe reflects the general opinion of commentators, uh, it, it thinks that these considerations about the uh, philosophy, about pure pleasures, as uh, Plato calls it, uh, are wholly unknown to Plato in this stage as if Plato could be imagined at one moment uh, after he had met Socrates to have been unaware of the fact that philosophy is a desire for knowledge and therefore also a desire which may find its satisfaction in this kind of pleasure. But uh, these things cannot be helped. He has to face them and to brave them, uh, face them uh, bravely and uh, uh, with uh, humanity. Good. Now, Socrates, in the immediate sequel, opposes Callicles' image, such a life is like the life of a stone, with an image of his own. This is a very strange bird whom Socrates brings. I found helpful for my own purposes, perhaps it also for you, the simile of a duck. Those of you who have ever lived with ducks will see immediately the pertinence of this uh, example, you know? They are very dirty and uh, have a, a very um, quick digestive process. Yes. Yes. Uh, now, someone must... Yes. Yeah. 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 How much we have to poorly conscious application of something that's going to fail with this calibration, specifically the distinction between holding and failing, the previous distinction, you know, but Polos, in the case of Polos was very simple because Polos adapted simultaneously what people feel and what they say. And therefore, he contradicted himself. 
And that was simple. Caligus tries to avoid it. He will say only uh, what people feel and forget about what they say because this is merely nomos. And uh, but Caligus is wholly unable to maintain that, you know. And, uh, and precisely because he raises a much higher claim than Polos does, and I will not go into that trap into which Polos and Gorgias went. His defeat is all the more uh, terrible for him. Now, first, uh, let us uh, read this again. For the pleasant life. Consists often of the largest possible amount of inflow. And the inflow be large, must not that which runs away be of large amount also? And must not the host of such outflow be of great size? <laughs> then it is a floater's life you are describing this time, not that of a corpse or the stone. Now tell me, in the light you mean something? In a way, of course, that is a defeat for sugar. <laughs> because an animate being is higher than a living animate one. You see, so Socrates also can make a slip. I'm sure he did not escape Plato. Yeah, good. No, no. Is the life you mean something like feeling hunger and eating but hungry? Yes, it is. And feeling thirst and drinking so thirsty? Yes, having all the other desires and being able to satisfy them. And so with these enjoyments leading a happy life. Oh, no, my fine fellow. Go on as you can be done, and mind you show no bashfulness about it. I too have things to strive not to be too bashful. But first, tell me, was it a man who has an itch and wants to scratch and may scratch in all freedom and pass his life happily? See, the funny thing is that Caligus regards him as a vulgar orator, where Socrates is not a vulgar orator. But when he uses rhetorical means, as he does in this speech we are reading now, he is not aware of it. You know, when he, when he nails him down, uh, 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 Caligus, so that he cannot draw back, that he doesn't see the rhetoric in that. Yes? Oh, the method is the man also who scratches himself who must spend a pleasant life. Is a pleasant one a happy one also? Certainly. Is it so he only wants to scratch his head? Well, what more am I to ask you? <laughs> See, Dalton, what your answer will be if you will ask everything in succession <laughs> to that statement. As a culmination of the case, as stated, the life of Catholic, is that not awful, shameful, and wretched? Or will you dare to assert that these are happy if they can freely indulge their wants? Are you not ashamed, Socrates, to lead the discussion into such topics? <laughs> or, is it I who am leading up there, noble sir? Or the person who says outright that those who enjoy themselves with whatever kind of enjoyment are happy? and draws no distinction between the good and bad sorts of pleasure. Now let us stop here for a moment. Now Caligus proves again that he is under the spell of convention. There are things of uh, which he would be ashamed to do and of which he would be ashamed, ashamed even to speak. In other words, he is like a Victorian lady, this admirer of Physis, yeah? he uh, implies that to mention things which are by nature uh, shameful is by nature shameful. And it is speaking about it is by nature shameful, which cannot be right, because you cannot say, make clear that these things are by nature shameful without mentioning them. I, whether directly or by circumlocution doesn't make any difference. You see, he is amazingly Victorian, much more Victorian than the Victorians. But 
to, but what still he has another notion of what is uh, proper by nature. To contradict oneself is of course not by nature shame. That he shows by his own action. While to abandon one's view, for example, because these views have shown to be self-contradictory, this is by nature shameful. Namely, why? Why? Why is it by nature shameful to abandon one's view, even if they have been refuted? A sign of lacking manliness. You don't, you budge. You don't stick to your guns. In other words, he has a military view of intellectual battles. Which are not requires, which uh, which is of course very unreasonable and against the nature of intellectual balance. Yes. Sorry, could you say again why it was a feat of Socrates to admit or to ask what he did about the? Uh... Oh no, this is well a minor thing because you no, know, at that point Socrates is not uh, 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 Socrates is not uh, uh, Socrates is not uh, uh, Socrates is not 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 uh, Socrates or a, a corpse. Now, a duck is higher and as an animate being than a corpse or a stone, i.e. inanimate. inanimate. <laughs> to that extent, Socrates may be slim. Although one could, of course, from a so-called aesthetic point of view, i.e. from a point of view based on convention, say, better a clean stone than an unclean bird. That, uh, that one could say, but that is not uh, not reasonable. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Callicles here suffers a defeat, quite obviously, which is disgraceful for him. Uh, namely, uh, because contempt of convention is his standard, and here he proves again to be a slave of convention. Uh, Socrates could not sway him by his rhetoric, by his images, as we have seen, nor by a genuine reputation, as we have here. Callicles is altogether unpersuadable. The particular mixture of nature and convention on which he has settled at the end of his brief journey in the land of philosophy uh, is, while absurd, is unshakable, it's a firm conviction, impermeable to any kind of logos of either. Here you see the difference between him and Poulos, very important. He must not follow impressions. Caligus is a much more impressive figure. Where did compare Poulos' masterpiece of rhetoric, the indictment of Achillaos, you remember with the the baby with the, following the goose, and it was beautifully elaborated. Uh, that is, of course, inferior as a rhetorical piece to Caligula's long speech. Caligula is much more impressive. But we must not uh, follow impression. That is a very dangerous thing. Uh, Caligula is, uh, is superior to Caligula. Now let us remember, remind ourselves of Poros' thesis. The noble or fair is different from the good. That was Apollo's uh, thesis. Which means there is a place for the useless, uh, which is not good, not useful. For that useless, which is, however, attractive. Now, this is exactly necessary if you want to enjoy rhetoric, or for that matter, poetry. Uh, we can also say for the playful. There's no place for the playful in uh, Caliclus's uh, order. Caliclus asserts that the good and the noble say, or fair is identical with the good. No place for the playful. You remember the passage when he said how nice playful things are in children and how unbearable in grown-up people? Um, he, he, one can trace it to the arrows of uh, Caliglis, but one must add immediately an arrows of a certain kind, not the kind which Sugar says. I believe that is all I have to say about this here. Yes, now um, go on. So uh, Caliglis is without any question refute, refuted, not the position which he claims to defend. 
that is not refuted because uh, after all there are cynics as they were called in that time. The cynics exactly said that. Read only uh, the, the Diogenes Laertius on, on um, um, Diogenes, the cynic. And that Diogenes, with the greatest shamelessness, Diogenes accepts all these conclusions and, without, and, uh, and cannot be refuted because he does not recognize the norms. He can be refuted by other considerations. It is a defeat only of Caligus. Now let us, uh, um, uh, let us see. Therefore, that is the reason why Sogares does not exploit his victory here because he knows uh, the problem remains open. Now go on. Quicker, try again now, and tell me whether you say that pleasant and good are the same thing, or that there is some pleasure which is not good. Go on. Then, so that my statements may not be inconsistent through my saying they are different, I say they are the same. You are spoiling your first statement, Captain and you can no longer be a sick partner with me in proving the truth. Going to speak against your own now, Caliclus now reasserts his thesis without holding it any longer. That is the sign of his manliness. Even if you are licked, you must never admit it. Only out of shame does he maintain it. But his shame is obviously different from the shame experienced by Gorgias and Poulos. Gorgias and Polos were ashamed, according to Caligula's analysis, they were ashamed to say unpopular things. Caligula, however, is ashamed to give in, which is an entirely different proposition. Sugaris and Polos, uh, Gorgias and Polos were to different degrees cautious, and that's the reason why they were ashamed to say unpopular things. Caligula, however, is obstinate. Now, this obstinacy makes him, of course, unpersuadable. There is a simple presentation of obstinacy and its secret at the beginning of the Republic. Um, uh, Sogares and Glaucon are met by a group of men. One of them is Polymarchos. And they say, uh, you, you Sogares and Glaucon, must stay in the Piraeus and not go home to Athens, as Sogares wanted. And then Sogares says, can we not try to pass? And you, we are many more than you, so, in order that we can keep you here by coercion. And then so says, but can we not try to persuade you? And then Polymachus says, no, if we don't listen. Whereupon Glaucon immediately says, of course, and so we give in. Uh, but uh, that is a simple device for being impermeable to lovers, just refuse to listen. And that can be, there are various ways in which you can do it. It's not necessarily that you go away. You can also make a lot of noise and repeat uh, stupidly the same uh, thing. No, no, no. It's, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't make uh, any difference how you do it, but obstinacy is irrefutable. Yeah. Uh, this is also a difference between the people who are in the reputation of. Uh, Polis with no the reputation of Gorgias in the beginning and the reputation of Calipides now because Gorgias uh, continued to argue with Socrates. No, but he also knows uh, when he is licked, you see, and Apollos too. Polos is not convinced, but he, he is, he, he doesn't sulk as Calipides does and will do more and more in the future because both have naturally a higher respect for lovers. You can say that it's just their professional uh, uh, necessity, because you can't be a teacher of rhetoric, of the art of speaking, without showing some respect for speech. But Polos, being not a rhetorician, but a politician, and only a pupil of rhetorician, can afford to look down on speech as such. What I, what I was, what I was trying to say, though, was that at the end of the gorgeous section, we were able to conclude that wisdom is power because of defeat. We could, we could 
see something of this implication of the wisdom of this power because of the defeat of the wise man and the wise man being the yeah. Yeah. Yes. Good. Now, I, I thought you, and what do we learn from the Caliglis section regarding this crucial point? Exactly, yeah, I say the, the unwise man doesn't have to, but, and, but still Caliglis is um, infinitely more willing to listen than the average Athenian. He has some respect for philosophy, as we have seen, and he looks up to gorgeous. Therefore, you can imagine what chance, how great the power of Socrates in Athens will be. Yeah? Good. No, no, that is, uh, was very fair, I would say. But someone else raised his hand and... Oh, you. I was just wondering, you mentioned that uh, the poet didn't solve. At the same time, the poet was silenced completely, and in a way seemed to have withdrawn from the conversation while Gorgias continued to make comments. Now, yeah, it, can it not be this that Polos was simply uh, overwhelmed by this experience, uh, whereas Gorgias, an older man who had seen more things, recovered uh, more quickly than Polos? That could be. Good. Um, now, there is one other point. You remember also this. Caliclis claimed it was said to be the touchstone for Socrates' life or for the truth of Socrates' opinions. Now, he cannot be that touchstone, we know that already. But Socrates does no longer speak here of Caligles as touchstone. He speaks now of Caligles as a man who examines the beings jointly with him. That's something entirely different from a touchstone. Because if two men are going to examine something, they must have, fundamentally, the same qualities. Whereas a touchstone and a gold don't have any qualities to speak of in common. Um, now that Caligles is, of course, disqualified from examining together with Socrates, we know already by now, because he's impermeable to reasoning. I mean, there's, there's, not that Socrates' reasons, reasonings are all good, far from them, but he is unable to uncover the defects of the reasoning because of his obsession with his uh, earlier views. Socrates says here, you destroy your first speeches. That means uh, you contradict your long speech which did not, strictly speaking, imply that the good is identical with the pleasant, but at most that the good or noble is a certain pleasant, a certain pleasure which pleasure was undefined. Yes, now go on here. For you do the same, Socrates, but then I am just as much in the wrong if I do as you are. You know, Caliglis gives tit for tat, it seems, which is in the, within the realms of every human being, however stupid. But the question arises, does not Sugaris, in fact, speak against his own opinion? Which is makes sense to say that. In what sense? Huh? Irony. Yeah, but more simply, or, or more clearly, perhaps, to the extent to which he argues from the premises of the other, ad hominem, to that extent, he does not say what he thinks. So it is a bit more, but Caliphas, I believe, does not mean that. It uh, means simply the tit for tat is said before. Now go on. But look here, I get this friend. Perhaps the good is not mere unconditional enjoyment. For if it is, we have to face not only that spring of shameful consequences, But when you recognize, I believe, a common procedure of obstinate people who can't have a reply, you think so, that's what you say, without giving a reason why he shouldn't say so. Yeah. Good. 
I do. Then all these that to set about discussing it is your serious view. Oh yes, to be sure. Come, since that is your opinion, resolve me this. There is something, I suppose, that you call knowledge. Yes. And were you not saying just now that knowledge can have a certain courage coupled with it? Yes, I was. And you surely meant that they were two things, courage being distinct from knowledge. Quite so. Well, now, are pleasure and knowledge the same thing or different? Different, I presume, most say to say. And courage, too. Is that different from pleasure? Of course it is. Come, let us be sure to remember this, that Calvary the Arcarian says pleasant and good were the same, but knowledge and courage were different both from each other and for the good. And Socrates, as I will be, first refuses to grant him this or nothing one thing. It is not. Nor, I believe, will Calvary die when he has rightly considered himself. Yeah. Yeah, let us stop here for a moment. So, now what, uh, here the thesis of Caligus is formulated before it is subjected to examination. There are three different things, knowledge, courage, and the present. This is indeed easy to see that a man should say that these are three different things. Therefore, Caligus says this, so that you shrewd men that you see these differences. But he also asserts, Calvinus also asserts that the pleasant is identical with the good. Hence, if, if, hence there is this consequence from the first non-equation, uh, since um, knowledge, say, is different from the pleasant, but the pleasant is a good, that um, Knowledge is also different from the good. And knowledge is not good. The same would apply to courage. Yeah. So it is refers here to Caligles's deem. You know, the, the deems were the divisions of the Athenian citizen body. And this was a democratic institution. So aristocratic procedure was to call a man by his father's name, as the Russians do, son of X, son of Y. Um, uh, and Caligles uh, uh, replies the same way. Now, this is a reminder, surely, of the political question, which is now completely unthematic, but always in the background, for the simple reason that we are speaking about rhetoric. But now that Caligles comes from this particular dean, Akane, is not without uh, interesting implications. This was a very famous theme, one of the most populous ones. Thucydides describes it somewhere in, uh, in um, the uh, history. And moreover, which is for more interesting for our purpose, there is a comedy by Aristophanes called the Arcanians. Uh, briefly, the Arcanians are, uh, they were a rural theme, rather rural, the marathon fighters. I believe an American equivalent would be the American Legion. A very warlike and very patriotic. And now in this Aristophanian play, there is a hero called Dikaiopolis, literally translated the just city. The very name reminds us later on people of Socrates, and especially of the Socrates of the Gorgias. Now, what the, the action is this, this Dikaiopolis, justice, political justice incarnate, makes peace with the enemy, Sparta, private peace. So the whole city is at war except Dikaiopolis. And it is not difficult to show that Dikaiopolis is a comic poet himself. He, he makes peace and he gets away with that act of treason because he can use the rags, certain rags of Eurybilis. But the main point, which is relevant for our purposes, is this, that why does he make peace? For the sake 
of the pleasures of the senses. Here you have also a hedonist, but very different from Caligula's because he is an unpolitical hedonist. And we must also consider this alternative, which is not made a theme, of course, in this dialogue. Yes. Now we come to a very long argument. Uh, I do not know whether it would uh, be, will be possible to read that today. It is no use to read it in small parts. Well, I will simply state the argument of 495E to 497A. It's a starting point. Happiness is a state opposed to misery, as everyone will admit. Just as health is opposed to sickness, etc. Obviously, one cannot be healthy and sick at the same time, meaning strictly. Of course, you can be healthy in your liver and sick at your eyes. I mean, you cannot be healthy in that respect, in the same respect in which you are sick at the same time. And moreover, you cannot get rid of health and sickness at the same time. Yet happiness includes all good things and miseries, misery all evil things. Now, if there is something which one can possess together with its contrary, as one cannot possess health and sickness together, at the same time, and of which one can get rid simultaneously with its contrary, with its contrary, this thing cannot be either good or bad. But when a man, a thirsty man, drinks, he has both pleasure and pain. The pain of thirst, the pleasure of satisfaction. And when he has satisfied his desire, he has gotten rid simultaneously of pleasure and pain. Hence, pleasant and pain, the pleasant and the painful, cannot be the good and the bad. That's the argument. Now, well, we have to examine this argument, but I think when you read it, you will find that this is the substance of the point. We can perhaps be, be discuss next time the argument. Let us read only a, a, a little intermezzo. After this argument is through in 497A5, there is, how does Caliclase reply? After he has understood what Sugarless is aiming at. Mr. Rankin? I cannot follow this subtlety that your doctor did. Yes, the word which you use is a verb meaning coming from sophists, of what you sophisticate, you could say. Yes? You can, but you play the innocent character. Just go on a little further, that you may realize how subtle is your way of reproving. Does not each of us see at the same moment from thirst and from the pleasure he gets by drinking? I cannot tell what you mean. Oh, no, Calvin, you must answer him. Gorgeous said that, yeah? That the argument may be brought to a conclusion. But Socrates is always like this, Gorgeous. He keeps on asking petty, unimportant questions until he refutes one. Why? What does that matter to you? In any case, it is not your credit that is at stake, Calvin. Just permit Socrates to refute you in such matters as he chooses. Well, then, proceed with those little kind of questions of your missing sources and so on. Let us stop here. Now, Caracas, uh, you see, refuses to reply. He is obstinate. He withdraws um, to silently, i.e., speechlessly, re unreasonably maintaining his opinion. But Sugaris insists on the continuation of the conversation in order to bring Caligles to admit that Caligles has blamed Sugaris without ground. Now this blame was, as 
called, at least in one place, an accusation. Sugares wants to bring Pericles to admit that he has accused Sugares unjustly. But Sugares does not bring his unjust accuser to make him this admission. That is a, a prophecy. He cannot even bring Caliphus to do that, still less the accusers in earnest, yes? Twice, Caliphus says that a woman continuing to accept his words for eight years sort of indicates that condition of later on. Yeah, sure, yes. And then, uh, finally, he says it a third time, it's only when he says it that third time that Socrates says, well, what should we do now? Should we continue or should we not? Uh, why does he not do this? Maybe he takes this up and we come to this and only limit ourselves to what happens here. Good. Now, only gorgeous intervention uh, prevents the cessation of the conversation. Gorgeous has authority over Caliphates, as you see. Socrates has not. Sugares can rule Caliphates only via Gorgias. That is a simple statement of the problem. The philosopher can rule certain people only via the rhetoricians. The rhetoricians, in this sense of this dialogue, have a quality which the philosopher as philosopher does not possess. The philosopher has his, his rhetoric, but that's a private rhetoric of the Thetis. It's not the public rhetoric discussed in this time. Now, why does he intervene? The old commentator whom we have, Olympiodorus, says he intervenes lest he be not the only one refuted by Socrates. Well, he means, of course, he and Polos. You know, in other words, after he has been so ingloriously defeated, he wants everyone else to be in the same boat. Surely, he says, I do not necessarily, I'm not sure, quite sure that is correct. And surely, Gorgias intervenes for the sake of Gorgias and the other listeners. He does not intervene for the sake of Caligula. That's quite clear. The whole dialogue is for the benefit of Gorgias, as I have said already before, as became clear at the beginning of the polo section, or in the polo section somewhere. Yes, now let us read the next two lines, and then we'll make a comment there. You are fortunate, Calibri, in having been initiated into the great mystery before the little. I did not think that this was permitted. Yeah, let us, now what does this mean? This is a reference to 484C for it. Calibri has said in one's youth one should study philosophy and then turn to politics. Politics are the greater things, 484C. In other words, first the lesser mystery, mysteries of philosophy, and then the greater mysteries of politics. Now, so what it says here, to in effect, you have not been initiated into the lesser mysteries, i.e. into philosophy. Contrary to what he had said at the beginning, you remember when he said uh, Caligulus is so perfectly competent in this matter, and yet you are already initiated in the greater mysteries of politics. And I always thought, he said, that this was not, that was wrong, religiously wrong. Uh, and, and then he will, of course, uh, this will be then a, a subject for in the rest of the dialogue. The, kind, the, the non-philosophic politician, and uh, the menace which he constitutes uh, to himself and to society. Uh, we cannot take this out. Uh, I think we, we will not read anymore uh, because the passage is too long, and uh, we need a coherent discussion of the arguments, the first argument which Sogaris uses here in order to prove this key thing, that the good is not the pleasant.
I mean, that is, uh, that is Socrates' opinion without any question in Plato's. The question is whether the arguments used here are sufficient to establish it, and what the effects of the argument might perhaps reveal to us. Now, is there any more, Mr. Padova? Uh, did I reply to indirectly, uh, in fact, to your question? Yeah. You know, to which, uh, yeah, it, I wonder to which argument you refer now. 490A to 491 uh, A. Was this point, but is it not necessary for Roger, for Hargles, to make clear what he means uh, that the better should have more? And since the better were defined as those who know more, then he took this take some example of knowers. Since Caligles had not deigned to identify the knowers he had in mind, so that it's perfectly justified to take shoemakers and others. Until Caligles finally comes up and says, I mean those wise in political risk. Yeah, except that we've seen in the past that Socrates has a facility by leading an argument that directly contradicts what he says. Yeah. Uh, and that's the only argument he makes now, but I think that was very, very helpful because it let us see that he is here concerned with the question of the two inequalities. The inequality regarding capacity or ability to rule and the inequality regarding the vision of the booty, if I may say. These are two entirely different considerations. And while it makes sense to say that the men who did more for the community should get more. It is not quite clear what should he get more. Should and you have to use these homely examples which Socrates uses? Uh, should he get more food uh, and more drink, more clothes, more shoes, or or larger shoes maybe? Uh, that is, I think, necessary. That Socrates has to use such uh, tons of brick. Uh, it's not his fault, but the fault of Caligus. I think that must be made clear, and we would never have, uh, would we never be able to see that the problem of the Republic uh, is present here, and uh, uh, without this uh, this passage of it. So I don't think that there is any any mistake. Yeah, but to the Republic is too wrong, is too, uh, too narrow. It points to the, fun, the underlying political problem which one must, which has, happens to be, be elaborated in the Republic. But if we do not consider that, we will not understand the treatment of rhetoric in this time. So then I think we do. Uh, oh, there is one thing which I should mention. We, uh, my attention was drawn to it. We, um, there will be an examination at the end of this course for those who take the course for credit. And the day on which, uh, since there is uh, Thanksgiving Day, and uh, we are one meeting late because I uh, wasn't here two weeks ago, the examination will be on. December 3. In, uh, so I think I should tell you in advance not uh, to put any fear into your heart, but just that you make uh, arrangements. Uh,
Sanchez is treasurer of Good Old Man. The rhetoricians, scourgers, and polos say, of course, rhetoric is good. Sogares says it is bad. Now, in the gorgeous section, we have seen uh, a, a twofold contradiction. The explicit one, um, rhetoric can be used unjustly, and on the other hand, it cannot be used unjustly. The implicit one is perhaps more important immediately. Rhetoric is omnipotent, and yet rhetoricians are in danger of being criminally persecuted uh, successfully. In the poorer section, Sugaris makes clear that rhetoric is bad because it is not an art, but a flattery, a kind of flattery. An art being directed towards the good and a flattery directed towards the pleasant. Still, at the end, Sugaris admits that rhetoric could be good if it were used for bringing criminals to justice. And it would be good because punishment makes men just. The issue has then become justice instead of rhetoric. In, in the currently section, the issue becomes even broader. The question concerns how men should live. And here the alternative is the life devoted to philosophy or the political life. And the, it is understood that the life of philosophy corresponds to justice, the political life to injustice, which implies that there is no harmony between philosophy and the polis or philosophy and the demos. Rhetoric cannot bring about, uh, cannot bridge the gulf between philosophy and the polis, and therefore rhetoric is powerless in the most important respect. Generally speaking, as far as we have studied the work with the two, we can say in the gorgeous Sogatis debunks rhetoric. Just as in the Republic, he debunks poetry. But on the other hand, that lest we uh, are carried away by these impressions, there is also a platonic dialogue in which rhetoric is rehabilitated, and that is the Phaedrus. Just as poetry is to some extent rehabilitated in the banquet. Now, these two dialogues, Phaedrus and banquet, have one thing in common as far as their theme is concerned. Both deal with errors. And from this we can draw the conclusion that the gorgeous and the republic, in contradistinction to the fetters of the banquet, abstract from errors and therefore reach this negative result regarding rhetoric and poetry. But it is undeniable that the rehabilitation of rhetoric in the fetters is much more visible than the rehabilitation of poetry in the banquet because that rehabilitation in the banquet is only implicit. It is not made a theme. So the overall superficial impressions, and they are always very important, uh, is that Plato takes a more favorable view of rhetoric than of poetry. And we will find out, perhaps today, and otherwise next Tuesday, from the Gorgias, why Plato has this seemingly strange preference for rhetoric in contradistinction to poetry. In the colorless section, these, uh, the contrast is between the philosophic and the political life, as the contrast between the just and the unjust life. Now, reduced to its principle, this is the question concerning the relation of the good and the pleasant. Philosophy, justice, and the good, political life, injustice, and the pleasant belong together. Caligas asserts that the good is identical with the pleasant, and Sugaris asserts the opposite. 
uh, in this discussion of the relation between the good and the pleasant with, at which we have arrived, Sugaris establishes the basis for the contrast between art and flattery, between uh, uh, um, and flattery being, of course, uh, uh, that thing to which rhetoric belongs. But now the discussion leads to a novel result. We all have observed uh, throughout the course that rhetoric cannot be simply bad because Sovereign uses rhetoric all the time. But this it, we have only observed, it was never stated. Now it will, be, it will become stated that there can be a kind of rhetoric which is directed towards the good, i.e. towards justice. What is simply bad is or not rhetoric but poetry, as I said before. Now, Suarez sketches then in the sequel the right kind of rhetoric for the benefit of gorgeous. Calibres is only a kind of guinea pig. It's the conversation with Calibres and even the conversation with Pulos is Socrates's epidaxis, so that is this showing off of his rhetoric, just as Gorgias had shown his rhetoric before the dialogue, and Plato didn't think it worth his while to present to us a piece of Gorgian uh, uh, showing off rhetoric, as he surely could have done with these. So it is reveals, especially in the character section, the limitations of his rhetoric because he cannot uh, convince, persuade characters. And this means, in my view, that so it suggests to Gorgias that Gorgias should do to characters and his life what Sugaris cannot do. So Venice does not have the peculiar gifts of characters, whatever they may be worth, but there are some gifts. Gorgias should not waste his time, and for the nonsense he is doing at present, for this childish place he makes, but should do a useful job for people like Hans. Uh, one point I would like to make, and this supplementing what I said last time, Caligles has been presented to us in what we read last time as coming from the Dean Akane. And this reminds us of Aristophanes' comedy, fortunately preserved, the Akanians. I mentioned that the hero there is the Dikaiopolis, the just city. The name seems to fit Sugares more than any, anyone else, especially Sugares of the Gorgias. But the hero there is the comic poet. And he is a hedonist, like Caracas, a man who enjoys especially the pleasures of food, of eating, and he is presented as preparing a meal with infinite gusto. And, uh, but he is a hedonist like Caracas, but an unpolitical one. He turns his back on the police. He is as unpolitical, we could say, as Socrates. Only Socrates didn't care so much for the art of cooking, as we have seen. Now, he makes peace in the middle, midst of war. He commits treason, in other words. And he gets away with that. How? This simple thing I forgot to mention last time. As a clever use of rhetoric, he appeals, a mother, he uh, addresses the marathon fighters, uh, the, the uh, intensely pa uh, patriotic group by first splitting them into two parties so, and by uh, attacking Pericles and his whole policy, say as if someone in this country would attack the, uh, the democratic administration. And so he splits them into two and then he has already won because if you have one party on your side, then you are not completely isolated. And then he, however, succeeds in uh, convincing the whole bunch, also the enemies, by appealing to these simple men's 
losing of the brass, you know, wartime austerity, and then there are such these the, the brass are enjoying themselves and have all good things, and you have to to starve. And by these lousy rhetorical means, he uh, wins his dream. Good. And this I thought I should mention. And now we will turn to our text. We are engaged in the discussion of the relation of the good and the pleasant. And I gave you a, a summary last time towards the end of the first part of the argument, which is a, 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 a gist is very simple. It's very simple. The good and the bad cannot exist at the same time, in the same being, in the same respect. Nor can they be lost at the same time, in the same, by the same individual, in the same respect. Whereas the pleasant and the painful can exist and must even exist in the same individual, as you see from the example of if you are hungry, enjoy eating. You would not enjoy the eating if you were not hungry if you don't have the pain of hunger. Now, in the moment the pain of hunger has ceased, the pleasure of eating has ceased. So you get rid of the two things, of the opposites at the same time. Ergo, the good and the bad are radically distinct from the pleasant and unpleasant. This was the first argument. And now we come to the second part of the argument. In um, 497, C5. You know, we, yeah, uh, C, uh, C, uh, yeah, there is, and uh, the point is this, uh, one argument, one point has still to be discussed. Perhaps you read first Socrates' speech in 497B1-2. You, you can, but you plainly can't. No, uh, the next speech was Socrates. I mean, the, second, the question which Sugaris had tested addressed there to Calicles. Oh, does not each of us see at the same moment from thirst and to the pleasure he gets by drinking? Yeah. So this cessation, uh, this, this is simultaneous cessation of pleasure and pain is now discussed by itself. Now go on now in form that. Uh, where we were in C5, uh, yeah? Whether, one do, whether each of us does not simultaneously cease to be... Does he cease to feel the desire and pleasures at the same time? That is so. Yeah. I don't see that he can feel the pains and pleasures at the same time. But still, he does not cease to have the good and bad at the same time, as you agree. And now, do you not agree? I do. What then? Only that we get the results, my friend, that the good things are not the same as the pleasant, but the bad as the pain. For when the one thing of the cessation is as far as it was, but when the other two, which is not, since they are distinct. Yes, now this is a, a completion of this part of the argument. There will be another one following, which we will discuss later. We have to consider the proof and whether it is valid. We have been given some examples here of pleasant and painful things. For example, of eating, drinking, and uh, uh, of hunger and thirst. But we have not been given a single example of good and bad things. He mentioned a health and sickness, strength and weakness, quickness and slowness, but they are not given as examples of good and bad things. It's only implied. You see it with particular clarity in 496b5, where these things are distinguished from the good things. Now, it is clear that they cannot be good things on the basis of what we have heard before. How could uh, health, uh, uh, strength, and also wealth, by the way, be good 
if it is doubtful whether life is good. And that is bad, because obviously health would, if life is bad, uh, sickness is preferable to health, because the chances of death are much greater when you are sick, and especially gravely sick, than if you are healthy. What are then the good and the bad things which man cannot possess and lose at the same time? Knowledge and manliness. But no, Caligulus had denied that they were good. Uh, 5, 450, uh, 495, D, 4 to 5. So we don't know, and we do not have a single example of a good thing. Therefore, the assertions and the good and bad things are mutually exclusive is a general assertion without support because uh, we don't have a single example of what good and bad is. If the pleasant is good, we do everything for the sake of the blessed. Everything else is mere means in itself, neither good or bad, as was indicated in a way in the polar section. For example, health is not simply good because it is not simply pleasant. Because becoming healthy after sickness may be more pleasant and hence better than health. That is to say, a state between sickness and health, becoming healthy, in which health wins out over sickness, just as in the state in which the satisfaction of desire of eating wins out over the pain of hunger. In brief, we, uh, are there any good things which are not blessed? No basis, um, uh, no such goods have been indicated. Caritas gets here into trouble because he grants a proposition regarding the good things, namely that the good and bad things cannot be possessed and lost at the same time because happiness and misery cannot be possessed at the same time, which is of course true. But this does not, this general thesis regarding happiness and misery does not exclude that happiness is the state in which we can satisfy our desires and misery is a state in which we cannot satisfy our desires. But this does not mean that the state of happiness is a state of mere pleasure, i.e. where there is no pain whatever. Perhaps there is no such a state. Perhaps pleasure and pain are so indissolubly linked with each other uh, that, uh, um, that we cannot have the one without the other, or at least in this sense that we can have pure pain, but never pure pleasure. This would have to be examined. Now, behind this discussion, in no way developed here, is the form which hedonism, the view that the good is the pleasant, took in classical antiquity, generally speaking. This, there is modern hedonism as well as ancient hedonism, but there is a fundamental difference between the two. Uh, prepared by Plato, and of course also Aristotle, the most famous hedonistic school, the Epicurean school, took the view, implied here, the only true pleasures are pure pleasures, pleasures which have no admixture of pain. The sensual satisfactions have all an admixture of pain. Pure pleasures would be such as if not a platonic example the enjoyment of the smell of a rose, for example, has no admixture of pain. The pleasures of mathematical beauty have no admixture of pain. But uh, still, at any rate, the concept of the pure pleasures uh, is, uh, is the, the end of uh, classical uh, hedonism. The consequence is, of course, that the ancient hedonists, the philosophers, I'm not speaking now of uh, people like Caligas, 
severe ascetic men, because these pleasures can be obtained for very little, very little. Uh, they, uh, as, um, uh, so the Epicurean way of life was as ascetic as the Stoic way of life, only the foundation, the historical foundation was different. Now I will read to you from a most important modern text. At the beginning of modern philosophy, Francis Bacon, in his advancement of learning in the Everyman's Library edition, which I use, page 161. The question being debated between Socrates and the Sophist. Sugaris placing felicity in an equal and constant peace of mind, and the sophist, he means of course Caligus, in much desiring and much enjoying. They fell from argument to ill words. The sophist saying that Sugaris' felicity was a felicity of a block or stone, and Sugaris saying that the sophist's felicity was a felicity of one that had the itch who did nothing but itch and scratch. And both opinions do not want their support. For the opinion of Socrates is much upheld by the general consent even of the Epicures themselves, that virtue bears a great part in felicity. And if so, certain it is, that virtue has more use in clearing perturbations than in compassing desires. The sophist's opinion is much favored by the assertion we last spoke of, that good of advancement is greater than good of simple preservation, because every obtaining a desire has a show of advancement, as motion so in the circle has a show of progression. It's almost literally repeated by Hobbes somewhere. But the second this question, decided the true way, makes the former superfluous. For can it be doubted but that there are some who take more pleasure in enjoying pleasures than some other, and yet nevertheless are less troubled with the loss or leaving of them? And it seems to me that most of the doctrines of the philosophers are more fearful and cautionary than the nature of things requires. In other words, Bacon says, much greater risks can be taken. Why not have uh, a much more peppery life, you know, M much uh, uh, vinegar and oil, as it were, in it, uh, and also have a, a more uh, spectacular pleasures. And there is a development leading from here straight to Hobbes and Locke. And the, what is, is uh, to speak in terms of social history, the turn of philosophy toward a so-called capitalist or acquisitive society has its theoretical root here. The, the maximum of pleasures, of satisfactions, enlarging your desires and not leaving it at the satisfaction of the simply natural desires is much better. And I, uh, I, I trust that you know, the, see the connection between that and the, uh, an acquisitive or capitalist society because capitalism stands and falls, as you know from every advertisement, uh, by the arousing of desires which people did not have before. And here, the theoretical, you know, for example, for who had a desire for an, um, such a useful thing as an icebox, a uh, refrigerator, uh, um, a generation, two generations ago. Uh, so, this is uh, quite interesting. But this is a background of Plato, here not developed, developed in later Platonic life, so called later Platonic uh, uh, dialogues. Now, the the true argument of Plato, the full argument of Plato and Aristotle regarding hedonism is not developed here either. And it can be stated very simply as follows. Pleasure and pain cannot be the fundamental fact. Because the pleasure or pain which a being senses 
depends on uh, depend on his constitution, as an other Greek philosopher has put it. So, uh, hey, um, uh, an, an, an ass would prefer hay to gold. Of course. I mean, assuming that gold is something very valuable, he would be completely unaware of that. Uh, so it depends on the constitution, on the nature of the being. And uh, what is pleasant or painful uh, uh, is, uh, must be viewed in the light of the constitution. That which completes, perfects the nature of the thing is a good. And this is naturally accompanied by a specific pressure. Uh, when we come into our own by the perfection of something, then we enjoy that. And that is, of course, not merely true of eating and drinking. It is especially true of the human mind. Now, the second comment I have to make is this. The proof given here is divided into two parts. Through Callicles' sulking, which we have discussed at the end of last meeting, and Gorgias' intervention. There are, uh, there are altogether two proofs, the one which we have read and the one which we are going to read, just as there were two similars. But the twofoldness is as it were repeated within the first proof, insofar as it is clearly bipartite, and the partition is made by this brief scene of uh, Calgary's sulking and Gorgias' intervention. The second half of the first proof deals only with the simultaneous cessation of pleasure and pain, as distinguished from the simultaneous possession of pleasure and pain. Now, what, uh, what can this mean? Do we cease to have pleasure and pain, uh, say, of, of thirst, uh, by drinking, when we have drunk enough? Both pleasure and pain cease. But uh, this is the only, th uh, uh, only f uh, way in which we cease to ha have pleasure and pain, say of thirst. There is another very well known way in which we also cease to have pleasure and pain, doubtless familiar to all of you, when we die. But by dying, indeed, we, are, or, um, we lose also both the good and bad things in the ordinary sense of the term. And this would, could seem to show that the good and bad things are not simply good and bad. Furthermore, philosophy implies the simultaneous possession of knowledge and ignorance, philosophy being a state in between. If philosophy becomes wisdom, if quest for wisdom becomes wisdom, we lose ignorance and possess only its contrary, namely knowledge. But when we die, we lose simultaneously knowledge and ignorance. Knowledge, according to the criterion here established, knowledge and ignorance are then both, neither good nor bad. Uh, and so on. There are, we, want, want, we could develop this further. So it's this, uh, it makes sense to concentrate on the question of cessation, simultaneous cessation of pleasure and pain, uh, as Pedro does, uh, does it here. Yeah. Now, uh, let us go on. Or is there any, Mr. Lines? I did not see it, but maybe, what, what do you mean? Yeah. Yeah, that, uh, um, be, uh, perhaps because he puts here uh, losing first and uh, possessing afterward. Do you mean that? But that is taken up, that prepares, as it were, as it were, the concentration on cessation exclusively in the second part of the proof. I do not see more than that. Yes, in other words, consider both. Consider not only the simultaneous possession, but also simultaneous cessation. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, but Calidus behaves rather well. After um, a, 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 no, here, yeah, he still behaves reasonably well, and uh, then uh, after Gorgias' intervention, still more. He he will make troubles very soon again, and then let us see that. Now let us read then the sequel. Or, if you like, consider it another way. For I fancy that even after that you do not admit it. Just as sir, do you not call good people good only to the presence of good things, as you call beautiful those in whom beauty is present? I do. Well then, do you give the name of good men to fools and cowards? It was not they just an upper brain that wise men whom you so describe. Or is it not these that you call good? Yeah, but here Sugaris reminds Calidus of what Calidus had insisted upon in the first part of the speech, of his speech, that uh, uh, the men who deserve to rule and who, to whom he admires are the intelligent and the courageous. And the, gen and the name applied to both are good. I mean, uh, good in the sense of excellent, excellent. Uh, so, uh, he, uh, but Calidus will get into trouble on this ground. Let us see. Yes. And now, have you ever seen in this gentleman enjoying himself? I have. And have you ever seen a silly man enjoying himself? I suppose I have. What does that have to do with it? Nothing will be answered. I have seen one. And again, a man of sense in a state of pain or enjoyment. Yes. And which sort of more apt to feel enjoyment or pain? The wise or the foolish? Don't you think there is not much difference? Uh, that was so bad. You see, it, there is no difference between wise men and fools regarding the quantities of joys or sufferings. Calicus transit. It's clear. Uh, superficially, that's of course true. Now, go on. In war, have you ever seen a coward? Of course I have. Well, when the enemy withdrew, which seemed to you to enjoy it more, the cowards or the brave? Both did it. Or if not that, about equal. <laughs> Anyhow, the cowards do enjoy it very much. And the fools it would be. Yes. And when the foe advances, do the cowards alone feel pain in the grave as well? Well, alike. More perhaps the cowards. And when the foe withdraws, do they not enjoy it more? Perhaps. So the foolish and the wise, and the cowards and the brave, feel pain and enjoy it about equally according to you. But the coward is more than the brave. Let's stop here. So here the difference regarding uh, courage is clearer than in regarding knowledge. This much is clear. The cowards have mo more joys and sadness than the brave men. Uh, which, whereas in the other case of foolish and wise, this is, is not true. Now what, what does this mean? If the present is the good, then, uh, and the present as understood by Calicles, then cowardice is of course to be preferred to courage. The only virtue which he could conceivably claim is endangered by his opinion that the good is identical with the pleasant. Well, just as in God and Calicles' view, the mixture of pleasure and pain makes the pleasure truly pleasant, yeah, the pepper. And the, the same is, of course, also true here in this particular case of fear. And you have much more fears and much more frequent fears and also much more feelings of uh, liberation from fear. Uh, the God gets much more excitement from life 
Then he steady and stolid, brave man. The coward does not have to go to Central Africa on big game hunting. He, since there are so many mice and uh, bugs <laughs> and flies around, you know, and he has constant excitement which Hemingway saw in faraway countries he has in his own. That's a very interesting <laughs> consideration. Now go on. But further, are the wise and brave good and the cowards and fools bad? Yes. Did the good and the bad feel enjoyment and pain about equally? I agree. Then are the good and the bad about equally good and bad? Or are the bad in some yet greater measure good and bad? <coughs> My word cannot tell what you mean. Are you aware or are you not? Did you hold that the good are good by the presence of good things, and that the bad are so by the presence of bad things, and that the pleasure is of the good things which is aimed at the bad things? Yes, I am. Hence, in those who have enjoyed them, the good things, the pleasures are present so long as they enjoy them. Then, the good things being present, those who enjoy are good. In those who feel pain are not bad things present, namely pain. And it is by the presence of bad things you say that the bad are bad things. Or do you no longer say so? But who says so? Then whoever enjoys is good, and whoever is pain is bad. Sir, you mean those more so who feel these things more, and those less who feel less? Those about equal people who feel about equal. Yes. Now, you say that the wise and the foolish, the cowardly and the brave, feel enjoyment and pain about equal but the cowardly is more. Ooh. Yeah, this is well. Since, according to Caligles, um, pleasures are the good things and pain are the bad things, the men who have pleasures, to whom with whom pleasures are present are, of course, a good men. And those with whom pain is present are the bad men. And therefore, uh, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, as soon as we summarize it as a secret, again, to make it quite clear. Then you just help me to recognize the results we get from our decisions. We know, they say, that which sleepeth well is well twice and no good right. To examine the children. We say that the wise and brave man is good, to uh, and that the foolish and cowardly is bad. And again, that he who enjoys is good, uh, and that he who feels pain is bad, necessarily. And that the good and the bad feel enjoyment and pain in the like manner, or perhaps the bad rather more. Uh, then, is the bad man made bad and good in a like manner to the good man, or even good in a greater measure? Does not this follow that all of those former statements from the assumption that the pleasant things and good things are the same? Must not this be so, Calvin? Is there no necessity of it in those years? Now, Caligas has been reduced ad absurdum. If the good is identical with the pleasant, knowledge and courage not being in themselves pleasant are not good. The, the good things are those who, so the good men are those who have the maximum of pleasures regardless of whether they got these pleasures through their ability cleverness and so on or by chance of course, that wouldn't make any difference. But this, of course, conflicts with Caligula's admiration for those he-men who get their pleasures by their ability. The argument, one could say, would not be valid uh, if used against people who do not share Caligula's admiration for the clever and brave i.e. it would not be valid, for example, for the general run of social science relativists today. 
who regards such uh, an abnegation as a value judgment as subjective as any other. And f therefore, it follows, for example, a moronic man who, by virtue of his moronic uh, incomprehension, uh, and is always very gay, smiling fellow. I have, you all, I'm sure, have seen such people. He is, of course, as good as the wisest of men. He has those values which he alone. Let me finish that and I pass it aside. Good. Um, or I take a bum or a drifter that is as good as a responsible human being. But what does this mean? Uh, th that is quite true. In other words, if you have men who have no aspirations, as Kaiko says, or in other words, deference to something better than themselves, as Kaiko says, you know, he looks up to this lion like fellow. Men who have no aspirations or def differences, whatever, cannot be refuted. That's perfectly true. It's, uh, if this is what the relativists uh, say, that's absolutely correct. They cannot be reached by logos, by argument, even less than Calicles. A man who by nature or by bad upbringing has no sense for what Suez would call the noble, for canon, cannot be reached by argument. That's absolutely true. And to that extent, relativism is irrefutable. But the question is, of course, whether such a man, the moronic, the smiling moron, or the bum or drifter, can be a man of science. Therefore, this uh, limits the issue somewhat. Can a man understand himself as a scientist without seeing in science, in reason, something high? And must there, he therefore not be open to the question whether there are other things which are also high, for example, public spiritedness, art in opposition, in contradistinction to trash, religion, as in contradistinction to just filling one's belly and uh, similar things. That is, I think, the question. Uh, but you wanted to say something, Mr. Wenger? One has the impression that he enjoys something. Yeah. In other words, you believe that the case for the moron can be refuted. I believe so too. But you must admit that not for the moron. He wouldn't understand. You see, that's the point. But is not, I mean, is a man who is unable to understand such things able to be a scientist? That would be the question. And I doubt, I think that's impossible. Yeah. I mean, with all, I'm willing to make any concession, even the most, the concession most damaging to these people, but I cannot make that. <laughs> I'm sorry, it took a minute. Um, good. Now let us see how Calicus has now been refuted. You cannot have respect and admiration for virtues like intelligence and courage, and at the same time say, uh, uh, um, uh, the good is identical with the pleasant, because these virtues are not uh, in themselves pleasant. Unless you can prove that the uh, um, um, the means for acquiring pleasure are intelligence plus courage. Then, of course, you could say uh, intelligence plus courage are necessary means <coughs> for the soul good, and therefore good. Yeah? But this cannot be shown if you take the uh, pleasant in this sense, in which uh, the Galicus takes it, satisfaction of the senses, because uh, that is obvious that this you can have without intelligence and courage. I mean, there are many people who enjoy this very much who are neither brave nor intelligent, and you only have to go to some public eating places 
uh, or expensive public events to uh, convince yourself of this verity, if you have any doubt about that. Now, let us see how Caliclus now reacts. Let me tell you, Socrates, all the time that I've been listening to you and yielding to a this, I have been remarking the square mile of delight with which you cling to any concession one may make to you, even in jest. So you suppose that I or anybody else in the world does not regard some pleasures as better than others worse. Yeah. Now, Socrates' argument is there not only partly insufficient, as an analysis would show, but it is even wholly unnecessary as far as Caligus is concerned. Because Caligus admits, of course, that not all pleasures are good, but you remember what he said about the pleasures of itch, uh, of scratching oneself. Why did Caligus not say what he says here right at the beginning and have spared us and Socrates this great trouble of refuting him? Now, when you consider the situation as it appeared from 494C, for instance, where he said uh, all uh, desires are good, and he obviously didn't mean it, because this led on the whole thing. He meant, of course, only those desires which a, a gentleman has, or at least which a gentleman can avow, but he didn't make this, uh, this uh, crucial limitation. And why did he not do it? Well, because of his famous courage or manliness, not to exceed a single bit of territory. Uh, this, uh, because it would be cowardly, naturally. Uh, he, uh, no, he didn't budge. But uh, still, in this, now as the situation comes, becomes somewhat uncomfortable for him, and now he makes the best of a somewhat difficult situation, namely to abandon that territory with grace. That's what he's doing here. He says, I did not mean, of course, what I said. I only made a, put up a mock fight, and you took it seriously as a fight, and you invested all your powers for nothing. You could have had it any time for the asking. Yeah, you know that this is a means used in political life from time to time as well. And still, in a way, it is, of course, a victory of Socrates insofar as he has now forced Calicles to be playful, or at least to pretend to be playful. You know, he was so very serious uh, to begin with. So this is a very, uh, um, a very, um, Caligas believe he has now solved this difficulty. Socrates is now defeated. He has been fooled by. Uh, he has fooled Socrates. And Socrates will, uh, for his sake, now explicitly admit. So, and fooling is, of course, defeat. Fooling a man means defeating him. Caligas is naturally pleased. Uh, go on, will you? Uh, 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 oh, Caligas, what a rascal you are, treating me thus like a child, now asserting that the that the same things are one way, now another, to deceive. And yet I started with the notion that I should not have to fear any intentional deception in your part, to be my friend. But now I find I was mistaken, and it seems I must, as the old saying goes, even make the best of what I have got and accept just anything to offer. Yeah, so now that's good. There is a saying of gorgeous, not, uh, I mean, from the real gorgeous, not from the gorgeous as a platonic character, that one must reply as an orator to the serious with play and to play with seriousness. So what is answers apparently with seriousness, so uh, you have defeated me. In this connection, I would like to do, read to you a passage from our commentator, um, the gorgeous has many echoes of the language of comedy. Uh, uh, there is no doubt about that. That is a correct remark. The funny thing is only that uh, the uh, Lord does not make any use of it, of this fact, in his overall judgment of the dialogue, and finds it is the most bitter platonic dialogue. But uh, how come that the most bitter platonic dialogue has so many borrowings from comedy? This question 
He has never put himself making the common error of not putting two and two together, you know. Bitter plus comedy. And that we, of course, do all the time, that we don't do it, but it is, doesn't make it good that it is done all the time. Uh, Callicles is uh, pleased with himself because he has fooled the clever Socrates, as Socrates himself admits. Therefore, Callicles can now gratify Socrates and always answer. You see, uh, you know, and this, uh, we, we don't need Gaussian interventions anymore for keeping him answer because he has had a victory. It's uh, uh, so this is a good pedagogue, as you can see. Now let us go on. Well, then, what you now state is, is that some particular pleasures are good and some bad. Is not that so? Yes. Well, uh, uh, yes. Um, so Calicles grants now that there are pleasures which are not only inferior to other pleasures, this a hedonist can grant without difficulties. For example, some pleasures are more lasting than others and therefore better than others. He grants now that there are some pleasures which are bad, simply bad, which a hedonist can never grant. Because if the good is a pleasant, then every pleasure, however uh, little desirable, has, of course, this, uh, the root of the matter being pleasure in itself. Uh, this, is, uh, in, uh, this becomes decisive later on. Now, go on. Then, are the beneficial ones good and the harmful ones bad? Either those beneficial, beneficial which do some good and those evil which do some evil. I agree. Yeah, beneficial is not, uh, is not the right translation. I would translate useful. Because if the pleasant is a good, if the only good is a pleasant, then, of, then there can be... Uh, no, I'm sorry. I began at the wrong end. And let us first finish that section, and then I will explain it. Let us say useful. <laughs> good. And and for those useful which do some good, and those evil which do some evil. I agree. Now, are these the sort you mean? For instance, in the body, the pleasures of eating and drinking that we mentioned a moment ago. Then, pleasures of this sort which produce health in the body or strength or any other bodily excess. Are these good, and those which have the opposite effect bad? Certainly. And similarly, in the case of pain, is there some worthy and some lame? Of course. So it is the worthy pleasures and pain that we ought to choose in all our doings. Certainly. And the base ones not. Clearly so. Because you know, Homeless and I, if you recollect, decided that everything we do should be for the sake of what is good. Do you agree with us in this view? that the good is the end of all our actions, and it is for its sake that all other things should be done and not it for theirs. Do you add your vote to ours and make a third? No. Then it is for the sake of what is good that we should do everything, including what is blessed, not the good for the sake of the blessed. Certainly. Now, it is in every man's power to pick out which sort of blessed thing is good and which bad or is professional skill required in each case? Yeah, literally a technicos. A, te a technicos is needed. A man possessing a techni, an art, is needed for that. Now let us see that since pleasures may be bad, we cannot take our bearings by the pleasures, but only by the good. An example of the good is distinguished from the pleasant is here given health and the other virtues or excellences of the body. No such uh, examples were given in the previous argument. Pleasures, we may say, are as such are never good, strictly speaking. 
they can only be useful for the good. And nor can any pleasures as such be simply bad. They, they are harmful because they, do not, they prevent our getting the pleasant. Good are the excellences of the body, and we can say already, um, anticipating what comes, the virtues or excellence of the soul, as the, and as distinguished from the best. Now, Caligus does not even try, as one could, to give an account of the distinction between preferable and non-preferable pleasures in terms of pleasure on hedonistic grounds. In brief, the so-called what uh, Bantam called later on the felicific calculus. You, those pleasures are to be rejected, which are so much uh, connected with pain that you the total result is more pain, uh, is an excess of pain over pleasure. This is not an invention of Bantam. Uh, this whole thought is developed at great length in the Platonic dialogue Protagoras where uh, Sugaris leads Protagoras to uh, a somewhat uh, decent view by uh, this kind of uh, hedonistic calculus. Caligus is not smart enough to try that, and he abandons the hedonistic position. He agrees now with what Socrates and Polos had agreed upon. Socrates Polos and Caligus form now a triad from which poor old Gorgias is excluded. Uh, whether he would not still maintain a hedonistic position proper, uh, we is uh, left to our guess. Yet the subject of the agreement between Socrates and Polos was different. Socrates and Polos had agreed as to this, that all acts, all doings of men, are indifferent, for example, killing, you remember that, and become good or bad only if they are conducive to our, our happiness. Uh, here the question is now extended, what was said to be true regarding actions is now said to be true also of pleasures and pains. In brief, pleasures and pains have the status of means means which have to be judged with a view to the, whether they are conducive to the end. Apollos, however, does not protest against this interpretation of the agreement between him and Socrates. Polos has been rendered tame a long time ago and uh, is, uh, is required. You will see, would see, if you would look at the Greeks, that there is a, 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 the following slight uh, change of expression. Socrates says, in, in some cases, we do the, or we choose the pleasant things for the sake of the good things, in the plural, or for the sake of the good, in the singular. Bonorum causa or boni causa, which does make uh, quite a difference. And for the sake of the good, in the singular, occurs, of course, in the center, because that's the point. And here occurs also the term, the end, which came out in the translation, the end of all the actions is a good. This, as God says, and he may be right, is the first occurrence of this term of utmost importance in Greek literature. Of course, that presupposes that the Gorgias was written uh, before these and these other dialogues, and so on. Good. Now, that is, so we have now reached perfect clarity about that. The good is to prefer to the pleasant. And we have, it, we have now some notion of what the good is, the excellences of men, of human nature. And the pleasant or painful has to be chosen or rejected with a view to the good. And it is never chosen for the good's own sake. Um, good. Now let us uh, continue. Then let us recall those former points that we put into focus in Georgia. You see, uh, now Sugaris brings in what preceded his agreement with Polos. What was said first to Gorgias and to Polos 
presupposes what was said afterward. Naturally, because the whole dialogue is an ascent from the derivative to the principle. Regarding this point, however, which he mentions now, there was no agreement between Sogades on the one hand and Polos and Gorgias on the other. Whereas there was an agreement regarding the second, the first mentioned point between Sogades and Polos. Now go on. I said, if you remember, that there were certain industries, some of which extend only to pleasure, procuring that and so forth. The nature is that that which works. For others know what is good and what bad. And I place among those that are concerned with pleasure the man, not art of poetry. And among those concerned with good, the art of medicine. Now, let me stop here for one moment. Now, he reminds Caribes uh, now of the distinction, which I'm sure you all remember, between a mere uh, a routine and an art. But he mentions here only two examples. The art is medicine, and the routine is cooking. It is of some interest to observe that the Greek word is, I don't know how to bring it out in English, used for cooking here is not the one used in the long speech. The Greek word is magairike, and what was used in the long speech is opsopoia. One could perhaps bring out the translation as follows. Cooking here, generally, and the other term, something like fine cooking, concerned only with, with tickling the palate. Huh? Yeah, yes, you can put it this way. Yeah. Here this uh, gourmet I think is absent from here. Now regarding the term, uh, this kind of cooking which is mentioned here, that we can see from other platonic dialogues, is admitted by him to be an art. So there can be an art which leads to pleasure. It can be, do you remember we had discussed it at the time, that there could not be arts leading up to pleasure, genuine arts. Uh, we, see, we will develop this more fully later. Yes. Now, in the, by the sanctity of friendship, Calendly. Yeah, well, by the God of friendship, meaning Zeus, the God of friendship, yes. Do not of your heart indulge in jesting with me, or give, give me random answers against your conviction. Or again, take what I say as though I were jesting. For you see that our debate is upon a question which has the highest conceivable claims to the serious interest, even of a person who has but little intelligence, namely what course of life is best. Well, yeah, literally, uh, in which manner one should live. Yeah. Whether it should be that to which you invite me, with all those manly pursuits of speaking in assembly and practicing rhetoric and going into politics after the fashion of you modern politicians, or this life of philosophy, and what makes the difference between these two? Perhaps it is best to do what I attempted to find in the and distinguish them. And then, when we have distinguished them, we have come to an agreement with each other as to these lives being really two, we must consider what is the difference between them, and which of them is the one we ought to live. I dare say you should not get grasped by me. Well, let us stop here for a moment. Now, so when I speak here, what's the meaning and purpose of the discussion is? The question regarding the order of rank between the pleasant and the good concerns the order of rank of the present political life and the life spent in philosophizing. More precisely, not the order of rank of the two ways of life, but an either or between them. Either the good has to be preferred to the pleasant, the philosophic life for us, or the present to be preferred to the good, the present political life follows. The present means, of course, Athenian democracy. In the eighth book of the Republic, in his very nasty critique of democracy, Plato presents democracy as uh, 
democratic freedom as freedom for all desires, for all nations. And this is the point. But of course it is not yet clear whether there are truly such two lives. We know now that, or in a way we know, that the good is different from the blessing, but that the good fully developed is a philosophic life. And the pleasant, fully developed, is a present political life. This we do not yet know. That is up to now only an assertion. You see also here that rhetoric is here presented as clearly and unambiguously belonging to the political life, i.e. having nothing, no place in the philosophic life. You see also that Socrates, Calicles calls Socrates to the political life. Socrates does not claim here that he calls Caricles to the philosophic life. Let us keep this in mind. Yes, now let us go on. No, I do not. Well, I will put it to you more plainly. Seeing that we have agreed, you and I, that there is such a thing as good and such a thing as pleasant, and that the pleasant is other than the good, and that for the acquisition of life that there is a certain practice the quest of the pleasant in the one case, and that of the world in the other. But first, you must either accept or object to this statement. Do you accept? Now, it has not been agreed upon between Socrates on the one hand and Poros and Gorgias on the other that the good is different from the pleasant and the consequence from them. It has been agreed upon now between Socrates and Calipers. Now, this follows indeed this consequence that there are two different pursuits, follows from the difference between the good and pleasant, not simply, but only conditionally. Let us assume that the good is different from the pleasant. Does it follow that the pursuit of the good is radically different from the pursuit of the pleasant? Does this necessarily follow? No, uh, only it follows, uh, if the good and the pleasant are indissolubly linked with each other, it does not follow. If you cannot pursue a specific good, say health, without pursuing at the same time the pleasure going with health, derivative from health, the pleasant feeling coming from being healthy, then there cannot be two pursuits. It is one. It's the same pursuit, of course. This is not, uh, this is the implied. Now let us go on. I am with you in fact. Then try and come to a definite agreement with me of what I was saying to our parents. And see if you now find that what I then said was true. I was saying, I think, that the cookery thing... Here now is the, the, the term used before. Yeah. The gourmet cooking, as you call it. Gourmet cooking seems to be made not as art, but as routine, unlike medicine, which I argue has investigated the nature of the person who she treats and the cause of her proceedings. And yeah, not the nature of the person. That is already an interpretation, a good interpretation, but not a literal translation. The, uh, which, uh, medicine has considered the nature of that which it tends, that can very well be the body simply, but it can also be, uh, uh, because of the peculiar character of Greek grammar, it can also be the, the man whom it tends, the individual, yes. And to some account to give of each of these things, so tremendous, where is the other? in respect to the pleasures of which her own administration is given, goes to work there in an utterly inartistic manner, without having investigated at all either the nature or the cause of pleasure, and altogether irrationally, with no thought or necessity of differentiation, relying on routines and characters for merely preserving the memory of what is wont to result. And that is how she is enabled to provide her pleasure. Yes. Now, medicine being an art, 
considers the nature of the thing which he tempts, but also the, uh, he considers the nature of the individual human being whom he tempts. Now, if this is important for an art, that it considers the individual, yeah, it's like the shoemaker makes a shoe for this individual, makes doesn't make shoes in general, then it might follow that an art which does not consider the individuals is not an art, properly speaking. And of course, rhetoric, public rhetoric, addressed to multitudes could not be an art for this reason. I mentioned this only in passing. But cooking <coughs> is not an art because he does not consider the nature, he doesn't say the nature of the body. He says because he doesn't consider the nature of pleasure. Now let us assume there is a pursuit concerned with production of pleasure but has studied the nature of pleasure, would this not be, could this not be an art? We must see. There is a considerable difference between Sovereign's speech toward Polos and this, this re recapitulation of this speech. The references to nature, these clear references, are absent from the long speech, naturally. Because in the meantime, something has happened. Callicles has appeared. Callicles has brought up philosophy and the whole question of nature in contradistinction to convention. Callicles is philosophically more radical than Apollos and Gorgias. Nevertheless, and that is the paradoxy of Callicles, he is less rational than Polos and Gorgias are. This can happen. Even today you can find people who are more philosophically radical and yet less rational than others. And, and why is this? So why is Calidus more radical? Because he is opposed to the Socratic way of life. Whereas Polos and Gorgias exist in a kind of in-between region between philosophy and politics, that the whole issue does not come out. Now, uh, Mr. Martin, one minute. Yes, but if there is something in the nature of the death, it's not that the nature cannot ever be in the right. Yes, sure. We will come to that, but there is a question regarding the nevertheless, We will come to that. That is, uh, yeah, we will come. Uh, only this consideration is a part of the argument as it will come out very soon. Sure. Good. Um, but in another respect, I, I should have mentioned that, and that was the reason why I thought of it. Sometimes uh, uh, one forgets the most important things uh, because one has said them too often. Now, what was the highest art in the original scheme, may I ask? You remember the proportion? Pardon? No, no. This you really should know by heart. What did you say? Legislative art. What does the legislative art produce? Yeah. Pardon? No, no. The legislative art produces health of the soul like gymnastics, but he produces it through laws. Laws are general, do not deal with the individuals. And there is a great question whether laws, because of their generality, are not radically defective. This is developed at great length in Plato's statesman, but the thought is, uh, of course, already here. Yeah. Should the higher art be less difficult? The higher art. I think it should be, but where is I didn't imply anything of the kind. How? Let me go back. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, according to that scheme, because the gymnastics is higher than medicine. Which is necessarily led by a slave. 
Yeah, sure. That is it. Perhaps this is a reason why now we are in the process of legislation that is ready to be uh, replaced by other art that's got ready. And therefore, I emphasize the fact that the arts here that you mentioned are only medicine and uh, it's uh, the cooking, or the, the sham art, and not the others. Plato revises that. I mean, generally speaking, all recapitulations, all repetitions occurring in a Platonic work are never identical. Sometimes the, the differences are uh, almost invisible, but they are always different. And this is, of course, a major difference. Yes. Now, uh, let, me, let us go on where we left off. Now, considering first, what do you think that this account is satisfactory, and that there are certain other such occupations likewise, having to do with the soul? With the soul? Hitherto, we have spoken only of such arts or sham arts dealing with the body. Yes. Some artistic with more. Yeah, what does artistic mean? Uh, that has so, uh, in our language, it means it belong to the fine arts. That is, of course, not meant. Technical would be a literal, but perhaps not intelligent sensation. Uh, it's those of an art character or something like that. An artistic one, one must keep away the notion of fine arts completely. Shoemaker is also a. Uh, Artful has the other implication of being sly. Therefore, I think I would not take that. Yes? Good. With forethought for what is to the soul's best advantage, and others make it lighter. But again, as in the former case, considering merely the soul's pleasure, and how it may be deprived for her, neither requiring which of the pleasures to the battle for a person, nor caring for all regarding the soul is not specified. I repeat, in the long speech to addressed to Polos, it had been called uh, legislative art plus justice, in the sense of uh, 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 punitive justice. And the plaparies were called sophistry and rhetoric. You remember that? In here we have one difficulty uh, which I don't know whether it came out clearly in the translation in C, when he says, I call everything which uh, um, is only concerned with pleasure, regarding body or soul or anything else. Now, what can there be apart from body and soul? And which, which way you can speak of flattering or gratifying? Yes, indeed. And that and the uniform, that theme is developed. That a kind of vulgar piety which is not but flattering the God that this would also not be an art. Sure, that's correct. Um, yes. Now uh, what does Caracas reply to this uh, fairly long speech of Socrates? No, no. I agree with you. In order that your arguments may reach a conclusion and that I may gratify your so You see, they speak of gratification and he gratifies in this very uh, gorgeous without telling us whether he does this merely in order to please gorgeous, to give pleasure to him, or whether he has gorgeous good in mind. Um, yes. And, uh, but it is clear. Was this a passage which you had in mind, Mr. Senator, last time? No, all right. Let me come to that. Good. Go on. And is this the case? And is this the case with 
Now, the Socrates uh, discusses here those pursuits which aim only at pleasure and are wholly disregarding the good. And to our great surprise, he doesn't mention rhetoric here, but he mentions, uh, uh, let us say, poetry, music. He does not mention also sophistry, the other thing which he has mentioned. But why does he not mention sophistry? That is a special case. Yes. No, no, that's not the point. That was said to please, according to the argument uh, toward Polos, it was that sophistry is also concerned with pleasing only. No, because the sophist is sophist. Uh, instructs privately, does not address multitudes, and uh, therefore the sophistry is omitted. Now, he mentions here seven things. Yes. Yes, yeah, sure. Objection is frequently made. Uh, Dodds makes the following remark, which I thought I should read you. The modern reader may well be started to find Plato speaking of Attic tragedy in terms now comes that a bishop might use in discussing the dangers of commercial television. <laughs> But I think he could even say there were, I suppose, some bishops, and I hope there still are some, who would make similar remarks about poetry. Uh, that is uh, possible. Before we take this up, let me let's first try to understand myself. Now, there are seven items. And we, one thing we must always do in Plato, count. You know, Plato is said, uh, said no one who has that not studied mathematics. May, may enter his academy. And uh, uh, the uh, simplest part of mathematics is simple counting, of course. Now, counting and by counting, I mean stupidly counting. Uh, uh, if the same item occurs twice, it will be counted twice. Now, let us count. Flute playing, uh, uh, harp playing in contests, choruses, dithyrambs, all are playing, i.e. not only in, in, in contents, again difference, and seven, tragedy. He begins with flute playing, an art or semi-art without speech, as you can easily see uh, that it is impossible to play flute and speak at the same time, as impossible as to drink and sing literally at the same time. That's what's important. So this is a, it's a silent art. I know in other sense, of course, not silent. Uh, and in addition, as uh, the old commentator Olympiodorus says, an art which can influence also irrational animals. <laughs> they are not affected by tragedy, but they can, are affected by this simple shepherd's music. And of these seven items which he mentions in the center is dithyrambs. Now, why, why, why does he put that in the center? I consult the other Platonic dialogues. In the Republic 394c, uh, dithyrambs are used as the example, the sole example, of non-dialogic poetry. Drama is, of course, dialogic non dialogic poetry. And you know, it is a particular kind of lyrical poetry, of course. And in Law 700b, it is called the work of Dionysus, the word of mine. This is somewhat, is quite interesting, because uh, Dionysus uh, can be said to be uh, 
abstracted from both in the Republic and in the Gorgeous. And perhaps that is some of the keys to the work because uh, what is, uh, there is an art of witty culture, an art called so by Plato or elsewhere, which produces wine. Now what is the function of wine drinking? Of course it can, it can be used um, by, um, for med medicinal purposes, but this is, a, how shall I say, not the most natural use of wine. It has to be done. Yeah, but then one drinks wine as one would take a pill. That is not, you know, we drink wine, we use wine for our enjoyment without any question. The wine may gladdens men's heart, as the promise says. And that's, it, and that's pleasure. So the art of viticulture is surely one art which is in the service of pleasure, which doesn't mean that it must be used in the service of the dissolute life. That is a different proposition. Aristotle, at the end of the politics, uh, condemns the dissonance as orgiastic. That is also perhaps not uninteresting. So uh, you see, you would also see that first he qualifies the uh, harp playing and dithyrambs to be rejected, but then the qualifications are dropped in when, when they are when they are repeated. Uh, um, yes, the non. Uh, you see, also when he speaks of tragedy, which is of course by far the gravest case, as we were reminded, we have to think not only of Euripides, who has been quoted here more than once, but of Aeschylus and Sophocles too. How can a man in his senses say that about the Antigone? That's your symbol. At first glance, you are absolutely right. Uh, absolutely right. Now, here in this connection, uh, what does he say about uh, about the non-flattery? Uh, uh, let us read again the section on tragedy. Then what is the purpose that is inspired our state in wonderful tragic poetry? Are her endeavor and purpose to your mind merely for the gratification of the spectators? Or does she strive hard if there be anything pleasant and gratifying with that that unsaid, and if there be anything unpleasant to the beneficial, both to speak and think back, whether they enjoy it or not. Yeah, in other words, a, a, a good poetry, if there is one, uh, or a good rhetoric, would not be frank, or to use a favorite expression of our age, it would not be sincere, because it would conceal the pleasantness of vice. And that is in the end, whereas uh, Plato, is, or so it is, says, the poets, especially the tragic poets, do not do that. In order to prepare an answer, we, uh, we let us read a somewhat later passage. We, we uh, will, uh, uh, no, let us continue and uh, discuss it in detail next time. Read uh, where we left off. Well, now, that kind of thing, Captain did we say just now is my view? Certainly. Pray, if we strip any kind of poetry of its melody, its rhythm, and its meter, we get mere speeches as the residue of the That must be so. And those speeches are spoken to a great crowd of people. Yes. <coughs> poetry is the kind of public speaking. Uh, yeah, of rhetoric, yeah. Yeah, no, of public speaking, all right. Yes? Okay. Then it must be a rhetorical public speaking, or do you not think that the poets use rhetoric in the sense? So in other words, you see what he meant all the time, and speaking of poetry, was of course rhetoric in general, of which poetry appears here to be a part. Yes. Come so now, we have found the kind of rhetoric that dresses such a public that is compounded with children, and slaves as well as free, an art that we do not quite approve of since we call it a flattery art. Be sure. Very well. And now, the rhetoric addressed to the Athenian people, or to the other. Yes, the D 
demos, yeah, the demos, I mean, let's say, in a political capacity. Yes. What do the other attempts in the free and the various cities? What do we make of that? You know, here you have it. Why rhetoric is higher than poetry? Rhetoric addresses only free men. Free men. Grown up men, citizens. Whereas poetry addresses an indiscriminate crowd consisting of men and women, grown ups and children. Free men and slaves. Therefore, rhetoric is high. Since that can be very nasty. Um, uh, that is the point why, even on the surface, as I mentioned before in my introduction to today's lecture, the overall impression you get when you look at the work of Plato that rhetoric has a better faith than poetry. While rhetoric is, as it seems, debunked in the gorgeous. It is rehabilitated and more than rehabilitated in the bedroom. There is no rehabilitation of poetry equally visible anywhere else. And the reason is here stated. It is, of course, an extremely crude reason, as uh, most of us would say, as well, all of us, as a matter of fact. But still, there is something to that. What is the highest art or knowledge, according to Plato? Philosophy. Now, whom does philosophy as philosophy address? We got an inkling here when, he, uh, when Socrates gave the, a description of the conditions men must fulfill in order to engage properly in a philosophic discussion. You remember? Uh, knowledge uh, and, and some other qualities too were mentioned there. Now, philosophy, in other words, addresses only a small part of the demos. Rhetoric addresses the demos. Poetry addresses indiscriminately all human beings. It's a clear hierarchy. Makes sense. But to come back to uh, the question, how can we understand Plato's apparently uh, atrocious judgment of poetry? How can we understand that? It surely, we have one sure starting point. For Plato, the highest human pursuit is philosophy. That is the to say. So, and we can understand his judgment on poetry only if we remember the supremacy of poetry. Oh, of philosophy, I'm sorry, of philosophy. Yes. It is more. Yes, so, uh, but uh, that is very true. But uh, therefore, but still, if it, we take literally what you say, it means it was a kind of vulgar rivalry between Plato and, say, Sophocles, yeah? and he wanted to get at his enemy. Yes, yes. Yeah, well, this is, of course, a long question, whether such people like uh, Euripides or Shakespeare could not have given uh, articulate accounts of what they meant by, say, by, the Hamlet, by Hamlet or Tempest or whatever you take. That we, we do not know, they did not deign to write such books. But uh, one could say a man who could write these, these uh, plays was surely able uh, um, articulately to say, uh, for example, why he chose this subject matter, Hamlet, and why he uh, made these, these uh, deviations from the old accounts in, I forgot now the name of the source which he used. Yeah. 
You know where there was a source from there. And uh, why he deviated this change, added this, uh, subtracted that. I have no doubt that they can do that. I mean, in other words, I don't believe that this notion which Plato sometimes presents that the poets are simply vessels of inspiration by the muses, and they don't know what they do, uh, is uh, true, and even is meant to be true by Plato. Yes? no doubt about that. But we, we must first try to understand Plato's critique of poetry in order to see why and or even whether the philosopher needs poetry. Yes? Is it true that the subjects which you say of poets are antithetical to the type of life at least in philosophy? Or is it the fight over the crown of the crown of England? Like Shakespeare, whereas uh, and, and, uh, whereas Larry, the subject of sitting down thinking about uh, uh, forms, which is like the man often for subjects like that, never would have been a poet. The poet subject. Yeah, but must must a man who presents his exciting stories between Lancaster and York not think about civil society? and war and peace in the way in which a philosopher must think about it. Miss Venning, is here? Yes, but do the poets not go beyond that? I mean, must you not over... Yeah, but that is also a question. I mean, when you have been shaken by a great work of art, then I think the true understanding begins afterwards. And not only of the techniques used by the poet, which would be the least interesting, but of what this shaking implies. things to this effect somewhere in the second book of the laws, but I would not, I would take a much broader view, and that is take the most extreme statement of Plato on poetry, and that occurred against poetry, and that occurs in the tenth book of the Republic. It goes much beyond what we read here, and what we read in the second and third book of the Republic. Now, what does he say there? No. That is not the theme of, of book 10. Oh. That's the theme of book 2 and 3. And uh, no, but uh, what he does here is this. He makes the following tripartition. The truths, the true thing, and that he calls the idea. And then, say, the idea of a bed. That's one of the examples he uses. This, of course, is an object of the philosopher. And then there is the, what we, in our folly, call the true bed, that which is the carpenter makes. Yeah? So, the carpenter, this is a visible bed, but a true bed. And then we find someone who paints a bed, the painter. And you cannot even rest on that bed which he paints. And therefore, the art of the carpenter, or for that matter, of the shoemaker, because, as you know, one can also paint shoes, although I believe the Greeks didn't do it, but some modern chemists did. 
And uh, then you have, uh, yeah, let's say the imitating artist, whether that is painting or music or poetry, it doesn't make it fundamental. Huh? According to, yeah, but here it is an imitation of an imitation, and therefore it is very low. The ordinary arts, which, which are very humble and unpretentious, are infinitely higher than these arts of Sophocles and Pindar and uh, uh, Phidias. Is that what he said? Yes. Yeah, no, that, that we, let me continue here. It is, uh, that subject comes in somehow, but not perhaps in the, exactly the way in which you say. Good. Now the question is, this is obviously at first hearing nonsense, that the poets are imitators of imitators. How could, from which point of view, can it appear to make some sense? Then we would have first to identify the artisans or artists whom the poets imitate. Whom do the poets imitate? Who, no, of course, human art. But we have already a more precise formulation of the question. Which artists or artisans do they imitate? The greatest enemy of Plato that ever was was Nietzsche. And Nietzsche says more than once, the poets have always been the ballads of a morality. Of a, of a morality. That is exactly what Plato means. The artists or artisans whom the poets imitate are the legislators. Legislators, now in the full sense and not in the narrow sense in which we use it today, the, those who set up the quote values unquote of society. The, all poets mold what they uh, present on these things. When Homer presents the heroic Achilles, and on the other hand, uh, Odysseus, these are he follows standards. Of, of on one hand this Achillean kind of heroism, and then of the very different kind of Odyssean heroism, which were accepted by this Greek nobility, and uh, uh, that, that is that. And they, now, what the implication is this, what the legislators in this radical sense is uh, set up is never it's only one view, a one-sided view peculiar to this particular society, and uh, in addition, not the highest view. The symbol, what is the symbol proof? Is there any tragedy ever in which a philosopher is presented, a wise man? Is there any? Do you know of any? In which a wise man is presented? Faust. Faust is not a wise man. See what he does. I mean, he is a professor, but dissatisfied, he believes to be wise. He says, I have studied everything. It's not wisdom. He learns the rudiments of wisdom the very hard way at the end of the book. Do you know that? First. Yeah, but still, that uh, he, that is a kind of wisdom. But then I would take you to refer to Father Bourne and uh, what Vico says about this kind of wisdom. That is, uh, surely there is a, is a relatively wise man, but only relatively. Prometheus is of course not wise. You only have to read the Prometheus to see that he is not wise. He is a he is a great inventor, sure. Uh, almost the man who could have built an atomic bomb if uh, technology had been advanced. But as he shows in the play himself, 
any, uh, he is very soft-hearted and is completely unable to withstand these uh, soft-hearted uh, things instead of acting to devise it. Yes? Aha! That's a different story. But uh, incidentally, there is one great case of a presentation of a wise man, but that is not a tragedy. Yeah, I think it would have to be called a comedy, uh, in, in, uh, although it doesn't look like a comedy, and that's Shakespeare's standards. Prospero is a wise man, there's no question. But that is not a tragedy. But, in, but uh, Shakespeare is also a, a modern poet, not a classical poet. In comedy, they occur, and naturally so, because, uh, to take the famous story of the first philosopher, Thales, who studied the stars and fell in a ditch. Well, look at that. That's extremely funny, isn't it? And the philosophers are funny people in this sense. And therefore, they, but you must also admit in a comedy, the virtue of philosophy, virtue of philosophy doesn't come out. Only the side from which they are legitimate objects of laughter. Not the true side. In brief, <clears throat> the poet of poets cannot present the highest human possibility. And therefore, what do they present? They present all ways of life except the highest. Oh, uh, say, the hero, uh, the lover, and so on. Uh, if they present ways of life which either have no way out, no way out, tragedy, or an inept way out, comic. Simply stated, this kind of poetry, what, what, what we call poetry, would have to be called, uh, from Plato's point of view, autonomous poetry. Autonomous poetry believes that the non-philosophic life is self-sufficient, autonomous. If this is untrue, that the non-philosophic life, that is the premise of that, then the only kind of poetry which is good is ministerial poetry. Poetry which serves philosophy, poetry which presents the philosophic life. And that is, of course, the Platonic dialogue. These are works of art, even externally, you see that they have something in common with tragedies or with comedies. Uh, but they are in prose. These uh, 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 questionable. Uh, adornments and charms, meter and so on, are scrupulously avoided. So Plato, I think Plato expresses in a, in a shocking manner, surely shocking, something which is not shocking at all. That Plato had a very high admiration, especially for Homer, appears from very clear utterance which Lewis makes in this connection, of course, he pro I would assume this, that uh, Socrates probably admired Euripides more than Aeschylus and Sophocles. Uh, there is some external evidence uh, this view, and that is not so easy for us to understand, uh, because uh, we, uh, for us, uh, on the whole, Aeschylus and Sophocles are more impressive than Euripides is, but uh, this is a long story. Yes. Like what art? Yeah. Yeah, but the trouble is that Khrushchev's side or, or Stalin's side or Lenin's sides for that matter, or Marx's side. We are not high enough. They said this, they, that is what Plato does provisionally in the second and third book of the Republic, where he presents, where he judges poetry 
from the point of view of the needs of a good city. Yeah? And this he leaves far behind in the tenth book, where he judges poetry from the point of view of philosophy. By the way, the first consideration, the, uh, considering art from the point of view of city or morality, that's for Plato the same thing, is of course not a wholly arbitrary and unnecessary thing. Uh, by no means. I mean, the kind of thing which you are offered to you today frequently, uh, which uh, are, uh, give a very powerful uh, uh, presentation of emotions. They're powerful. I don't wish to mention any names, but I have read uh, some of these things, uh, and they have uh, good. But one must also say uh, a very narrow men. Very narrow men, they know they are the slaves of these kind of passions with which one can have compassion. They can even incite possibly to plausible social action. I even would not admit that, but this, I wouldn't sit at the feet of these men, and I would not advise any congressman to sit at their feet. Pardon? Plato would admit that. That this could be. Plato goes even further. You one has to read it very carefully, and because one has also to read the laws, where the same problem is discussed in the second book, and in some respects more uh, fully than in the second and third book of the Third Republic. Now one can state Plato's view as follows. On the one hand, the, the poets have to remain within the limits of decency. Yeah, absolutely. I suggested when this question of, of, of uh, uh, how is this called, obscenities, come in present day poetry, I suggested to a friend of mine who's a public lawyer that he should uh, try to convince the nine Supreme Court judges, the men fed by the United States for the purpose of solving difficult questions, not easy questions, how to draw the line by having a summer seminar on the Shakespearean plays, and in which there are some obscenities, as you know, but simply consider the quantitative relation of the obscene passages to the non-obscene, but that would be of some help, perhaps, for forming their judgments. In order that one doesn't have to take the most narrow Victorian view, doesn't have to, although very many great things were done in times of very strict rules, like French classical poetry, yeah. drama, uh, both uh, poetry, uh, well, both uh, comedy and tragedy. But I can't. That is perhaps a somewhat narrow circumscription. But there are some limits, I would guess. <laughs> and uh, Plato has reminded us of these limits more severely than any other philosopher. That's all. And, uh, but uh, the other point, no, to, to what Plato, in addition, Plato never meant in his, so, what one can call, in these passages which foreshadow uh, Racine or Molière, yeah. the classicist, yeah. he never, of course, suggested edifying trash. He makes it perfectly clear that these poems which have to be come in his best city must be poetic. And the quality of decency is not identical with the quality of poetic. He makes this 100% clear, number one. Number two, what he says is this, in, but being decent means exactly to that extent obey the legislator, not in the sense of what this particular Congress says now, you know. The uh, remain within the highest realm within the highest values of the society, as they would call it today, and always be mindful of them, and never write something which one could say conveys the message that life is gut. 
better. Yeah? <laughs> Which can easily be done by a sufficiently gifted and clever man without making clear that before you have made, that you cannot sense that life is scattered. If you have not sensed in the first place purity, you cannot, as it were, feel the stench if you have not felt in the first place fresh air. Now, if a, if a so called poet gives us the gutter without giving us that which he must have had in order to sense the gutter, then he is most insincere because he suppresses his fundamental insight which is the bottom of everything else. You see, uh, there was a famous case of Madame Bovary, 100 years ago, roughly 100 years ago, uh, a story of adultery, uh, with all kinds of, of scenes which one should surely not uh, show uh, to children. Uh, there was a trial, and it was, uh, and Flaubert was, of course, a somewhat different man than some uh, novelists of our age, and uh, Flaubert had one very simple uh, excuse which would be sufficient for Buddy Morality. He showed the terrible misery of Madame Bovary. Surely that was not his only purpose. He wanted to show more than that. But there was no recommendation in any way uh, of, uh, of, of adultery. It does make, I believe, a difference. And also when Shakespeare presents uh, 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 grave political crimes, none of these plays can be construed as a recommendation of these political crimes. I believe that th that is the reason why I was so pleased when I came to this country and when I saw these simple Western movies. And they have, surely, they are not high art. But one thing which was in Shakespeare, where, ever, where was in Shakespeare ever the criminal? as the last word. Yeah? It's always a victory of the decent cause. This thing is, I believe, uh, uh, completely forgotten. You know, the, the, we, we have, to, our uh, approach to so-called art is abstract because we forget the context in which it appears. And whatever must be said against the communists, many things have to be said against them. But in a way, they, uh, have you ever read the critique they made of Pasternak? Of Pasternak's uh, book? I, I happen to read that. Uh, and these were, I believe these were crooks who wrote this critique, you know, just uh, low-class fellows. But the arguments which they have regarding an crucial point is such that Pasternak would be unable to answer it because of the isolation of art from its function, as I say today, from the whole within which art exists. I believe this is, one must really remind us of, that Plato's statement about art is atrocious, is true, but I can only add it is atrocious in his own eyes. He wants to, to make clear there is an either or. If poetry has occupied the highest place, then philosophy can at best occupy the second highest place, and that is a perversion. The true order is opposite. And this does not mean that professors of philosophy should get higher salaries than the authors of poetry. I hope uh, you don't misunderstand me in this way, because a professor of philosophy is not a philosopher, of course. No, I mean, not as such. And that is, uh, should be clear. Now, to come back to one point, when Plato says uh, that the poet must listen to the legislator, he also makes clear that the legislator must listen to the poet. Precisely be, who makes clear the character of the emotions and uh, the full force of them, their attractiveness, their dangerous attractiveness? Of course, the poet. So the, the a legislator who has not learned from the poets will be a poor legislator. That is also in Plato, but it is not as clearly visible as it is uh, as the other thing. Plato discusses somewhere in the sixth or seventh book of the, no, sixth book, I believe, of the laws, when he discusses the subject of uh, funerals, a subject which is with us, as you know, in a different way, uh, 
good. But at that time, it was not the funeral industry, but the simple thing that people, rich people, were very much concerned with having wonderful tombstones, and the poor try to keep up with the Joneses, this kind of thing. And uh, Plato uh, and, uh, yeah, describes that in a somewhat comical manner. And uh, so what's the legislator, how he should, to re he should regulate that? And in this context, he, uh, he brings up, say, a widow, a rich widow, uh, and, and, uh, and then uh, someone, a poor man. And as presented by the poet, they, the poet presenting these people and their feelings and their whole circumstances will make the legislator see better what would be the proper regulation of this relatively minor uh, 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 subject of legislation. So, uh, one, I mean, in other words, it is always dangerous to underestimate the intelligence and the breadth of Plato. And uh, Plato could, this poet of the first order, could afford to say things against poetry which no lesser man could afford. But I think we all should be grateful to him that uh, having this immense privilege, he employed it for uh, counteracting a charm which can be very dangerous. One does not have to fear that philosophy will ever exercise such a charm. Because philosophy does not have this kind of charm, I and mean, then, it then it's no longer philosophy, and it's a kind of propaganda. Uh, but uh, poetry does have this charm, and I think the greatest poets will be misunderstood, I believe, if one does not remember that which Plato uh, uh, told us. And first, one must go to the simple stage of simple-mindedness. Uh, which, uh, especially the second and third book of the Republic, present to us decent poetry, period. No indecent one. And uh, then, uh, when you go over the great literature of the past, I know that there are certain great works which are, from no point of view, decent. You think of Rabelais or of Aristophanes. But it is very interesting. These are then also books written for laughing. They are not written for seduction. That's a great difference. So this, I think it was good that we had this out. Yeah. <laughs> um, I believe it's no rather late. Oh, yes. Well, next time we will. Now, we are still concerned with Calicles. Calicles, I said, is on the one hand closer to Socrates than Polos and Gorgias. But on the other hand, he is more remote from Socrates than the two rhetoricians. He is closer to Socrates uh, because he is also an erotic man, which we may interpret a passionate man, serious, whereas Polos and Gorgias are, in a way, shilly shallying, um, mere gratification of the ear, play. That passion makes him more radical philosophically in his statements than the two rhetoricians were. It is Caricles who brings up the subject of physis, nature, and the distinction and even opposition between nature and convention. On the other hand, while Caricles is more remote from Socrates than the two rhetoricians are, because he is less a friend of logos, of speech, argument, than Polos and Gorgias. Without Gorgias' intervention, as we have seen, the conversation between Socrates and Caligris would have come to an end a long time ago. This intervention and its success shows indeed 
that Kalignes has a certain respect for logos. Kalignes, the politician, needs rhetoric. Gorgias is kind of rhetoric. But, of course, as ministerial to his, the politician's ends, not as the greatest good as Gorgias. The highest point to which the conversation between Socrates and Calicles has reached hitherto concerns the relation of the good and the pleasant. Sugaris makes it plausible that the good is fundamentally different from the pleasant and superior to it. He does not convince Calicles, however. The consequence of the distinction of the good and the pleasant is a distinction between art and flattery. Flattery being the human pursuits directed only towards the pleasant. And the example which we have seen again, medicine is an art, pastry cooking. I found out this is a word which they use for this uh, more subtle cooking, is a flattery. Now, this coordination of the distinction between the good and the pleasant, with the distinction between art and flattery, presupposes two things. First, that there cannot be arts directed toward pleasures. And second, that there cannot be arts which aim simultaneously at a specific good and at a pleasure, a specific pleasure, necessarily going with that good. In the long speech which Socrates had addressed to Poulos, the analogon to medicine on the one hand and pastry cooking on the other, regarding the soul, had been justice in the sense of punitive justice and rhetoric. We have to see, will Israel is going to repeat this in the Caliglis section. Last time we have seen only this much, that the analogon to pastry cooking is poetry and music. On the other hand, the core of poetry has proved to be rhetoric. So we are on our way towards the restatement of what had been said in the Polo section. I hope you remember all these, uh, this proportion which the is stated there, because otherwise it is not possible to follow the argument, especially the windings of the argument. Now, perhaps I put it here again at the platform. Body and soul. Gymnastics and medicine. Gymnastics builds up the body and medicine restores uh, uh, the body after it has been defective. And correspondingly here, the legislative art and what there is called justice, but which has always here the limited meaning of punitive justice. And now the flatteries. So gymnastics is cosmetics and to medicine is pastry cooking. And to the legislative art is sophistry and to justice is rhetoric. Uh, we, I hope you, I don't say, believe that you can read it, but this is uh, things which I made here are sufficient to remind you of something which you probably know by heart by now. Now let us then uh, go on where we left off last time. 502B9. Uh, I think that is in this long speech of Socrates, which we have uh, already read. No, this cannot be correct because we have uh, um, no, the, we have read that already. 
the core of poetry, it was said in um, 502, here, here. No, I think yeah, it's 502 B9, we should begin, where Callicles says in reply to Socrates, it is uh, manifest, this much is manifest, Socrates, that tragedy is directed to, uh, to a higher degree toward pleasure and to gratification of the spectators. I have mentioned the fact that here and in the preceding speech in 502a, Callicles addresses Socrates by name. Uh, this is a considerable change in the conversational situation. We have discussed that. Now let us go on from this point, Mr. Rankin. We have, I think, been all the way up to 502 yeah, but still, let us, let us, you know, I can, we can also, you are right, we can also leave it as summary. But so what it shows then in the immediate sequence is that the core of poetry consists of speeches and not of the musical and other things, stage directions, so, uh, of speeches which are addressed to a large crowd or demos. Poetry is then nothing but public rhetoric. Um, here we have another uh, remark by our commentator, which is, I believe is of some interest. Uh, here he notes this, the idea did not originate with Plato. Gorgias, the historical Gorgias, had already said that whole, I believe that the whole post poetry is speech, is metric speech, speech in meter. So, um, uh, good. Uh, it is also made clear by implication here that the status of rhetoric is hitherto at least not lower than that of tragedy. And tragedy, you must never forget, had a very high prestige, especially in Athens. But this will be changed very soon. Now let us begin at D5. Very well, Mr. Rankin. Did the orator strike you as speaking always with a view to what is best, with the single aim of making the citizens as good as possible by their speeches? Or are they, like the poets, set on gratifying the citizens? And do they, sacrificing the common weal to their own personal interests, behave to these assemblies as to children, trying merely to gratify them, nor care a job whether they will be better or worse consequences? Yes. Now, rhetoric proper, um, this was said in the preceding speech, which we have already read last time, uh, being addressed to free men only, and not also to women and children and slaves, um, uh, is higher than poetry. This, after the, we have been led to believe that rhetoric and poetry are more or less, have more or less the same status, we come now to the view that rhetoric is superior to poetry because it is addressed to a select audience, whereas poetry is directed to an all. Now, here then, in the speech which Mr. Rankin now read, the status of political rhetoric is under consideration. And here a new point of view occurs, which has not been mentioned before. Uh, the question is not only whether rhetoric is directed towards the good or the pleasant, so the good or the ple pleasure of the citizen, but also whether it is directed toward private gain of the orators or to the common good. Now, the alternatives would be, first, there might be a rhetoric directed towards the common good alone, in contradistinction to the private good of the orators, as well as to common or private pleasure. And secondly, 
A rhetoric which pleases the demons, is not, wants to gratify the demons, uh, not for selfish reasons, but out of sheer love for the demons. After all, that is thinkable, just as in private life, a lover might wish to gratify his beloved uh, unselfishly, so to speak, uh, without being concerned with his or her their well-being, why should this not be possible in rhetoric as well? This enlarges the problem of rhetoric considerably. Good. Um, now let us read a colleague's reply. This question of yours is not quite so simple, for there are some who have a regard for the citizens in the words that they utter, for there are also others of the sort that you mentioned. Now we have again a sincere answer of Calitas. He replies here not merely for the sake of gorgeous. And now, because he, he uh, Socrates has now touched on a point which is of vital interest to Caracas. Caracas takes now the side of the decent public spirited orator. Contrary to what he had implied in his long speech, which you will remember, about the true ombre. Um, now, what is uh, Caligula contradicts himself by taking here this relatively noble view, this relatively unselfish view. But what is the ground of the contradiction? Public spiritedness means, cons here in this case, concern with the co good of the city of Athens. And of course, with the city of Athens ordered democratically. It means, therefore, love for the Athenian demos, i.e. collective selfishness, right or wrong, my demos, right or wrong, my country. But the, um, <coughs> right, uh, yes, now, <coughs> the, uh, <coughs> once you admit the legitimacy of collective selfishness, there is no reason why you should not go on from there to admitting the legitimacy of private selfishness. Something doesn't become better by being more uh, widely spread. Um, and therefore, uh, as it is, the state problem is stated very clearly in Thucydides, the tyrant city Athens, the imperialistic city. And this leads to the tyrannical individual in Athens, like Alcibiades, or for that matter, the ancient Athenian tyrants. You see also the self-contradiction of Caligus when he spoke first of all desires should be gratified, and then only those desires which a gentleman may vow. And, the, uh, and furthermore, arrows for the demons and contempt for the demos, um, as uh, is indicated by his admiration for the superior individual. Um, you see that Callicles doesn't speak here of making the citizens better, as Soares had said, nor, on the other hand, of exploiting the citizens for one's own benefit, as would seem to be Calicus desire, but of caring for them. This caring is a kind of intermediate position which conceals the difficulty and the ultimate contradiction. So we, it is perfectly possible to give a picture of Calicus as a normal Athenian citizen. As we have seen when he said, for example, this uh, first statement, the better people should rule and should have more, as this can mean simply that the most intelligent and most energetic citizens should rule and have more honors than the other, which is perfectly a uh, defensible position. It can also mean that those in possession of political power by virtue of their virtue uh, should also be the wealthier people which, while not a very lofty view, is still a politically defensible view, at least in earlier times. So um, 
the calendar's view <coughs> has a certain plausibility, but it, the plausibility contains a contradiction. And if you analyze this position, you arrive on the one hand at the extreme Socratic view, and on the other hand at that extreme view which Caracles had stated at the very beginning. <coughs> the one point which I, to which I alluded in passing, uh, the public spiritless means devotion to Athens. And it means here in this particular situation a devotion to the Athenian democracy. Now, what is the relation between the devotion to Athens and the relation, uh, the, the loyalty to or devotion to democratic Athens? Well, I refer to the famous saying, right or wrong, my country. The country of which we speak in political context is never the bare country. For example, today, what does loyalty to this country, to the United States, mean? Of course, loyalty to the Constitution. A communist or fascist might claim that he is loyal to the, to the United States and to the people of the United States. He cares for them and therefore wishes to transform the United States into either a communist or fascist regime. But this would never be regarded today as loyalty. Loyalty is always loyalty to the country politically ordered, not to the bare country. Um, I trust that this is clear. There are sometimes loyalty discussions which do not make clear this complication. Uh, that is, one can say, the essence of politics, that whenever we find a political community, it isn't always a political community made what it is by the regime which it is. In the language of Aristotle, the mere matter, the hule, the country, the rivers, the, even the people as people, without any specification, as this is only the matter. It becomes a regime by the form. The form is the constitution, the regime, i.e., as I say today, the values. Uh, there is no regime which does not have a certain specific end to which it is dedicated. This is what they mean now by the value, my values. Uh, this, of course, we must, this is not here the theme, but it is always taken for granted. And since democracy is in a way under discussion here, we can, must uh, um, think of it all the time. Um, good. Now, what does Sobolis reply to that? That is enough for me. For if this thing also is twofold, one part of it, I presume, will be flattered as a base marble of assurance, while the other is noble. The endeavor, that is, to make the citizens' souls as good as possible, and the persistent effort to say what is best, whether it will prove more or less pleasant to one's hearers. But this is a rhetoric you never yet saw, or if you have any auditor at this time that you can mention without more ado, let me know who he is. Yes, now this what he said here, that the good, right kind of orator will be concerned that the souls of the citizens be as good as possible. This is surely familiar to many of you from the beginning of Aristotle's ethics, when he speaks of what the task of the true statesman is. There is no difference in this respect between Plato and Aristotle. Socrates admits now, for the first time, that there can be a noble rhetoric, a rhetoric which is an art. But this noble rhetoric does not exist. More precisely, it does not yet exist. It exists uh, to, the, uh, to some extent in Socrates, but nowhere else. That will be made completely later on. <coughs> when he says at the beginning that this 
too is twofold and not simple. When Kalina said, said, this is not simple what you ask, why does he say this too is twofold? Could this not also apply to poetry, of which we have spoken shortly before, that there is also an other kind of poetry, a poetry which is not, quote, theatrical, unquote, theatrical in the literal sense, presented to indiscriminate multitudes. Theoretically possible, it would seem. Good. Now let us uh, go on where we left off. No, upon my word, I cannot tell it with anyone, a beat among the orators of today. Well then, can you mention one among us those of older times who had brought the Athenians into rescue for any better that started at the time of his first arrival, as a change from the worst state in which he originally found them? For my part, I have no idea of the man is. Do you hear no mention of the Mysticles and what a good man he was? And Simon and Miltiades and the great Pericles who has died recently? I hope you have listened to yourself. Sugaris had mentioned, you will remember on an earlier occasion, that he still had heard Pericles speaking. Now Sugaris denies that there is or was a good Athenian orator, i.e. an orator who made the Athenians better at any time, but here the four great statesmen. And so this is now confronted with the most unpleasant task to debunk these glories of Athens. So this and Calidus now agree as to the necessity of the noble rhetoric. Noble, uh, th this is the basis of this disagreement. Kalike says, now these were orators who were not concerned with their private gain and not merely with gratifying their seniors. Noble rhetoric has to, is, is in one way, the same ground as base rhetoric. The overwhelming strength of the many, which we have seen that so has used that as an argument against Kalikles at the beginning of the criticism of Kalikles. You remember that? when he said that if the stronger, if the stronger are the better, then surely the many are the better. You remember that? They are surely the stronger. Since the, uh, given the overwhelming strength of the demons, they cannot be ruled by coercion, but only by speech. So we need rhetoric. And the question is then, what kind of rhetoric? Uh, Calibus enumerates here four statesmen, Themistocles, Cymon, Miltiades, and Pericles. On the whole, this follows the chronological order, except Miltiades. Miltiades is at the wrong place. It seems that when he came, Themistocles, Cymon, Pericles would be the proper order, and after having mentioned Cymon, he reminded himself of Cimon's father, Miltiades, with the consequence that he makes the son precede the father, whatever that may mean. One thing, however, is clear. The first and the last were leaders of the democracy, and the, those in the center leaders of the wealthy group, the oligarchs. Yes. Um, so, uh, so, so what is immediate task is now cut out for him. What about these few four glories of Athens? Were they true statesmen or were they also fakes? Nothing less than that is involved. You can imagine what, uh, what this, such a statement meant, means at any time. Now, how, uh, how do we go on from here? Yes, Galatine. If that which you spoke of just now is true virtue, the satisfaction of one's own and other men's design. But if that is... In other words, in that case, if this is virtue, then there would have been great states. Yeah? But if that is not so, and the truth is, as we were compelled to admit in the subsequent discussion, 
The only those desires which make men better by their satisfaction should be fulfilled, but those which make it worse should not. And that this is a special part, then I for one cannot tell you of any man so skilled having appeared among men. Yes. So the alternative is clear, either satisfaction, uh, indiscriminate satisfaction of desires, and the best statesman, or not indiscriminate satisfaction of desires, then they were not statesmen. In the first case, Sugar spoke of virtue, if this is virtue. In the second case, he speaks of techni, or art, not of virtue. Why, what is the meaning of the distinction here? After all, art and uh, uh, virtue and art are not apparently the same. Why does he use in the first case the expression virtue, in the second case the expression art? Well, virtue can have, can, can have the loose meaning of any excellence without uh, it necessarily implying knowledge The Socratic knowledge, understanding of virtue implies necessarily knowledge. Therefore, he speaks in the second case of art and not of virtue to make quite clear the intellectual cognitive element. These men were virtuous, excellent, surely, in a sense, quite obviously, but did they possess that kind of virtue? which is essentially knowledge, and so what it says not. But someone raised uh, his uh, hand there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of the students which preceded, which, uh, which uh, fell after characters to death and after the compliance of all, and a lot of the students which characters did, and it's not that they did all the the classes which were present, maybe they uh, did do something good. Yeah, what does future mean here? I mean, this notion that you have to think of an indefinite future, uh, that uh, was not a part even of Socrates' understanding of, uh, of wise statesmanship, you know? I mean, you always have to act on the basis of what you know and what you can know now. Or what do you mean? Yeah, well, uh, if it wasn't for uh, the mystics, maybe no theodicies, it may not have been the uh, East Nick and uh, uh, the Persian colony, and uh, it might have been a change, because we can't really say that these men are always there. Yeah, then one would, uh, that Suarez discusses that elsewhere in the laws in which he claims that the true defeat of the Persians was achieved by the land forces, i.e. by Miltiades, rather than by Themistocles. And the question, we cannot go into that. Let us leave it here as a statement of the question. Are the greatest, the admittedly greatest Athenian statesmen true statesmen, or are they a kind of fake? That's the question. And it depends on on uh, uh, the fundamental distinction of the good and the pleasant and its implications as stated before. You see here in um, that Sugaris at the beginning of this speech, when he said what you, what you Calicles, said before, he, said, he, is, he asserts that Calicles meant from the very beginning that the ruler must satisfy not only his own desires, but also the desires of the ruled. This contradicts, of course, the first impression everyone gets when reading Calicles' speech, where there is only the right of the stronger and uh, the, the, the weaker or the many are simply an object for the exploitation of the stronger. But Socrates knew quite well that this was an extreme statement of the one side in Calicles. And he, being and about to enter Athenian politics, he also had to have this other view. How Calicles uh, uh, solved his contradiction uh, is not a matter. He, of course, never solved it, and we know why. Because he would regard it as a disgraceful act of unmanliness 
to retract anything he asserts, as we have seen before. Um, let us go on here. Ah, but if you search properly, you will find one. Then let us just consider the matter properly, and see if any of them disappear from that skill. Come now, the good man who is intent in the best way he speaks will surely not speak at random in whatever he says, but with a view to some object. He is just like any other craftsman who, having his own particular work in view, selects the thing he applies to that work of his, not at random, but to the purpose of giving a certain form to whatever he is working upon. You have only to look, for example, at the painters, the builders, the shipwrights, or any of the other crafts, whichever you like, to see how each of them arranges everything according to a certain order, and forces one part to suit and fit with another, until it is combined the whole into a regular and well-ordered production. And so, of course, with all the other crafts, and the people we mentioned just now, who have to do with love, trade, Doctors. They too, I suppose, bring order and system into the Bible. Do we admit this to be the case or not? Now let us stop here. So we are, in order to find out the truth about the four statesmen mentioned, we need greater clarity than we hitherto have about what makes a statesman good. But the statesman is one of a class of beings. Here called craftsmen. And the Greek word demiogoi means people who work publicly, who work for the public, who work in the demos, demiogoi. Um, now, what makes any demiogos good? The good craftsman looks at his work with with a view to its acquiring a form in Greek idols. He puts what he works on into some order. He brings about harmony in what he works on by, uh, between the parts, harmony between the parts, by the use of force in, in, in uh, E7. Eight, eight, pros and This is true of all um, art, um, of all artisans. Socrates does here not say, as he says in other occasions, that the craftsman looks at the form. Think of the tenth book of the Republic. The carpenter looks at the form of the bed or the table, and then in imposes this form on the matter. The form is, according to this statement, only in the finished product. This has something to do with the famous doctrine of ideas. Here, Plato uses the key word, idols, form, idea, but he, he uses it in a different way. He does not assert here as he asserted in some of the so-called earlier dialogues, so they can't say he did not yet have his doctrine of idea. Uh, he had it all right, but he doesn't make any use of it here. Um, uh, a meaning of ideas as beings which are self-subsisting outside of the things which participate in the ideas. And now, what, why does he do that? Now, there is a brave question. Uh, does Plato believe that there are ideas of artifacts as distinguished from natural beings? Aristotle says no, Plato denies it. And I would say this would seem to settle the question, because who could know better these things than Plato's greatest pupil? But some, um, uh, some people deny that today because in certain dialogues, for example, the Tenth Book of the Republic, Plato does speak of ideas of artifacts. Very rarely, but there does. But the question, of course, is how seriously is this statement in the Tenth Book of the Republic meant? 
sovereigns and Plato say quite a few things on occasion which are not their ultimate uh, view on the subject matter in question. However, this may, and this may be a reason why Socrates speaks here of ideas or forms as being only in the artifacts and not beyond them. At, at any rate, the doctrine of ideas does not come to sight in the Gorgias at all. The Gorgias abstracts from the ideas proper. And if it is true, as at first, at first going, we surely must say that the core of the Platonic teaching is a doctrine of ideas, and philosophy in the Platonic sense is concerned with the ideas, philosophy will not come to sight in the gorgeous in its proper form. You remember that in the polo section, when we had this simple proportion, the highest art was the legislative art, was not, it was in no way called um, uh, philosophy. Let me make this tentative suggestion that in the gorgeous, the peak, what Plato regards as a peak, is absent, deliberately absent. Why? Uh, is a longer question. We must also have somewhat more of a proof for that before we can tackle that properly. The good orator makes the soul a well-ordered being. He looks at the anticipated well-ordered soul, which does not yet exist prior to his working, uh, as the anticipated uh, well-ordered souls of the people whom he addresses. But how? That is still very vague, and this will be explained in the sequel. I note in passing that here, as soon as mentions five arts, and if you count, you will find that shipbuilding is in the center. This makes perfect sense when you speak of, uh, of uh, the statesman that you should think of a ship. The ship of state is one of the most commonest uh, metaphors for, for society. But building of ships is, of course, not navigation. Who corresponds to the builder of a ship in the case of the state? Founder. Founder, sure, which is a much more important and fundamental case. In this list here, in 503e, you, he mentions first painting, Do, uh, doesn't he? Yeah, painters, and then house builders, and then ship builders. Uh, and so, and then uh, he um, ascends from the merely imitative art of painting to the production <coughs> imitative or reproductive arts to the production of inanimate things and finally to the arts working on animate beings, uh, the uh, gymnastics and medicine. So is an ascent here, noticeable, an implication which we must not forget. Painting is here taken to be an art. Well, is it not fair to say if painting is an art, poetry also might be an art? I mean, or, or must one uh, assume that Plato has an obstinate loathing of poetry without any rhyme and reason? Unlikely. So uh, let us then uh, be open to the possibility that Plato had a somewhat more intelligent view of poetry than he seems to have at first reading of certain passages in the Republic or elsewhere. Um, by the way, I believe we usually speak of the imitative arts, and that is in a way uh, correct and literal translation, but I believe it would be a bit clearer if we would translate it by, or interpret it as reproductive. Uh, reproductive. This may help a bit. You see what was a uh, platonical, such notion of 
um, uh, imitation is so difficult to understand because we are too falsely sophisticated. And Plato and Aristotle always start from scratch. And that is very hard to see the most obvious things. Now, if you look at the other, say, the shoemaker, there would be no shoemakers, no, no, no shoes, without the shoemaker's art. Shoes owe their being entirely to the shoemaker production. But if you look at the, what does a painter do? Or, or what does a poet do? This is all, in one way or the other, a reproduction of what exists before. Even if you take certain views which are now very common, the expression of, that poetry is an expression of feelings or a certain kind of feelings, but the feelings are before. They are not made, they are not produced. The expression, the, it is a kind of reproduction. And that is, a, that is a primary phenomenon from which one must start in order to ascend then to the subtleties. So um, let, us, um, let us keep this in mind as the most important implication of this passage. That is the sole reference to the doctrine of ideas, if you can call it that way, in the Gorgias. The doctrine of ideas is absent from it. The peak is missing. Mr. Glenn. Uh, what is the Platonic uh, teaching as to who is responsible for the well-ordering of uh, the individual soul? Is it primarily the individual or primarily the statesman or primarily the rhetorician? Yeah, Mr. Glenn, you are in as good a position to answer this question as I am. I mean, after all, the whole Plato, that's an infinite question, but the Gorgias we have been reading together. Who is responsible for it? Well, we appear to be saying that the, uh, the, uh, the statesman. Sure. Why, why, not, why not leave it at that? I, I, I think that corresponds to the facts. This creates a difficulty, but I think he means that. Well, uh, it, yes, it creates a difficulty particularly, particularly uh, with the beautiful prevalent idea in our own time which is that the individual is primarily responsible for the results of the A four-year-old child also? Well, I don't think that's a prevalent idea. I see. But it is in some Yeah, I believe so, but still, you would say, most people still would say, you have to have a certain maturity for having this responsibility. Now, if we make the preposterous assumption which Sugaris makes, as we shall see later, that most grown-up people are still children. What would follow? Well, it would follow then that these grown-up people would not be capable of ordering their own souls. Uh, not ordering them well. Yes. Well, I think even today we admit that, for example, uh, I mean, let us not fool ourselves by a certain very superficial and formalistic statement of democracy. As you hear, for, yes, the respond, the, each individual fully responsible for his way of life and for what he does. But we know quite well that this is simply not true. Uh, there, have you ever heard the expression, the distinction between uh, other directed and what is the other thing? Self-directed. Inner director. But I think the implication is that most people are other director. The, the, their souls are formed by others. Now, these others are not people like Socrates, but say Hollywood and uh, cosmetics industry, this kind of thing. Yeah? So, now, I mean, how this goes together with the political aspect of democracy, one man, one vote, is a complicated question, but as we have learned from our contemporary political sociologists, the purely political, i.e. legal understanding of democracy is too narrow. What Plato and Aristotle always meant, you have to take in the whole thing. Yeah? It, 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 the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, radio, TV, 
is an important part of this kind of modern democracy as it has gradually developed. And we cannot disregard it. These are very important educating influences. For educating, that means in an older language, forming the souls. You know? And uh, I believe that the, the, the simple justification is this. Uh, Montesquieu had said uh, democracy is the rule of virtue. Yeah? And this is, of course, what we uh, would wish somehow. But now this, this would mean strictly understood that only virtuous men can vote. Try to spell this out in legal terms impossible. The maximum you can get is people who have never been gone to jail. And there are many people who have never gone to jail, have never been even indicted of anything, and yet would not be called virtuous. It's impossible to give a legal expression to the, no to the perfectly necessary notion of virtuous men. Therefore, you have to uh, leave it at somewhat uh, uh, at uh, um, uh, something which can be legally defined, yeah? that you are literate, older than 21, and this kind of thing, these this can be checked. Virtue cannot be checked. The utmost you would get would be the pretense of virtue. Yeah? I mean that everyone would, would uh, look uh, uh, by cosmetics, like, a, you know, a kind of cosmetics which exists, like a virtuous man, and then, uh, but that would not be virtue. Would it be more correct and or more precise to say that the statesman is responsible for producing the conditions under which a person could be virtuous, and that the ultimate responsibility for for the well-ordered soul lies with the individual? Yeah, what, do the, what do the conditions mean? I mean that uh, we can cross midway uh, without any fear of being assassinated or robbed, this kind of thing? Yes, That's one part, security. Yeah, but the other, what about such interesting questions like uh, uh, censorship of uh, bad, corrupting uh, literature? This is also one of the conditions for the proper bringing up of children. See, there you, you get already a difficulty. Plato would say by all means. Aristotle would say by all means. But today the predominant view is the opposite of children. You, okay, one, so condition is too general. Would, 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 would the position that we took uh, on the question I raised as to the ultimate responsibility for the well-ordered soul, would that affect our judgment significantly on uh, whether or not these uh, uh, statesmen of Athens were indeed good statesmen or not? Yeah, but you see, you must not forget, we discuss the question here not merely secundum veritate, yeah, according to the truth, but also secundum platonem, according to Plato. Now, for Plato, virtue, as we know by now, is knowledge. And knowledge is a preserve of a fairly small group of people. From this point of view, it is impossible that anyone, I mean, responsibility in this sense for crimes committed and so on. Uh, that, of course, that is a, a crude concept of responsibility. That's necessarily impossible. But the, the responsibility for virtue in the strict sense uh, it cannot be had except by people who have the natural aptitude for it. And that is, according to Plato, a small part of the human race. But there was some, Mr. Lyons. Uh, if there's a distraction from uh, the philosophy, how can the distinction become part of the working group? Well, I see that uh, needs then a, a, a footnote. Uh, not from philosophy. Philosophy has been mentioned more than once, we know that. But from what in Plato's view is the core or the peak of philosophy. Philosophy is presented as something lower here than, say, in the Republic. We will find quite a bit of proof of that. Uh, 
so it is a uh, philosophy is low what here for certain reasons which we must gradually find. Yes. How, how can the states can be responsible for the well-being or, or the well-ordering of the people's souls if it's a limited speech that's shown to us by this dialogue? There's just so much better it can do. And uh, assuming you want a free city, how can you hold one man responsible for the well-ordering? Yeah. Perhaps this is on the, I can refer to what I just said to Mr. Lyons. Since the full meaning of philosophy does not come out of out here, see solution as presented in the Republic, rule of philosophers does not come out here too. Now you can of course say rightly that the solution of the Republic is not truly a solution. Uh, for reasons which I indicate on a former occasion. But uh, one, what uh, uh, will be, uh, we will be, I'll be back to what I discussed with Mr. Glenn. It depends what you understand by virtue. If virtue means what Plato calls popular or vulgar virtue, this responsibility can, uh, um, uh, um, can be enjoyed by everyone not moronic. That's clear. And, but uh, this is not for Plato, true virtue. And the responsibility for true virtue is, uh, can be enjoyed only by those who are capable of true virtue. Fine. Now let us uh, go on where we left off, 504A7. Let it be as you say. You see, le yeah, uh, let it be. stop here for one moment. Anything or being becomes good by acquiring regularity and order, as he translates. Good for our purposes. Let us translate it this way. Taxis uh, kai cosmos in Greek. Regularity and order. So you see that the ship is again in the center, in case you yeah, enjoy this kind of thing. Now let us go on. Mm -hmm. Regularity, will it be good, or if it has a certain regularity in order? Are former statements obliged to agree to this also? You see, Calicles is now going along with Socrates, because this uh, agrees with his uh, views. Only he has somewhat different notion of what is order and regularity. Yes. Then, what name do we give to the effective regularity in order in the mind? Health and strength, I suppose you mean. I do. And once again, to the effect produced in the soul by regularity and order. Try to find the name here and tell us this before. Why not name it yourself? You see, yeah. This is a controversial issue, therefore, it's caution. Sugaris so returns now to rhetoric, indeed. So he does not drop this subject, yes? a very good point that you will, you will find similar things in the secret. And how can they be understood that justice comes first? I mean, what did justice mean in the polo section? Never forget that. Pardon? Yes. And why, uh, when, uh, under what condition is punishment uh, the, uh, um, the primary thing?
Yeah, but uh, what does this mean? And, and what, what does this imply? If correction, punishment comes first. Mr. Paravan? The soul must be there. Sure. There was, I uh, wanted to bring this up on a somewhat later occasion, but I can say it here. Machiavelli discourses, book one, chapter three. All political writers have started, and legislators have started from the premise that men are bad. And therefore, I mean, he, all Machiavelli includes, of course, Plato, otherwise he wouldn't say that. Uh, yes, therefore, the primary thing is, is punitive. This would be an explanation. But so here Suez returns to rhetoric, of course to rhetoric as an art, to the right kind of rhetoric. For we are still engaged in the quest for the true statesman, i.e. the true orator. Now, but another implication, Mr. Klein, if it is rhetoric which makes men good, rhetoric takes the place of the legislative art and of that justice, which is the art of the judge. In other words, we have here by implication a complete rehabilitation and more than a rehabilitation of rhetoric. You see now Socrates' procedure. When he talked to the rhetoricians, he debunked rhetoric. When he speaks to the politician who is ultimately hostile to speech, he boosts rhetoric. And this is, it goes very far. You will also have seen that in this section just read, um, the future, the use of the future tense, what these good men will do. Of course, because as far as we know, there never was one. This whole thing belongs to the future. Uh, he says also of this man that he will, uh, the, the statesman or orator, will use all his actions for this purpose. He does not say all his speeches. For what might he use some of his speeches, if not for this purpose? Well, I think he might use some of the speeches for pleasing the citizen body. After all, not all pleasures have been thrown out, only pleasures not uh, dangerous to goodness. Yes. And now, 504A, E, I'm sorry, yeah. For what advantage is there, gallantly, in giving to the sick and ill-conditioned body a quantity of even the most agreeable things to eat or drink, or anything else, whatever, if it is not going to profit thereby any more, let us say, than by the opposite treatment than any fair reckoning? And they profit less. This yeah. For the healthy soul, we learn here, pleasant food is all right. It doesn't have to be merely good, good, and very badly tasty. I mean, Plato is not an enemy of the human race. Uh, and, and even for a sick soul, sometimes. Pleasant things are all right, of course, subject to a wise physician's uh, a decision. Yes. Because I imagine it is no gain for a man to live in a depraved state of body, since in this case his life must be a depraved one also, or is not that the case? Yes. And so the satisfaction of one's desires, if one is hungry, as much as one likes, or a thirsty drink, is generally allowed by doctors when one is in health, but they practically never allow one in sickness to take one's pill and take what one desires. Do you agree with me in this? I do. So, if the control of bodily desires belongs, as we see here, strictly speaking to the physician, to medicine, 
and we must see an IE not to the legislator or judge or orator. Mr. Balloon? But some pleasures can be can be uh, helpful. I mean, uh, why should a medicine be in addition uh, to? Uh, why should it be unnecessarily nauseating? I mean, only a very nasty man would say they should also be nauseating in addition. Perhaps in prison, some kinds of things might be helpful, but not ordinarily. But even here, too, yeah, but she's up, are they not bodily pleasures? Do we not call them bodily pleasures, those going with food and drink? Yes. Is this a, a, a analysis whether, whether there can be any pleasure, strictly speaking, of the body? This more subtle question is here not taken up at all. Whereas whether all pleasures are not uh, pleasures of the soul. This is, we, we leave it as a rough distinction that we say pleasures of me, of uh, going with the study of mathematics are not but pleasures of the body, but pleasures going with food and drink are bodily pleasures. Because the senses are directly involved. Without a tongue, you cannot uh, have these pleasures. No, but the fundamental difficulty, I believe, is this. Let us always go back to the key point. From certain, from the distinction between the good and the pleasant, as it was originally made, one can easily derive the impression that pleasures are utterly irrelevant. And uh, whether uh, something is pleasant or painful doesn't make the slightest difference. But so it is, makes it clear that uh, if the pleasures are harmless, why would not a sensible man prefer the pleasure to the corresponding pain? Yeah. This is, I think, the point which I want to make. Now, if this is true of other things, it is surely also true of speeches. Why should we not have pleasing speeches, which do, uh, while they may not do anything good, but which also may not do any harm. After all, we need recreation, yeah? and uh, pleasing speeches or pleasing sounds may contribute to recreation. What's wrong with that? You know, I mean, one must not uh, misunderstand, so as though he does not to create this misunderstanding as if he were a sworn enemy of pleasure in any manner, shape, and form. But that is not what he means. Uh, Mr. Rankin? And does not the same rule of my experiment apply to the soul, so long as it is in a bad state, faultless, licentious, unjust, and unholy, we must restrain its desires and not permit it to do anything except what will help it to be better. Do you grant this or not? Now, he applies this now as a result now explicitly to the soul. Um, since the uh, analog to the good statement, statesman is a physician, not the gymnastic trainer, the emphasis shifts to what the statesman do to the sick soul, i.e. to the statesman's punitive action. And this implies indeed, as uh, Mr. Dry implied, that men, all men or most men, are primarily bad and therefore in need of punishment. You see here, he mentions here four vices corresponding to four virtues. What, uh, do you notice any change here? Is there any virtue? Yes? Yes, yes. This is part of the education of, of the courageous, manly calicles. 
that his favorite virtue is dropped and replaced by piety. And this has to do with the thing which uh, we will see more and more, that the key virtue in this dialogue is moderation. Ordinary, the term is frequently translated also by temperance. Not, in mean, the Republic, the key virtue is obviously justice. That uh, is, differs in Platonic dialogues and within the dialogues. But here uh, we are brought up to the proposition that the overriding virtue is moderation or temperance. And uh, surely courage must be discouraged in the case of Caligles, who has or believes to have too much of it. He's surely too much enamored of it. Yes. Uh, good. Uh, very, yes. For well, thus, I take it, the soul itself is better off, to be sure. And is restraining a person from what he desires correcting him? Yes. Then correction is better for the soul than uncorrected license, as you were thinking just now. Now, Sugaris here now explicitly vindicates punishment. Um, punishment uh, means uh, to restrain a man forcibly from satisfying his desires. In other words, punishment is not tit for tat, but uh, um, forcibly restraining from overindulging, therefore bread and water instead of wine and steaks. Yes, go on. I have no notion what you are referring to, Socrates, to ask someone else. Here is a fellow who cannot endure a kindness done him, or the, or the experience in himself of what our talk is about. Yeah. You see, here, now here, Socrates is very clear. Caligles rebels again. Why? Socrates says this, because he himself is forcibly restrained uh, by Socrates from satisfying his desire. Of course, not the desire for food and drink, but political ambition. Uh, he undergoes the wise kind of punishment. And, uh, but therefore, and this uh, people don't like. Socrates, we must ever say, does Socrates truly restrain him forcibly? Well, a kind of force which is not bodily force. Words can and speeches can have, can be forcible. <coughs> but does Socrates succeed? No. Socrates tries to restrain him, but he fails. And this implies a lesson which we know already, that rhetoric cannot take the place of coercion. Something else. Socrates is unable to prevent Caligula's going to politics. Something else has to be done. Yes? Well, not enough do I care either for anything you say. I only gave you those answers to oblige gorgeous. Very good. So now, what shall we do? Play off our arguments midway. Decide that for yourself. What do they say? What does wrong for the evil? Even stories in the middle. Yeah, stories in Greek myths, yeah, myth. In the myth, in the middle. One should set a head in the thing that it may not go about heads. So proceed with the rest of your answers that are hard to uh, violent would be more literal sensation. Violent, you see, that is so called this using of force against, uh, indirectly, of course, with the help of gorgeous, you know. Without gorgeous, Caligus would have gone on long time ago. Yes? Take my advice and let this argument drop. Find someone else to argue with. Then who else is willing? Surely we must not leave the argument there unfinished. Would you not get through it yourself, either talking on by yourself or answering your own questions? Yeah, let us consider this theme for one moment, what this uh, might mean. So conversation is again in danger of being prematurely terminated. Although Caligles does not dare to 
to run away. After all, he's a free man. But he's kept here, we know already, by the authority of Gorgias, on the heart of respect for Gorgias. Now, no one is willing to take the place of Caligles. Those who uh, do agree with him uh, don't uh, wish to suffer his fate, naturally. Let the whipping be applied to Caligles alone. And those who do not agree with him do not wish to appear to agree with him, you know. They have this, uh, but Sugaris at any rate is anxious to complete the argument. Why? For the sake of gorgeous. Caligles proposes that Sugaris complete the argument by himself. And uh, you know, complete, uh, complete the dialogue by himself, which is a very funny thing. But this is exactly what Sugaris will do, as you will see from the immediate sequel. Yes? So that, in fact, the farmer's phrase, but two men stay here while I may prove I can manage single hand. You see, Sugaris in so, uh, Plato has seen the comical character he quotes that comical poet which he regard, whom he regarded as the greatest comical poet. We no, cannot know that because only fragments of Epicamus have survived. Um, there is a comical model for that. Um, yes. I may prove I can manage single hand. And indeed, it looks as though it must appear as that that we are to do this, for my part, I think we are all to find in each other in attempting the knowledge of what is true and what falls in the matter of our harmony. For it is a benefit to all the life that it be revealed. Now, I am going to pursue the argument, is my view that it may suggest. But if any of you think the admissions I am making to myself are not the truth, you must seize the constant and refuse me. For I assure you, I myself do not say what I say is no again, but is joining in the search for you. So that if anyone who disputes my statements is found to be in the right track, I shall be the first to agree with him. This, however, I say on the assumption that you think the argument should be carried through to the conclusion. But if you would rather it were not, let us have done with it now and go our way. So Sugares is again perfectly willing to com uh, finish it if the others don't like it. Uh, I see here a note by our commentator regarding the quotation from the comic poet. The device, namely uh, uh, a dialogic soliloquy, uh, may possibly have been suggested to him by something similar in Epicamus. Ingenious and successful, so it is, it reveals the underlying tension between Plato, the, the Socratic dramatist, and Plato, the philosopher. Uh, I suppose if uh, the mere reference to the comical character uh, of this scene uh, shows uh, that Plato uh, had over succeeded in overcoming this tension. Uh, the enterprise should, uh, so as will have a soliloquy, if a dialogic soliloquy. Nevertheless, the enterprise should remain a common one. But so as will under, continue it only if the others are willing. So as is not only not able, but even not willing to punish anyone who is not willing to undergo punishment. Now, the theme is a good statesman, but the good statesman must be able and willing to inflict punishment on people whether they like the punishment, to undergo the punishment or not. Would this not mean that Socrates is not a good statesman? That Sugaris uh, um, will later on claim that he is the only good statesman, but we must keep this in mind whether, uh, whether it is not one of the important duties of the statesman to punish. And Sugaris is not very good at that. 
Yes. Yes, so the question so says, well, if you don't want to go on, let's call it a day. And what, again, the authority must come in, gorgeous. decides on the issue on grounds of both propriety yeah, and his desire. He speaks also for the others. But uh, he says, we, we, we can give a render so as far as I vote against the termination of, this, of the discussions. And the others apparently also vote against it. But I also desire the continuation. In the case of Gorgias, the wish to hear the continuation is the reason for the going for the vote. In the case of the others, perhaps consideration for respect for Gorgias or for the proprieties. This is not uh, quite unimportant. Um, so Gorgias is then responsible, but Gorgias is now no longer the authority he was before. He can no longer compel Calicles to reply. These heavy times have gone. A few hours more and Gorgias will have ceased to be an authority for uh, Calicles altogether. Yes? Want to be sure, Gorgias? I myself should have liked to continue discussing with Captain Shear until I had taken an Amphion speech in return for distant Zephyrus. But since you, Captain, are unwilling to join me in finishing off the argument, you must at any rate pull me up as you listen if it seems to you that my statements are wrong. And if you refuse me, I shall not be vexed with you as you work with me. You will always be recorded in my mind as my greatest benefactor. Now, what does he mean by this Amphion's reply, which he, Socrates is going to give? Amphion and Cetus, his brother Cetus, were the heroes in a lost Euripidean play. Cetus being the political military man, and Amphion the music man. And Socrates replies to the political warrior as a music man defending music in the widest sense, which includes, of course, the highest muse, philosophy, but in includes also the lower muses. What Socrates will do now in his way, his defense of the muses, is also a defense of Gorgias, because Gorgias, after all, is also a man of speech rather than of arms. This is a deeper reason why Gorgias would like to hear what, how would Socrates make this defense of the non-military, non-political life, the life of the muses. Yes? Proceed to observe by yourself and finish it off. Give it then. But first, then, we will resume our argument from the beginning. Are the pleasant and the good the same thing? Not the same. No, wait a moment. You see, this is in a way terribly boring because we have heard that ad nauseum. But that is very dangerous to give in to these feelings of pleasure and pain and not keep one's head, one's reason. Now, when he says here, it seems to be a mere necessary, Calicles, then the preceding speech would seem to be by Calicles. Yeah. The preceding question. Now, shortly before, in uh, C6 and 7, 
So he says, not the same as I and Caligles have agreed. This was earlier. The Sogates re uh, replies to someone other than Caligles, who is nameless and invisible. This is a complete change of the situation. Very subtly done. And later this X, the invisible, nameless being, proves to be Caligles. Uh, I do not wish to interpret it. I only want to state to you the problem and to show you the fundamental thing that dual repetitions simply do not exist in Plato. Passages which seem to be dual repetitions, infinitely many. I mean, you know, when they say uh, you can read pages in which, yes, of course, necessarily, naturally. Yeah? And then you say, why did he not write a treatise instead of this absolutely silly thing which uh, everyone can transform a masterpiece easily in a dialogue by uh, doing that? Yeah. And now, but if you read more carefully, you will see the answers are never uh, simply yes, 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 yes. There are uh, variations, and when you, these variations are very revealing. And especially if they are very powerful like, uh, forms of agreement, for example, with, uh, with all around necessity as a reply, it's obviously much more than to say yes, of course. That has, but here, we, this is, I think, a nice little example. And there are also other things which are not merely repetitious. Now go on, Mr. Ring. But surely, compared to what each thing, whether of an infinite or of the body, or again of the soul, or any divine creature, does not arise most properly by accident, but by an order or rightness or arts in proportion to each. Is that so? I certainly agree. I, Nemi Sugar, is speaking to that nameless being. Yeah. Yes. Uh, then the virtue of each thing is a matter of regular and orderly arrangement. I am so then a soul which has its own proper order is better than one which is unordered, necessarily. But further, one that has order is ordered. Of course it will be. And the order with one is temporary, most necessarily. Yeah, you must, as I said before, the uh, the orderly, what is translated as orderly and temperate, where in a way it's the same, decent, well behaved, go into each other very easily. It's almost as simple as that. But this is, of course, not a proof, but a shrewd exploitation of uh, the language in question. Yes. This doesn't mean that, Sugaris does not mean that moderation is a virtue or temperance. Of course, he means that. But this is not the way to establish it. Yes. So the temper is so For my part, I can find nothing to say in objection to this, my dear Captain. But if you can, you will instruct me. Proceed, sir. In other words, uh, in uh, Caligus, no record, uh, no comment. Now, we, let us uh, again remind ourselves of the context. Socrates' dialogue with himself which is then in 507C8 followed by a soliloquy up to 508C. And then he turns to Caligles' critique of Sogades' way of life. And at that point, the genuine dialogue with Caligles starts again. Now, this here, what we are read just now and what we will read in the immediate sequel, is Sugaris' soliloquy, but a dialogic soliloquy. Sugaris begins again from the beginning. Um, and now, it is important also as to what they had agreed, Sugaris and Caligles. They had agreed only regarding the difference between the good and the pleasant. There, there was a genuine agreement as to that. Sugar is, yes. Now, the, 
The virtue of thing is brought about, he said later, in the best way, the finest way, by order and correctitude and art in D7. In the most, in the fairest and most beautiful way, which implies it can also be brought about in another way. In which other way can um, uh, the virtue of a thing be brought about uh, in different from these means? What is the alternative? Pardon? Accident. Chance. Or, as Plato sometimes says, by divine allotment can a man be good. Uh, now this, uh, yes, it, it then Socrates replaces, here he replaces or uh, what we translated by order, good order, by correctitude and art. And here there is no reference to law. And this would seem to suggest, as Mr. Snell, uh, uh, Mr. Glenn said in a somewhat different context, that only the man possessing an art can acquire virtue, in the true sense. Yeah. Uh, but then he re restores again the old uh, stereotype uh, regulation and order. For art only produces virtue, whereas order and regulation both produce virtue and are virtue. The art, the art which produces virtue is not itself a virtue, but uh, the art and uh, the, the, the regulation and order is both productive of virtue and itself a virtue. Then he drops regulation. And then we have the soul which has order, is orderly. And this means the same as moderate or, in common Greek usage, moderate or temperate. The conclusion? Virtue is moderation. But the question arises, of course, with a view to uh, the difficulty in D7. Is moderation or temperance also an art or knowledge? Let me explain this question a bit. That virtue is identical with moderation is established by a pun. Virtue is order of the soul, and the, then the good soul is the orderly soul, and so on. But in this sense, both order and decency may, of course, only mean external decency, their proper, proper, uh, proper external behavior. Later on in this dialogue, in 523e6, Cosmos, order, is used in this sense. The mere eternal bedecking of the soul, uh, external bedecking of the soul, which is not a genuine. Um, there is a passage in Plato's Laws which is very helpful for understanding uh, here this passage in the Gorgias and much more in the Gorgias and elsewhere. In, in Laws 710a, we find the following remark. Socrates speaks of the qualities which a young, which a tyrant must have who is willing to be a servant or minister to the true legislator. And then he says, um, and this, uh, one of these virtues singled out is temperance or, or moderation, so for Zuni. That is said by an interlocutor. Thereupon the chief speaker, he calls the Athenian stranger, says, yes, Clinius, t uh, moderation, but of the vulgar kind. Not the kind men mean 
when they force reasonableness, prudence, uh, uh, upon moderation, i.e. when they do what Plato sometimes does by giving moderation, this meaning that it is all virtue. But that kind which by nature springs up at birth in children and beasts, so that some are not incontinent, others continent in respect of pleasures. In other words, in the ordinary and simplest sense of the word, in Plato's time, it generated moderation means something like continence something which even children and beasts can have. And uh, therefore, not something which can be truly the full virtue. But if we take this ambiguity into consideration, moderation of, is the virtue of all souls. And I think that is implied here of all souls in what we have read. And then, of course, every man can be virtuous. Every man can possess a full virtue. Contrary to the assertion that true virtue is uh, only a preserve of those who think. Uh, um, moderation is here, in the college of existence, a key uh, virtue. Just as in this republic, justice is a key virtue. Now, what is the relation between these two virtues as a phase of that, without going into any deeper thing? Justice is clearly it's a social virtue. Moderation or temperance is as such a private virtue. Justice is, as we was indicated earlier in this dialogue, in the highest form, it's the virtue of distribution of distributing, and which is clearly a political or social action. Why does he put his emphasis on moderation, which will go on? He will develop in the sequel the thesis that uh, moderation is not only the all-comprehensive virtue, but also the sufficient condition of bliss being moderate and being blissful at the same time. Now, you, there is a great variety of levels of the word moderation. And if you take the cruder, commonsensical view, according to which it means self-control regarding food and drink, and then it is, of course, impossible to understand why a man who is self-controlled in these matters is, lives a life of perfect bliss. Yeah. This is, now, but why is this emphasis? We have to consider the context. Socrates discusses matters with Caligles. And what was Caligles' assertion at the beginning of the conversation? The better man must rule. For the sake of what? And then he came to speak of... Uh, you know, all desires, the satisfaction of all desires, uh, is a life of incontinence. And then, from this point of view, the simple answer is that the opposite of incontinence, continence, is the whole virtue and the whole bliss of man, an extraordinary, bold, extraordinarily bold assertion, which uh, has, can only have a somewhat limited meaning. Now, I will briefly explain, lest you are merely bewildered by these uh, movements, uh, what I think is behind that. Uh, we have found a number of facts which are, I think are undeniable, but the connection between these facts is obscure. I mention a few of them. Uh, in the first place, of course, the insufficiency of the proofs which uh, are, in the best case, uh, rhetorical proofs and not uh, genuine demonstrations. Also the fact that the argument in the section, on the Polos and Caligula section, is made for the sake of gorgeous. It's another 
strange, strange feature not sufficiently accounted for is a two. We saw that when Caligris came to speak of pleasure, he abstracted from honor, from the pleasures deriving from honor. We have seen today the abstraction from the ideas in the Platonic sense, implying an abstraction from the core or heart of philosophy. We have also observed, I give you now a simple enumeration of some of the striking difficulties. And the denial of the possibility of arts leading to a pleasure, or at least of arts leading also to pleasure. There were quite a few indications in which such arts were admitted, but this was only implied, it was never clearly stated. In the polar section, the, the eulogy of punishment, men become just by being punished, which goes a bit far. We have also seen, partly by ourselves, partly with the help of our commentator, that Plato makes in the gorgeous, unusually frequent borrowings from comedy. Um, the boosting of moderation or continence, as we have seen now, and finally, the disregard of the legitimacy of defense against unjust accusation, i.e. the disregard of legitimate forensic rhetoric. Now, how can we understand that? I will give you a try, uh, will now suggest of what I believe to be the way towards the solution of these difficulties. In other words, I will try to say something of the, about the unity of uh, keeping all this dissecta membra together. The subject of this dialogue is rhetoric. And of course, public rhetoric, rhetoric addressed to, uh, speech addressed to many. And this is fundamentally the same thing as the po political life. This is spoken about in the dialogue, and while it is forgotten, apparently, for long stretches, is always the theme. Now, this public rhetoric is opposed to the private rhetoric, never discussed, which Socrates practices, which every reader of the dialogue, who is not so simple-minded as to believe that Plato did not know better tend to present such demonstrations, uh, uh, must observe. This private rhetoric corresponds to the philosophic life, just as the public rhetoric corresponds to the political life. But where, where do we find the political life? Well, we have give, been given these four names, and we could add other great political names from other climates and nations. But where do we find the philosophic life? After all, uh, uh, is this a mere ideal, or, uh, or uh, was the philosophic life in Plato's view lived by someone? Socrates. So the theme, therefore, is in a way not only this general subject, the philosophic life, but also, as it were, the incarnation of that life, the Socratic life. This Socratic life culminated in the Socratic death. He was accused of having committed certain crimes, especially the crime of impiety, and of corrupting the young. Only the corruption problem is mentioned here, not the uh, impiety problem. And when he was accused, he had to up to, uh, uh, he was legally obliged to defend himself, to make a forensic speech. This forensic speech has been written by Plato under the title The Apology of Socrates. Uh, it is, I think, one of the most popular and famous writings of Plato. This Apology of Socrates is the result of Socrates' deliberation 
about what he is going to say to his judges. We, in, the, in reading the apology, we see only the result of the deliberation, not the deliberation. In the gorgeous, we see, and we will see this very soon, very clearly, the deliberation about Socrates' soul forensic speech is presented. And namely, what should one do is a problem of self-preservation. What, how to go about preserving yourself in the face of an unjust accusation. And so it is, makes here this statement, I must anticipate this. Well, when I shall be accused, I am in the position of a pastry cook. Uh, no, I'm sorry, of a physician. Accused by a pastry cook before a, 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 a jury of children. They, I mean, I'm the one who cuts and gives the bitter pills and he gives these sweets. I am bound to be uh, condemned. Now, they are like children. When you read the apology, you will not find the slightest suggestion that this was Sogaret's judgment of his jury. You must admit it would have been wholly improper to call people whom he, he properly addressed uh, uh, Andrus, men of Adam, uh, to call you are only children and you cannot possibly understand me. And therefore I do not even, I'm not uh, angry at you because you condemn me. You can't do differently. That's what one says. So here we get the deliberation of Sogares, one, two minutes, uh, a deliberation of Sogares about his apology. And this is presented, this deliberation is presented to Callicles primarily, but of course to everyone present. But what about the competence of Callicles? Is he not also a child? perhaps a somewhat cleverer child than the most stupid members of the jury. But still, from Sowell's point of view, is also a child. Therefore, even here, we have to do some translation of Sowell's deliberation about his uh, forensic rhetoric, forensic speech, into these reflections which Sowell's would express to, to mature people. This would require on our part a certain transformation from the children we all primarily are into mature people, and that is by no means an easy thing, but it is surely a worthwhile thing. Good. And now <coughs> let us look one more step, and then I'm through. What was the original accusation of Socrates? prior to the one which led to his death, yes? No, no, the original, I mean, who accused Socrates prior to Meletos and Anetos and so on? Aristophanes, very good. The clouds can be said to be the first accusation of Socrates. We have read in Vico that this was the thing, the wicked Aristophanes who ruined the most good uh, uh, Socrates by the clouds. <coughs> the clouds are comedy. How is Socrates presented in the clouds? And, I mean, uh, forgetting about all sophistication, a very simple thing. Socrates is there presented as a natural philosopher, a cosmologist, especially concerned with, with a mathematical treatment there. For example, he measures the, uh, how many feet, a uh, flea's feet, a flea jumps. This is mathematical physics in its most elementary form. And uh, he said, and in addition, 
And this subject of mathematical physics will come up very soon in our dialogue. Uh, and the other great activity which Schubert is in, engages in, apart from uh, natural science, is rhetoric. Sogar is in the clouds is a teacher of rhetoric. And then he has another quality, uh, which is uh, very striking. Uh, he, uh, the crude view, which is you find in many textbooks, is Aristophanes presents Sogaris as a sophist. And sophist means, of course, an absolutely despicable man who does all these dirty things for the sake of money. But the Sogaris of the clouds doesn't have the slightest interest in money. I mean, he is not a 100% honest man. He steals on one occasion because they have no uh, supper. And then he has to get some food for him and uh, his companions. And so this is indeed a blameworthy action. But he is not in con any way concerned with, with money. Oh, and why is he not concerned with it? Because of his extreme self-control, his extreme continence. He doesn't need, uh, he hardly needs any food, he doesn't need clothing, he doesn't wash. He is so continent that he cannot understand why um, uh, one of his pupils is prevented from thinking and answering questions because he has to sit somewhere on a sofa, let us say, uh, full of bugs and fleas. And so guys cannot see why can you not think in the most concentrated manner if you are exposed to millions of fleas. So continent is so bad. So these three striking characteristics of so in the clouds are the medical cosmology, rhetoric, and extreme continents are in a way here rewritten by Plato in a decent manner. Not this kind of mathematical physics, which Aristophanes makes, but something reminding of Pythagorean philosophy, let us say. Not that kind of rhetoric which he teaches there how to swindle one's debtors uh, out of uh, uh, one's debts, but that kind of rhetoric, the noble rhetoric, and not this kind of ridiculous continence with regard to fleas, but it's a continence befitting a gem. So this, I think, uh, in other words, the comedy is there, because a reply to a comedy done in this manner is not free from the comical itself, of course. But uh, uh, I think we will, uh, in this way, we, we will gradually find the unity. But you wanted to say something. Yeah, that in other words, his statement uh, must be understood uh, uh, of Socrates uh, judiciously. In other words, literally speaking, the Athenian judges are, of course, not children. Yeah. I mean, they are not 10, 12 years old. They are men between, say, 30 and uh, 70. And they are not, uh, literally speaking, they are not children. There are certain rules of propriety. I mean, as, as you know, that you do not, a self-respecting man would not uh, wish to be acquitted on improper grounds, I mean, because he he melted the heart of the judges. He would uh, in this country. That is what he means by that. Uh, the apology is a very moving piece, as I'm sure you know, but it is still something Socrates uh, could not possibly state his position uh, there and make a simple experiment. Did Socrates say in the apology what he says about the greatest Athenian statesman in the Gorgias. I mean, both the men of the left, if I may use present-day term, 
they would have been shocked by what he says about the Mistogres and Pericles. And those of the right would have been shocked by what he says about the Miltiades and, and Kimon. He couldn't say that. But the, the, so the, the, as I put it before, the gorgeous presents uh, uh, Socrates' deliberation about his accusation, not in the whole gorgeous, in, the, in this part of the Caligula section, but this uh, it becomes an ingredient of the whole work, and the whole work must have been devised from the very beginning so as to allow for this specification. From the very beginning, the plan was clear, rhetoric, two kinds of rhetoric, the two ways of life, the ter this question, which way, which way life to choose, which always means, which of these two ways of life, there are no others, <clears throat> which of these two ways to choose is the political and the philosophic, and therefore since the philosophic life, the life of Socrates, the whole problem of Socrates' own life with its partly accidental features come in. But that is one of the basic premises of the Platonic Dialogues, that nothing, and this is of course, in the strict sense, a noble lie, that there is nothing accidental in Socrates. And a noble lie now in this simple sense, you know, what they call now artistic. That's, of course I was, I mean, why should a philosopher have a snub nose like Socrates and protruding eyes and they have this particular wife, scientific. These are all accidental things, but this is Plato's art, that all these things become meaningful. That Socrates has an ugly appearance, and uh, the philosophers do not have to be ugly. Have you ever seen the picture of John Locke? He was a very handsome man. Uh, so, uh, but Difficult. And so when I said, well, I knew I had to live with human beings. And just as a future horseman will not um, uh, be, uh, have, uh, is limit his practice of horsemanship by taking the gentlest and oldest mare, but will take the most uh, ferocious and uh, wild horse, and because if he knows he can handle that horse, he can handle any horse. That's, that's why he married so typically. Now, the, the comedy is, of course, not only this comical explanation, but the fact that he not only failed in handling so typically, but he failed in handling practically all other people as well, as is shown by his own end. So the Zantipi is, in other words, a kind of foreshadowing of his, of his uh, affair with the city of Hatton. And so, in, in to repeat, Plato makes all these accidental features of Socrates uh, meaningful. And uh, this, this requires, uh, in some cases, penetration, but he never said Socrates had this mother uh, uh, how do you call that? Uh, a, a woman having uh, other women in uh, uh, giving birth to midwives, thank you. And his father was uh, satirally. Uh, this also is uh, given meaning by Plato. He, in other words, the classic philosopher could not but be this man, this Athenian, with these features, with this social standing, and so on and so on. This is about it. Yes, now this is of course, of course only a first attempt to explain what the underlying unity of the dialogue is. And you see also that uh, we, it, 
is uh, considerations which are, are apparently entirely non-philosophical and uh, now called artistic play a very great role in the build-up of the dialogue. But this uh, doesn't mean that the philosophic uh, teaching is not there. It is only uh, uh, not immediately visible on the surface. By understanding and considering these artistic features, we will understand the philosophic teaching. And I think one can say books which have this double reward that they are not only good, but also pleasant, is uh, perhaps preferable than books which are only good, surely better than books which are merely pleasant. And so you see that this great problem of the gorgeous, especially, is solved very easily if one reflects for one moment on this dialogue. There cannot be a simple opposition between the good and the best.